I call to order the regular session of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs on Tuesday, January 24th at 6.30 p.m. Roll call, please. Mayor Vatikiotis. Here. Vice Mayor Lunt. Here. Commissioner Carr. Here. Commissioner Eisner. Here. Commissioner Kouyas. Here. Um, this evening's invocation will be given by Reverend Janet Tunnell of All Saints Episcopal Church. If we can all stand and then at the end of the invocation, turn and pledge allegiance to the flag. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, send down upon those who hold office in the city of Tarpon Springs the spirit of wisdom, charity, and justice, that with steadfast purpose they may faithfully serve in their office to promote the well-being of all people through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we uh, get started, I have one announcement. Item 14 is deferred. Um, that is Ordinance 2023-1, amending the Public Art Ordinance. Uh, that's deferred to February 14, 2023. Uh, this evening we have a uh, special presentation by our Tarpon Springs High School principal, Ms. Lisa Fatalitas. This is an annual update that um, Ms. Fatalitas gives the city and um, we very much appreciate her being here. Thank you very much. Good evening and thank you for allowing this opportunity. Happy New Year to all of you. I have brought a couple things. I brought a folder, Mayor Vatikiotis, for you and the board to look at, and I also brought some handouts. So I'll just pass them here through Thank Chief you. Young. Very good. I'll wait for everybody to get started. As I stand before you this evening, I, I definitely need to share some regards. Um, it's definitely a proud moment to be a sponger. Some of the information I'm gonna be sharing tonight really resonates all about the good that's happening at Tarpon High School, and also some of the growth and areas mm -hmm. that we need to focus on. So I will be highlighting several of those, also giving a glimpse into what our next year slate looks like so we're very excited to share some academic improvements some academic data also <coughs> conditions for learning and also community-based partnerships that um, we're very proud to share that have been really happening in the past couple of years as we know um, Tarpon High has great staff great students great programs we also have a very positive and loving community-based support and all of the above cannot be possible without all of us working together as the collective we. So I do extend heartfelt gratitude on behalf of the faculty, staff, and students for your community-based support and all of the community members of Tarpon Springs. Tarpon High, we have a vision, and the vision is very simple, 100% student success. So all of our decisions, all of our um, allocations, our resources, all are partnered around 100% student success. So every student, every family on campus gets the resources and the attention they need in order to be successful. We have nine school improvement goals. So every year in August, we set, the, um, we set our foundation, we set our benchmarks, and we have nine school improvement goals. And so on the handout on page one, you will see them outlined, listed below integrating the use of professional learning communities, incorporating additional instructional strategies that helps build capacity of all learners, efforts in closing the achievement gap for students in English and in math, and those are data-based decisions, <coughs> increasing opportunities for students to extend beyond the classroom in extracurricular activities, athletics, and or community-based clubs, improving community connections, improving school culture, and also improving the school spirit. 
So as we work on maintaining an academic focus, we also want to make sure that our students do feel and live the passion of being a tarpon high sponger. I want to take you over to page three in the, in the top handout. This is the mid-year update, and it starts with a couple of data points. So right now, our enrollment is at 1,300 students, and that includes both our active and inactive students. Reasons for the inactivity with enrollment can vary if students are out on hospital homebound issues or temporarily relocated. A lot of different reasons, but we do wanna, we do track that. And so I'm proud to say that our total enrollment is up from last year, this time last year. I wanna show you the benchmarks. So right there, you're gonna see a series of data points, and that is our midterm benchmarks that our district assesses and we run parallel to our state assessments <coughs> and you will see English grade 9 and 10 were above the district average at this time algebra were just approaching the benchmark average which we do have some work to do before state testing that's what that shows us geometry we've exceeded the district average so right now our geometry are scoring 43 percent at the midterm when Pinellas County district average is 41%. U.S. history fell a little short, 48% with the district average at 57%. Biology, we are the front runner of the district with our biology scores, I'm proud to share, at 69% at the midterm with the district average at 59%. Our graduation rate, 98% and our accelerated rate, so right there shows you that 86% of our students over a four year period earned industry certification and or college credit, and that is up almost 24% from last year. So that is our benchmark framework for which we're carving the rest of the school year's efforts, goals, and attention. So right now, if we were to make a report card, Tarpon High would be well on its way to earning an A. So we're very proud of that. I want to share the essential five elements that we will be working on in the next 12 weeks and hopefully continue on into May, which is our state testing. Paramount, remaining current with course pacing. Plan for reteaching of any missed curriculum items based on the data that I shared above. So any of the benchmarks which fell lower than where we needed to be, we will be planning for reteaching or any student that did not personally meet a benchmark will have a reteaching plan created by their teacher. We will be looking for intensive in-class tutoring ahead of the Florida assessment of student thinking. And as we've seen in the media, the whole state testing system revised this year it's from Florida standards assessment to the Florida assessment of student thinking. So we assess three times a year. So that will happen at the beginning of May for several weeks. And lastly, we will be monitoring the completion and graduation readiness of our 12th grade students and our 11th grade students. We definitely don't wanna wait until next year to worry about our 11th graders. So we have a lot of exciting opportunities academically for students. And now I wanna pivot a little bit and just share some points of pride before we close or leave for questions. We've been working really to promote a positive community-based culture on campus where staff is recognizing staff for core values that align with Pinellas County Schools core values. It's had a strong, strong takeoff and we're very proud. We present each teacher with their certificate in front of their students and the students clap and the, the teachers walk away with tears of joy. It's a very humbling experience. We have strong parent community support, and we see that with our booster clubs, with our band boosters, football boosters, basketball boosters, volleyball, and culinary, and choral. Um, repeat, Spirit Weeks, musical theater program is taking traction. I know some of you had probably seen that we had a winter musical, Frozen, and we also have another one up and coming, Greece, which will be in the spring. Our musical theater program will be taking a trip to New York City and visiting Juilliard. We have enhanced our TV media production studio that is now being taught by a former broadcaster from Channel 9 or Bay News 9. Our culinary arts public luncheons have resumed on Thursdays. Our physical education department is one of four within the district that is piloting the TB12 curriculum. 
We will be transitioning from a bowling club to a bowling team in the 23-24 school year. We have started to roster a lacrosse team for both boys and girls, so we're hoping to get that started for the fall. And lastly, we are continuing to work with Advent Health North Pinellas. We have several of activities this spring in which we will be recognizing and honoring some of their employees during Nurses Week, Doctor's Day, and hopefully having our band perform in their beautiful new lobby. I'd like to just open up for any general questions before we close. I could go on for more than 10 minutes oh, <laughs> about I, the school. I, I very much appreciate you being here. From my experience over the last um, eight months since I've been mayor, mm -hmm. um, I very much enjoyed every opportunity that you provided of inviting us out Thank to you. the high school and seeing how things work out there, whether it's with a band or whether it's the culinary art um, luncheons. Mm -hmm whether it's just some interaction with the parents that you've got a show and tell that happens out there and you want the city to be part of that to see experience the same sort of thing and quite frankly it just basically says that Tarpon High is very much a part of the city of Tarpon Springs and the one thing that that is much different at least based on my observation um, you've got a, a great deal more of parent participation in the children's lives, not helicopter parents, but being doing whatever they can to, to help um, make the child's experience a lot better at high school than if um, without them being there. And it, it just shows them support and, and you can see that um, a lot of happy children out there. I'm not saying it's perfect. I, we all recognize that's a real, real world out here. But for the most part, whenever I've been out there, I've been very, very happy um, to see all of that. The, um, I also um, very much enjoy seeing the connection with the Advent Health Hospital. Yes. I think the more we can do of, of connecting with the various large organizations within the city, the better off we all are. Um, communicating, trying to understand what, you, what each other's problems are, seeing how we can help, and, and basically exchange information uh, just to make things better for all of us. And if there's any problems that we have, maybe somebody else can help with that. So I really don't have any questions for you. I just, uh, you know, for me, it's my alma mater. <laughs> it's a different school than what it was when I was there. I'm sure it's a little bit different than when it when Panayoti was there, uh, Commissioner Kulia, so, um, and, and I think Chief Young. Chief Young. So, and in any case, Carr. thank you for being here. Who else? Oh, Jacob. Commissioner Carr. Yeah. And right. Who else? Mr. Lacrosse. Oh, Ms. Jacob. Ms. Well, there Jacobs. you go. You've got a lot of fans here, so. We do, uh, so. and we have a very special, it's just very special. And, and I say that with a, with a wholesome heart, because not every principal can really say that about their school, to have a true community school and have the support from the local municipality in um, a very interconnected way. Yeah. And so many of the things that we continue to do aren't all listed here. We have some wonderful organizations that we partner with, like the Interact and the Rotary. We will be co-sponsoring the human trafficking workshop in February. And we're very pleased to join again for our second year in a row. And um, Tarpon PD, I do extend a, a heartfelt thank you for all the support. Um, our school wants for nothing when it comes to student and staff safety. And, um, and I would thank you for that. Okay. Any other questions? Let me see if anyone else up here has got some comments. Okay. Um, I, I know, uh, for example, Commissioner Eisner uh, didn't graduate from Tarpon High. He was up there in the Bronx somewhere when, when <laughs> we were in high school. But I know he's worked at the high school uh -huh. uh, so i'm going to go down by uh rank here vice mayor no um mr carr yeah thanks for the update uh principal fatalitas it's uh, obviously tarpon high is not just a normal high school that's in the county of pinellas county uh it's really um and great uh woven within the character of tarpon springs and it's really great to see the community outreach and the community involvement within Tarpon High and the students as well too. So the update is great to have. I appreciate the update. It's good to see the scholastics are heading in a great direction. Also with sports and other activities for students as well too. So thank you for your leadership and uh, keeping our students safe too. Thank appreciate you. It. Thank you. It's a pleasure to serve. Commissioner Eisner. 
<coughs> you are correct, Mayor. I did not graduate from mm -hmm. Tarpon High, but I've been there enough to feel like I'm part of the school. Um, I did want you to touch base a little bit with the mentoring program yes. and what that means, um, you know, with Pinellas County and what they do if you stay with a mentor, if you don't mind. Yes. So the, the mentorship program is part of the Take Stock in Children program, which used to be called the Doorways Scholarship. So students that have earned a scholarship in middle school or even early in high school are assigned a mentor. And the mentor visits with them on a minimum of once a week and really is their coach, is their advocate, is their mentor, is their friend, tutor, anything and everything possible that that student needs um, throughout their experience before they graduate. And as the student continues on earning the certain grades, A's and B's, and refrain from any progressive discipline or any intermittent issues that, that might cause them to lose their scholarship, there'd be no reason why the student wouldn't continue on with a full scholarship to a four-year university. So we thank Mr. Eisner. I see him many a weeks on campus. Well, thank you. And all they had to do was stay as uh, my mentee. It was the punishment they got, but <laughs> all kidding aside. But if anybody would like to do it, it's a great program. Yes. Um, these kids need some mentors. So mm -hmm. um, if you have that one hour a week or one hour every other week uh, to mentor with these kids, I know my wife does it as well. It's a great program and it's a good formation for kids to, uh, you know, I, I kept myself at least out of trouble throughout my lifetime and I I do want to give back, so it's, it's a great program, and I want to thank you for all your contribution as well. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Appreciate the thank kind you. words. Commissioner mm -hmm. Prias. <clears throat> thank you, Ms. Fadalese, and uh, I've known Ms. Fadalese for quite some time. She used to be our summer camp counselor, and <laughs> yes. probably drove her crazy when we were young, <laughs> but I, I didn't have the privilege of uh, being in high school when she became principal, but uh, these, these benchmarks are amazing. The, I've seen for myself the, the community support and mm -hmm. school spirits at an all-time high and uh, it, seeing the community come together for you know j just our high school is a great thing and, and you've done a great job in excelling education mm -hmm. and uh, setting the tone for what it should be mm -hmm. thank, thank you, you. ma'am thank you okay um, Mr. LaCourse do you have anything no, I send regards from my three sons who graduated from Tarpon High School, <laughs> and I uh, told them you were speaking tonight. Thank so, you. so oh, thank you, and thank you for all you do for the community. Thank you. It's my pleasure. How about our other two graduates up here, Ms. Jacobs? I too want to thank her. I think she does an amazing job, and the school's been great. Thank you. Thank you. Chief, uh, thank you for your partnership and thank your leadership you. at the school, and go Spongers. Go Spongers. Amen. Absolutely. Thank you very much. It was an honor to present to you all of the good things at Tarpon High. Hope to see you all on campus, and please save the date, May 13th, graduation. We'll, we'll be in touch. Certainly will. Thank you, Ms. Okay. Valley. Thank you. Okay. Good, night. Thank you. good night. Okay, we're going to go to uh, public comments now. <clears throat> Are there any public comments uh, on anything that's not on the agenda this evening? Hi, good evening. David Ballard Geddes, Jr. I live on Georgia Avenue uh, in Palm Harbor, down, down by that roundabout they're building. Um, to repeat myself, the Federalist Papers in Federalist Paper Number 1, the very first sentence, Hamilton abridges into a second constitution. The Federalist Papers reveals three constitutions seen as the former, the latter, and the last resort. Article 6 of this constitution that we're in currently reveals this constitution under this constitution as under the Confederacy. The, the Federalist Papers, I feel, weren't written by Hamilton and Madison. I feel as though the Federalist Papers were drafted by guys like Spinoza, uh, Hobbes, Descartes, John Locke, and so forth. Um, I feel that the, the self-evident fraudulence of the Declaration of Independence, when in the course of human events, serves as preamble to Hamilton's second constitution, somewhere around in here. A second constitution is revealed 
in statute 373.715. <coughs> That's the chapter that supports the Swift Mud Southwest Florida Water Management District. The 14th Amendment gives rise to water jurisdictions as a so-called due process of this Constitution that we're in today. The 14th Amendment birthing of a water jurisdiction is, is navigated under maritime law, like docking a boat. Again, we're birthing a ship of war as stemming from Article I, Section 10 of the Constitution, seen as that water jurisdiction, which is shown in the Declaration as being an unwarranted jurisdiction. Um, and I feel as though with that configuration that, that I've just shown here, um, the, the Constitution that we're in today is being used as a form of reprisal. It's a medium, it's a letter of marquee, uh, and delegitimizes uh, the powers that be, uh, so to speak, um, when it comes to regards to ambassadors and, 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 and so forth, as referenced in Article, Article 3 of the Constitution. Um, that uh, um, we have some high seas hypocrisy going on with the Constitution that needs to be brought into light. And I thank you for your time on this matter again. Thank you, Mr. Geddes. Are there any other public comments this evening? <coughs> Chris Roboski, 1602, Gulf Beach Boulevard, Tarpon Springs, 34689. So I've got an update for you on Mr. Clay Colson's case against the city uh, as he endeavors to protect the 74 acres along the Anclove River that will someday soon become a park. So we finally won a round in court. Uh, if you recall, a couple weeks ago when I was standing here, I told you if you read what Mr. Colson filed in response to what the city filed, that Mr. Colson would prevail, and he has. The judge filed an order denying the city's motion to dismiss and granted our motion to enlarge time. Even more exciting uh, is the filing from the Morgan Group's attorneys. Response in opposition to appellant's motion to enlarge time in which they spell out how much damage Clay's lawsuit is doing to them and their project. And this is quoted directly from that document. Morgan Group objects to that requested relief, which is tantamount to a stay, because the outcome of the lawsuit and this appeal directly impact Morgan Group's right to use and develop the subject property, unless and until the orders are affirmed. Thereby concluding the litigation, Morgan Group is at risk in proceeding with its development. So where the city voted and submitted a stay, and it was thrown out by the court. And the concerned citizens of Tarpon Springs filed for a stay, and it was thrown out. Mr. Colson, by their own admission, has obtained a stay against the Morgan Group. So he's doing very well. Now, the city, on the other hand, and I have more to say about this when we get to the, uh, to the next item on the agenda, is going to have to really look long and hard at how they're going to proceed. I mean, I'm, I'm torn here. You know, I want Mr. Colson to prevail, but I also have to live in this city. And so it's very important what kind of legal representation we get in our city. So I'll have more to say about that in a moment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robofsky. Are there any other public comments? Any other public comments? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? If anyone online would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand. You'll be allowed in to talk. And we do have a raise hand. Okay, thank you. Or we did? Yes, we do. Okay, I'll allow them in.
Good evening. Peter Delacus, 514 Ashland Avenue. And uh, I did have a comment on the presentation, but there was no call for public comment on that. So I would like to take 30 seconds of my comment uh, on that item and then begin uh, my general public comment. So my comment on the presentation by Ms. Fadalidis, the school is doing well, and what can we do as a board in the city to help them? And again, I'm gonna bring in front of you a sports complex. Mark, you're there, I see Paul in the audience, ask him about it. We did a study when I was on the board how to develop that land into a sports complex. That's where you can put your lacrosse field. That's where you can put a swimming pool, more centrally located for the community. So those are my comments about the school. Now, my general comments, if my two minutes begin. In the Tampa Bay Times perspective on Sunday, January 15th, there was an article about finding our happiness. And one of those was, these are the least stressful, most meaningful jobs in America. And I'm just going to quote a few lines. Y'all can read the whole thing yourself, either online or in your hard copy. Envy the lumberjacks, for they perform the happiest, most meaningful work on earth, or at least they think they do. Farmers, too. Agriculture, logging, and forestry have the highest levels of self-reported happiness and lowest levels of self-reported stress of any major industry category, according to our analysis of more than 13,000 time journals from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And I continue. The most meaningful and happiness-inducing activities were religious and spiritual, but the second happiest activity, sports, exercise, and recreation, helps crack the case. And like farming, recreation ranks high in both happiness and pain, and the two activities have one obvious thing in common. They take place outside, preferably in nature. We found that while your workplace looms as the most single most stressful place in the universe, the great outdoors ranks in the top three of both happiness and meaning. Researchers across the social and media medical science fields have found a strong link between mental health and green space or being outdoors. Dana Chandler, co-owner of Family Tree Forestry in South Carolina, compared work in the forest not just to therapy, but to aromatherapy. It's therapy. The woods is therapy. The forest is therapy. You can have the worst day ever, but when you get out there, the forest just takes it away. Just as importantly, you know your work is sustainable. So the point I'm making is y'all are on a good path towards preserving as much open land uh, there will be a couple items later on the agenda with regards to that that I'll speak later, but I do want to put front and forth that due, due to the fact that we are so already built out, it's even more imperative to preserve whatever open spaces we have. Thank you for your time. God bless you, and I'll be paying attention and watching as we go. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Delacus. Mr. Jump, anyone else up there? And we do not have anyone else att attend. Thank you. Um, Ms. Jacobs, is there anything? We have not received any we don't have anything. emails for the okay. meeting. Okay, that ends public comments. Let's go to the uh, consent agenda. We have item one, attorney's fees, Eunice Salzman Jensen, B, Johnson Jackson, PLLC. Item two, award file number 230086-N-AAS, single source purchase of crystal art exhibit lighting services. Um, item three, award file number 230095-N-AS, single source purchase of Houston Polytank for hydrofluorosilicic and polyethylene storage tanks. Got that one. <laughs> item four, increase file number 220031-N-AS, single source purchase of Taser brand, Taser 7 conducted energy weapons Item five is award file number 230093-N-AS, single source purchase of Arantis Dual Model Club uh, 2550 with motor and space heater blower. Um, any of the items, uh, do commissioners wish to pull any of the items? Go ahead, Commissioner. Eisen. Number one. Number one. Anyone else? Okay. Um, let's go ahead and, and have a motion. I'm sorry. Yes, let's go ahead and have a motion and a second to uh, approve items one, three, four, and five, and then we'll go to public comments on anything there. No, not one. No. I'm two, sorry. Three, four, five. Two, three, four, five. Thank you. 
a motion to approve consent agenda items two through five. Second. Okay. Um, are there any public comments on any of these four items? Mr. Jump, anything on remote access? And we do not have anyone attending at this time. Okay. Um, any commissioners have any comments on these? Roll call, please. Commissioner Kouyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Um, Commissioner Eisner, you pulled item one. Yes. <clears throat> As I do, <clears throat> excuse me, um, most months, I just wanted to remind the board and the residents that um, some of the numbers for our attorneys were uh, averaged over $22,000 per month all of year uh, 2022, and uh, it was 11000 in October, 11000 in November, and this month it came in at $6,459. So I just wanted to, you know, make that known that's all i have no nothing else that i want to say thank okay. you all right um let's go to public comments are there any public comments on item one chris roboski 1602 gulf beach boulevard tarpon springs 34689 so i wish i could have contacted you before this but i just read this before minutes before i got in my car so here we go Review correspondence from Shane Costello. Review motion prepared email correspondence to Shane Costello regarding motion to intervene. Receive, review, execute, and forward motion to dismiss. Now sure, it's a bargain at $87.50, but what that reads like to me is Costello drafted that motion that the city filed. Now I hope that's not correct, uh, but I'm pretty sure just last week you guys investigated somebody for passing on stuff that another attorney did, but it reads, receive, review, execute, and forward motion to dismiss. Now, they did not file a motion to dismiss. The Morgan Group did not. The city did. And that's the one that I told you that we would prevail against because it was so horribly written and there were so many mistakes in it. So, I mean, if you guys want to let them keep doing that, by all means, and, and Mr. Colson will prevail entirely. Which, which item were you talking about, A or B? Or this I, is I A. a? This okay. is, uh, you just scroll down, or, uh, it is $87.50, so it'll jump right out at you. It's one, two, three, four items down. No, no, I, I'm familiar with the invoice. I just, for the benefit of clarification of, of the residents, I don't think you identified, maybe you did, I didn't understand. Okay, well, this is about the bill from Mr. Salzman. Okay, got it. And all I can say is it sure looks like he allowed the developer to draft the motion that the city filed. I don't know if that's true or not. I hope that is not true. Uh, but the, I mean, I don't know how you read that any other way. So maybe it's miswritten, but it sure doesn't look right. And again, uh, I, it, no way professionally or even personally do I have anything against Mr. Salzman at any way at all. I am just trying to get to the bottom of the facts here, right? And if you looked at the stuff that the city filed and then you looked at the stuff that Mr. Colson filed, you would see it was, <laughs> he pointed out so many errors and problems with it. So um, any way you slice it, this doesn't uh, appear to be uh, good news. Thank right, you. Let's finish up with public comments. Uh, are there any other public comments on this particular item? On item one? Of the con of the um, consent agenda, Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? And we do not have anyone attending online. Okay, Mr. Salzman, would you like to say anything? Or I, I don't know who this gentleman is, and I don't know what bills he reviews, but no one drafts anything for me other than me, okay. and I don't work with anybody else other than who the commission is authorized or the city manager knows. And I actually think your accusation is defamatory. It is totally untrue. And I don't know if you're a lawyer or not, but if you are one, you better watch your canons of ethics. If you're not, then you're trying to practice law without a license. 
and it's ridiculous. And I will not sit here and listen to these accusations and not respond. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Salzman. Uh, are there any commission comments on this item? <clears throat> the only thing I want to say is, um, you know, is I, I'm looking at facts, and facts, we're, we're busier than we've ever been, and the, Mr. Salzman's been fair, and um, I, I, I hear what has been said, but I have to also give a chance for uh, Mr. Salzman to say, and we know that he's, you know, working on his own, that there is no other people. So there could have been a misunderstanding, but uh, the bottom line is we're getting um, good legal advice at, uh, at pretty much 50% of what we've been paying for uh, a long time. So I, I right now have no complaints on this particular thing. So. Okay. Vice Mayor Lunt. I don't have any comments okay. at this time. Commissioner Carr. No comments. Okay, I'm not. I'm, I'm good on the item one. May I have a motion and a second to approve? Motion to approve item one. I'll second. Okay, are there any further commission comments? Roll call, please. Commissioner Kulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lund? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Okay, let's move on to the uh, special consent agenda. Um, Item six is commission direction for land development code amendments. Uh, City manager, of course. Yeah, I've, Renee is going to present this item, but pretty much <laughs> what this item is going to start with is um, what we're working on. We, we got a lot of work we tried to do before the end of the year, and we accomplished that. Um, there's still some items that we'll start off with, what items we're still working on. Then we've, we've looked at the items that we've also heard from this board and want to deal with. We have kind of, we have bringing them to you. Um, you got an update today where we kind of ranked what our thoughts, the commission's priority would be on these things, but we want to hear tonight um, what those priority is and, and move efficiently and within the bounds that we can with the workload we have to begin bringing these forwards in phases um, to get done what this commission wants done. So with that set up, Renee, I'll let you get the presentation uh, on the items. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, as the city manager said, um, we've identified um, a set of some additional code amendments through some of these have been um, identified um, by the board, uh, by the Planning and Zoning Board, and as well as um, several that staff have identified that just through the years of working with the land development code that have been consistent, you know, sticking points and problem issues. So um, to the city manager's point, however, you know, the, the, the previous set of amendments that the board uh, gave us direction on, we still have to wrap up the, the code amendment on annexations. Uh, the coastal hazard area design criteria um, and the mitigation, if you recall, those were in play and they got deferred for some additional work, so we have to wrap those up. Um, the review fees for the stormwater and other similar engineer of record reviews, um, that's in progress. Um, we need to wrap that up as well and bring that to the board. Um, and then, uh, you know, along with all of that going on, the other two big projects, obviously the comp plan update, um, and then the strategic plan implementation with the board, um, you know, moving forward. So, so we have a, do have a lot in the hopper. These, we've these, these additional code sections that we've identified to work on, you know, those will come later uh, in, the, in the year, but we're trying to kind of plan workload and everything. So um, I'll just kind of quickly go through uh, the list. The list itself is in order of how they, how they appear in order in the land development code. Um, so under the uh, schedule of district regulations, um, <coughs> boat and RV storage is not identified as a permitted use. So uh, anywhere, so we, that was a PNZ issue. Um, within the single family residential district, specifically the R100, we conduct just a ton of variances because the, the setbacks are just very large. Um, so that's something that we would like to look at in the future. Um, our section on storage structures, shelters, and things like that, there's a lot of vagueness in there that really needs to be cleaned up. We, we're constantly trying to interpret uh, the ordinance and you get changes in staff and changes over time so you lose consistency. Um, the swimming pools, this is a long ongoing issue with um, 
the setback between water's edge and the and the screen closure. Um, if you want to know more about that, just you know, please ask. But I won't delve into it. But it's an issue. Um, fences, wall, fences, walls, and hedges, um, fences in front yards, and visibility triangles continue to be um, problematic um, at times. Um, yard encroachments, again, pool, pool screen enclosures, uh, specifically the hard land, uh, pan roofs on the lanais, continually crop up as problems. Um, our alcoholic beverage license uh, section is you know, needs some updating, again, specifically with the outdoor entertainment regulations that are kind of tucked into that. Um, our docks, piers, and shoreline structures there, the electric service for docks on vacant land, again, kind of an ongoing issue. Um, probably the highest priority in this list is the plan development regulations. Um, there were previous uh, <clears throat> code amendments that took place that allowed for uh, waivers by the Board of Commissioners with a plan development for virtually anything in the land development code, just about. And so <clears throat> I really think that was something that we probably want to quickly try to evaluate. Um, and perhaps um, change. That was a, it was a major change in, I believe, 2019. Um, and then the screening requirements in general, again, this has cropped up as something that just needs attention and to be beefed up to provide some greater protections uh, to, the, you know, to adjoining property owners when you have parking lots or commercial that happens to be next to residential, even though they've been longstanding situations. So that's the list that we've identified. And again, we've broken that out. If they have a one, that would be the highest priority, two, three, and four you know, uh, following on in, in order of priority for what we think we should focus on uh, when we jump into these um, a bit later. Also, um, in your backup, um, Commissioner Carr did reach out to the city manager with um, f uh, four items. Um, I went ahead and in included them in the list for consideration and direction from the board if you want to include those with, the, with this overall list, um, and I'll leave that uh, for, for the board's decision. Uh, so with that, I'll stop and answer any questions you might have. Okay, thank you. Um, let's go to commission, I'm sorry, public comments. Are there any public comments concerning this item? Please come forward, sir, if you can give your name and address. Good evening. My name is Dennis O'Connell, and I own a home on 1573 Ember Lane in Tarpon Springs. I also own a vacant residential building lot on 1658 Seabreeze Drive here in town, right down the road from where I reside. I would like to thank the board for allowing me to address my situation this evening. Basically, I had a dock with a lift recently, which of course requires electricity to run. A permit was issued by the town for me to have a portable generator on the lot to supply the electrical power. However, after thinking about the disadvantages of a generator, that being a noise nuisance to my neighbors and additionally to me, since the heavy generator would have to be carried on and off the property each and every time it was in use. I decided a better idea was to put in for a new permit with the town to have an underground electrical line installed from the telephone pole near my lot to the dock in order for the lift to work, which would later be used for construction of our new home. Prior to approaching the town for the permit, I contacted Duke Energy before proceeding any further. An engineering technologist from Duke was assigned to me to determine if what I wanted done could be done. The specialist met with me at the lot and reassured me that he did not see any concerns with the installation and even went on to say that this was done frequently on other lots, even in town and was not at all a safety issue. I also have confirmation emails from Duke verifying the installation of the power on which I spoke to him about. If you'd like those, I can give that to you with a letterhead. Okay. It was only after that I submitted an application for a new permit with the town 
which was eventually denied, although I am not aware of the reason for this denial. And so I am asking this commission to consider changing the town ruling so that I can proceed with the installation of an electrical source by Duke Energy. Thank you for your time. I am open to any questions that you have. Okay. Um, Mr. Powell, this isn't really a form for a question and answer. Uh, this had to do with the specific items uh, that Mrs. Vincent had brought up as far as policy matters not dealing with a, an individual situation such as yours. Mm -hmm. um, for the record, I'm very familiar how we got to the point of putting docks on vacant lots. I was city manager and this is how it got started 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I'll be happy to discuss that with you tomorrow. Oh, okay. um, I, I wasn't sure if I was to come now or. No, to, well, um, yeah, yeah, you're obviously free to make your comments, and, yeah. and, they're, yeah. and they're always invited here. Yeah. But as far as getting into a specific discussion on it, I'd prefer to do that with you one-on-one -on -one rather than doing it here publicly. And I can kind of share with you the back. I don't even know if Ms. Vincent understands the background of all of this, but this business of the docks began with realtors, and I'll get into that with you. Um, it was a different time for Tarpon Springs, and, and basically, I can understand where we're going to get into some issues with um, uh, primary uses and, and accessory uses, and we can talk about that tomorrow if you'd like. Yeah. Or if you want to give okay. me a call or call my secretary, and make an appointment, I'll be happy to sit down with you with the city manager, and we can go over that. Mm -hmm. uh, the only reason I'm offering that is I've got some history here with this particular item on how it got to where it is, and perhaps why you're not being uh, uh, given approval on this thing. Yeah. So, yeah. okay. I just, I remember the ruling was bundled with water and sewers, which does not concern it's, it's, me at all. It, yeah. All I'm going to say, it's more than that. Yeah. And I think if we, if the commission wishes to change the policy, it's a policy issue. Yeah, if, the wish, if the commission wishes to, to change the policy, okay. it's got to be changed for everybody, not just yourself in your particular situation. That, so that's right. how... Yeah. I would prefer to handle it, but it would be up to the commission as far as how to handle it. I'm just one out of five up here. Uh -huh. and, and so we can discuss that and, and then we can go from there if you'd like. Okay, I All thank right. you. Thank you. Um, are there any other public comments? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? And we do not have anyone attending online at this time. Okay, um, commission comments. Any comments? Vice Mayor Lund. I have no comments. This is on all the items that Ms. Vincent presented, uh, not just the item that you heard about the, uh, the dock with the uh, power going to the dock. I have some questions. You're okay? All right. No comment. Um, you're, you're looking for direction on this, right? Correct. Okay. Do you want us to move forward with these, you know, in the fullness of time? You know, obviously, we need to go to P and Z and get, you know, there's a lot of work that goes into these, so we just want to kind of get a clear path to what we can work on. Probably the, ma the major thing we need is this is what we interpret from everything that's Terms going on is the order of priorities. Okay. Obviously, this commission sets the priorities, and you can adjust, change, move up, move down um, anywhere you want. We're just looking to set the stage for the next three to six months okay. to, to go into when we're finishing <clears throat> what we're doing to, to go to be beginning the next phases of them and we want to make sure our policies are our order is consistent with what this um, board is vice mayor Lund, i suspect without any comments you're okay with the priorities as you see them you're okay with the priorities as they're laid out um i actually think the uh the number item number four the variances for the r100 rear and side setbacks um need to be moved up a little bit in that I know there's uh, we're okay. continually asked for variances on this particular item, and if we're going to address it as a whole, I'd rather it be sooner than later. Okay. All right. Let's let's is that it then, as far as your comment? Yeah, that's it. Okay, Vice Mayor. I'm sorry, Commissioner Carr. Thanks. Uh, so, Renee, I just want to understand. So these are obviously they're not solutions here. These are just issues that have come Correct. up. So for instance, swimming pool setbacks from water's edge, what does that actually mean? 
So we have a requirement in the land development code that uh, when you construct a pool and you have a screen cage, you have to have three foot of deck between the water's edge and, and the edge of the, and, and the screen cage. Um, it's been in our code forever, and I would bet that every pool contractor in the Tampa Bay region has told us that we're the only city and that has that particular requirement. Um, anyway, so that one continually emerges as problematic, especially as, you know, if you have people that have had pools put in without screen enclosures and then they want a screen enclosure, they can't meet setback requirements from, you know, so it becomes problematic um, a lot of times with redevelopment issue, you know, redevelopment and rehab of homes and things like that. So, but it's just been a, continually been an issue. Okay, yeah, I, I mean, I, I've got no issues with the way they're um, prioritized. Uh, I guess I would need to learn more about each one of them to understand exactly what's going on there. One of the things with the walls and hedges and um, or fences, I think some of the fence heights, not just in the front yard, but <coughs> backyards and side yards, I think are capped at six feet. That might be an area we may need to look at as well too, to allow a little bit higher um, of a fence because of the different um, levels, I suppose, mm -hmm. uh, in people's backyards. Uh, a, a couple things that aren't on there is also, I think it would be a good idea to look at is some type of commercial design guideline um, not in a specific, like very detailed, but to avoid like a situation that we have on Lemon Street, uh, where we have like a large metal building that's just like a block piece of metal building. Not that I'm against the development, but it's something that a lot of neighbors express frustration about because it doesn't really fit the neighborhood, um, but they're able to build it. So if we could put something in there that just states that you have to have some type of, I'm not against metal buildings either, I'm just like <coughs> against that straight brick block or uh, a, giant rectangle, giant square with um, a lot of just blank wall. Um, so that would be something I think would be good to, to look at as well too. And that would obviously fall, I think in the four category or five category. Um, a couple of things that I put on there as uh, some additional items that have come up time and time again is uh, in the commercial properties when parking lot landscaping is done, it's really to prevent um, some type of border uh, for the car lights from going out into the roads. Um, or just from some, um, um, I'm sorry, uh, just hedging as well, just to buffer some of the, the parking lot. Uh, and one of the issues is a lot of times there's the design aspect of it. They put in plants that don't apply really to that. They don't, they don't fit well. And so that was one of my um, requests um, in the backup. And then additionally, uh, looking at canopy trees or canopy palms versus a... Um, versus like a dwarf palm and then removing crepe myrtles. Uh, I could get into more details about this, but I do think these are all important things to address and it's gonna make Tarpon Springs better at the end of the day. Uh, one of them that I think is more important and I think it should be probably put up at a higher um, clip than maybe three or four is actually the widths of our roads with new developments. Uh, this is something that's come up a couple times and the board's probably familiar with it is when a developer comes in with a planned development or something along those lines of having a development they make the roads as small as they can, and then there's no parking allowed on the roads. And time and time again, it seems to be the, the going, or I think there's been at least three or four of these in a row, where the width of the roads are too small to allow parking, um, and then the board pushes back on it and saying, well, no, you need to have a wider road so a fire truck could come down, and you need to at least have parking on one side of the road. So I do think it's important to, to have that requirement that the width of the road be looked at, that it's a wider road, and then at least the fire department could come down the road with one side of the road allowing parking. So with that, I, I'm good with as proposed, but adding those a couple different items as well too. Thank you. Commissioner Eisner. <laughs> thank you, Mayor. Um, one thing here, Renee, thank you. Um, this confuses me a little bit because on line two, you have these down as quick fixes. Some of them. <laughs> okay. Well, that's well. When uh, to me, when I read these and I saw it was a quick fix, I really didn't think that there would be such a need for a priority uh, from us. It's um, I'm very familiar with the setbacks on pools. I'm well aware of the three foot setback as being on the board of adjustments. I know the problems that happen with this. I mean, those are pretty easy to just get it together. Um, and, and get our, our approval to make that change, correct? So, some of these are easier than others, but even, even that one, you know, there, my hesitation with 
just saying, yeah, these are quick fixes because, you know, I, sometimes, you know, good intentions go awry. <laughs> so, I, you know, some of these I do want to reach out to neighboring communities and find out what they're doing before I, you know, put pen to paper and say, yeah, let's, let's go in this particular direction. Mm -hmm. Some just researching the Board of Adjustment variances over the last, you know, four or five years and seeing what that leads to. So, you know, while things something like the pool screen enclosures or the, uh, you know, the, 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 the deck width is fairly simple, but I'll be honest with you, I don't know what it should be. So, <laughs> so I need to look and, you know, come up with something that's, you know, we have to evaluate it. So they're not, they're, they're quick, but they're not really quick. Right, I understand. But some of them that are quick, you know, rather than us uh, prioritize them, it would be better to um, try to prioritize them by how we can remove them quicker. Because there are some that I know that are m much more in depth. Um, so rather than me choosing these by um, just by numbers, I'd rather choose them according to how you feel we can get through them at a quicker rate. Well, and actually, I took that. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No um, I I took that into consideration with my ranking. Right. So you know, I the the plan development regulations. That was something that you know is not too difficult to deal with because you know, mm -hmm. it has a previous ordinance to directly go to and say, let's undo this. The screening requirements to me is just a very high priority. Again, it's not that's not difficult to deal with. You know, the the swimming pools again, not not. So I, I took that into consideration, I, but the reason I put the single family residential, the, you know, those repeated variances in the R100 is because, I mean, I, to, this is an odd term to use, but that's like a sacred zoning district in the city. It's been around forever and you know, people like those yards. So again, I, we need to be thoughtful about how we're going to address, you know, address perhaps reducing the side or the rear yards in those district, in that district. So. Cool. That's why I mean. So I, I did take that into consideration with the rank with the ranking. So I mean, for what it's worth. Well, I'm just saying though that if we can get rid of or go through some of the easier ones right. first and make our workload smaller, sure. and the ones that are a little bit more difficult to, to work on as as a for not that they're not important at all. Um, so that was my comment with this. As far as um, you know, changing any of on. Commissioner Carr's uh, stuff that he's requesting. I, I would like to go according to uh, staff recommendations rather than commission recommendations, and then we decide according to what staff suggests rather than us doing the uh, the recommendation as far as for landscaping. Um, as far as for parking and street widths that we had, we've dealt with that and we've turned it down, but I don't want to restrict um, every development is different, and I don't think I want to restrict um, parking or no parking. Uh, each development that we have, we don't have that many really big developments right now that we have to deal with any which way, but when we have them, if it doesn't pass, uh, you know, our TRC and our site plans and all that stuff, we turn it down anyway. So um, is there really a need to change our code? We might have the need where we want to have no parking there. I don't know. Um, I just hate to tie up our hands and put something in that we have the uh, power to refuse any which way. So I don't know it would be for further discussion down the road. Um, is that it? I, I don't know if you want me to comment on, you know, I'm a biker, so I love bike paths. I'm, I don't know how we can change that. All of our roads in town are skinny roads. and. A lot of the places from where um, trailers are, are riding around and catching the soil and dirt and gravel, we, we have gaping holes that we need to you know go around and patch up. So I don't know how we're going to change the bicycle. I'm for it. Uh, I just don't know where we're going to get that extra land for, uh, you know, believe me, they blow the horns like crazy. They're speeding around like crazy. So, so that's, that's my take on it. Thank you. Commissioner Kuyas. Hi, Renee. I appreciate you and city staff prior, uh, prioritizing the, the code section, and uh, we, uh, you guys have done a great job and hard work over these you know, last six, seven months 
handling each one of these codes as they come along. Uh, can you touch up a little bit on the alcoholic beverages and issues with the outdoor entertainment regulations? Sure. So um, we have regulations in the alcoholic beverage licensing section and the alcohol control section of the code that speak to when you can have outdoor entertainment and and it's but it these <laughs> how do I back up this all the conditional uses for alcohol used to come to the board of commissioners and then that was changed several years ago and now they're still conditional uses but they're reviewed by staff essentially and eventually signed off on by the city manager but within that um, there are regulations that allow outdoor entertainment within as long as there's distance separation requirements from residentially zoned or land zoned or or uh, used land um, but then there's exceptions for if it's you know that that buffer doesn't you know that distance separation doesn't isn't required if it's a special restaurant license for what used to be called a 4COP SRX license. So there's a lot of moving parts to it and, and we just don't have a good handle on outdoor entertainment and we end up having to regulate it through the noise and things like that. So city manager, you look like you want to meet. <laughs> no, I, okay. it, we realize how much of a problem it is that yeah. we need to delve into and, and get a code that's consistent and combines those two and gets to where I, we want I, to Ideally, I would like to just pull the outdoor entertainment completely out of that and have it be a separate section that's regulated in and of itself, so. Yeah, thank you for explaining it. Sounds, sure. <laughs> and I now understand why it's uh, yeah. one of the top priorities. And uh, I would touch up on what Commissioner Carr and Eisner uh, Commissioner Eiser stated with the uh, land use with codes. Uh, I don't want to take away any landscape or, or plants that are already included, but I, I would um, I would support you in uh, speaking with staff and the arborists to see any other mm -hmm. uh, trees or plants that could be added to give uh, developers uh, more range of ideas for for planning. So sure. thank you. Yeah, I. Um, from, from my perspective, you're asking for priorities, but uh, I know there's even higher priorities than what you have here that <laughs> I, I think we need to come back. And, and um, I, I uh, asked the city manager, surely Ms. Vincent isn't looking for work because she doesn't have anything to do. <laughs> so from my perspective, whatever the priorities are that come out of here, please use your own judgment. Sure. There's other things in my opinion are more important to get back to the commission. So um, these would be good to fill in I, I don't have an issue with the priorities. The, um, uh, I don't have an issue with what uh, Commissioner Carr is asking. I, I think there may be some challenges. Uh, a couple of the streets that he mentioned are county roads as far as striping and things of that. I'm sure they've got a policy, their own policy with regard to bike trails. Um, the, my only concern, I, I think our staff has always done a good job as far as uh, public projects, as far as the tree plantings and things like that. I think it's once, somebody from up here gets involved things don't go well and they don't go as planned and so i would like to uh whatever you come back with as far as the um uh I, i'm all for canopies i would prefer to stay with canopies i know sometimes we don't do that but i'd like to stay with that so i i defer to our staff and and uh, our arborists to work with you on that again that would be just as a fill-in um given everything else that's going on as well. So I'm not sure, does that help? Yes, uh, that's good direction. Okay. I think we got good direction on that. Yeah, I mean, you've heard everybody, yes. so, um, okay. Is there anything else on that? No, sir. Okay. Um, thank you, Ms. Vincent. It's 7.33, so we're gonna go to our ordinances and resolutions, and, and what I'm gonna do is, unless somebody's got an objection, I'm gonna put Item 13 first. Mayor, did you want any public comment on that? I just want to make sure. Oh, that. I'm sorry. You're right. Are there any public comments? Mr. Geddes? Uh, Thank yes, you. Yes, quickly. David Ballard Geddes, Jr. I live on Georgia Avenue uh, in Palm Harbor. Years ago, I used to live uh, down the uh, street um, on Goshen and Diane, down in that area there. And a woman had peach trees in her front yard. I grew up with millions of fruit trees in this town. Countryside Mall was still a cow field. There were uh, grapefruit groves and so forth, mulberry trees, pecan trees, yet the city and the municipal governments don't seem to grow anything of any resource at all. Bottle brush, oleanders, 
ligustrum, pittosporum, viburnum, et cetera, and so forth, that are perfidious in my eyes in regards to, I like to see an edible landscape. Maybe we could promote this type of, when I was a kid, we had a 4-H club. We kind of, you know, looked into stuff like that. And it seems as though the city governments kind of drew a blind eye on, let's not plant a pomegranate tree, or let's not plant a, a you know, whatever fruit-bearing tree. Instead, let's plant this other stuff. And I just, I disagree with that um, uh, oleander and bottle brush kind of mentality. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Geddes. Are there any other public comments? Okay, Mr. Jump, are there any public comments on this item? And we do not have anyone attending online. Ms. Jacobs, uh, no <coughs> emails for anything else, is all right? Okay. Now, it's a little quick. Um, our, our normal time for going to ordinances and resolutions is 7.30. We're past that, so I uh, kind of jumped the gun a little bit on the public comments. So what we're going to do, unless someone's got an objection, is to have item 13 first, which is the cohatch. Um, item let me get to yeah, that thank you. Uh, the cohatch resolution and um, I want to give um, our city attorney a heads up he's going to be involved in this and um, also it's a quasi judicial okay with that okay so uh, Mr. Salzman let's go ahead with the <coughs> resolution 2022-42 if you could read it by title please Resolution 2022-42, a resolution of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, approving application number 22-87, requesting site plan approval for J. O. Delato and Sons, Inc. to construct the Cohatch Tarpon Springs restaurant and office space in 13,150 square feet, more or less, of existing and new gross floor area located at 121 East Tarpon Avenue on the north side of East Tarpon Avenue between North Safford Avenue and Hibiscus Street in the T5 that has already been established. In a quasi-judicial hearing, the board is required by law to make findings of fact based upon the evidence presented at the hearing and apply those findings of fact to previously established criteria contained in the Code of Ordinances in order to make a legal decision regarding the application before it. The board may only consider evidence at this hearing that the law considers competent, substantial, and relevant to the issues. If the competent, substantial, and rele relevant evidence at the hearing demonstrates that the applicant has met the criteria established in the Code of Ordinances, then the board is required by law to find in favor of the applicant. By the same token, if the competent, substantial, and relevant evidence at the hearing demonstrates that the applicant has failed to meet the criteria established in the Code of Ordinances, then the board is required by law to find against the applicant. Okay. Would you like to swear anybody in? If anyone's so. going to speak on this, please stand, raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give in this proceeding is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Okay. Ms. Vincent, uh, the applicant's here? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions first. Um, whether there is anyone <coughs> here that claims to be an affected party? Mr. Tirapani, I, I, and Ms. Tirapani, I know you, so uh, you're qualified as an affected party. You own property nearby. Anyone else? Mr. Fackless, same here. Sir, I'm not familiar with you. If you could come forward and state your name and address and both of you, yes. Uh, William, William Wolf, 412 Denise Street, Tarpon Springs, own Sunshine Supply. What, say that again. I own Sunshine Supply in downtown East Tarpon Ave. How far is that from this particular property? A couple hundred yards. Okay. Well, Go ahead and establish you as an affected party. Themelina, if you could come forward and state your name and address. Themelina Makris, 124 Tarpon Avenue East, and I own Ambiance Hair Salon directly across the street. That's fine. Uh, Mr. Salzman, business owners uh, qualifies as an affected party. Yes, okay, sir. thank you. Okay. Um, 
Has any commissioner had any ex parte communications with the applicant? I, I had one with a resident. They reached out to me and just expressed and they're not interested. Are they an affected party? Uh, yes. Okay. Well, could you state who that was? Uh, Mr. Uh, Fadley, or not Fadley, geez. <laughs> um, Sunshine Supply? No. Fackless. Oh, Mr. Jeez, Fackless. I'm sorry, okay. I drew a blank. <laughs> all right. Mr. Fackless. Brain, brain freeze happens to all of us. Um, okay, any other commissioner? Okay, has um, any commissioner believe they have a conflict of interest on this item for any reason? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to ask the, um, well, let's see. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and open the, um, the hearing. Um, Ms. Vincent, if you could make your presentation, please. Thank you. Uh, this is application 22-87 for the Cohatch project. Uh, the project site is located at 121 East Harpin Avenue. Um, the project consists of um, a restaurant space uh, with an outdoor bar, office and meeting space. Um, I'll let the applicant go into the particulars of kind of the unique aspects of the, of the project um, that probably do need to be considered. The existing structure is 6,400 square feet and they are proposing to add an additional 6,750 square feet um, on the lot. Uh, the property is located in the T5B Tarpon Avenue Main, uh, Main Street Transect District. It's in the downtown character district of the special area plan and it is uh, designated as community redevelopment for on their future land use map. So just a little bit of location and context. Uh, this is the building here. Um, you have, this is Orange Street here, Tarpon Ave, Safford, and uh, this is Hibiscus and Court Street. So it's about mid-block um, between Hibiscus and uh, Tarpon, uh, excuse me, and Safford Ave. Um, there is an alley here that um, does function. Um, it has some choke points along it that are, that are challenging, but it, it does get use. Um, again, this is just the, uh, this is showing the character districts, which is part of the special area plan. This is in the downtown character district, so everything in this light yellow color is the downtown character district. And then drilling down a little farther uh, within the SMART code, which is the regulating plan for this area, um, the, uh, the, this orange color is the T5B, the Tarpon Avenue Main Street district and that's its limits are really just uh, one property in on off of uh, Pinellas over to um, to uh, Ring Avenue. So the building itself is um, the oldest surviving commercial building in Tarpon Springs. It has some unique architecture to it. Um, historically it's been um, a myriad of uses. Most recently, it was the site of a really a dance and nightclub uh, you know, establishment. I believe it was called Cliche. Um, this is just a survey of the property overlaid on the the aerial photograph. This isn't real legible, but this is the building footprint here. Um, you've got a couple of trees, but you also have a lot of concrete and pavers back here. Um, so there's a lot of um, impervious surface on the on the site. So just at a very high level, the applicant um, intends to add a two-story addition um, to the rear of the property, and then they have um, an outdoor patio area and an area for um, trash enclosures and, and things of that nature um, being accessed off of the alley. So, the, um, the, and so, the, so from an architectural standpoint, this did go through the Historic Preservation Board already um, and has received a certificate of appropriateness for the architecture. Um, again, these are a little hard to read on a, on a screen. And this is the rear architecture elevation. Um, uh, again, these are, just diffi these are difficult to see because of the, the, the coloring and the way that they, this is a little better rendering that you can get a better idea. So this would be the view off of the alley, um, the two-story addition. Um, the, um, the second floor actually projects out um, over this, the seating area. So the second floor is a little bit larger than, than the first floor uh, on the addition. This is you know, your seating area. Stairs to the access, uh, the upstairs from the, from the back, um, and then your, 
an area for your trash enclosures. Um, the, um, well, I'll go to that later. So the arc, uh, these are the front facade changes um, that it, uh, the, the, the second story is largely being maintained as is. The existing canopy would come off. They'll put on a, um, a uh, kind of a flat, uh, a flat canopy, um, keeping the original doors, but reworking uh, the front facade. Again, this has already been approved by the Historic Preservation Board. And just some additional renderings of what that looks like. So the floor plans, again, these are going to be really difficult to see, but you've got um, you got a, you know, a, a restaurant and meeting rooms on the first floor um, and also some office spaces, again, I'll, in, in co and co-work spaces. Again, I'll let the applicant in their presentation expound on this. And then the second floor is more, mostly um, a series of offices and, and, co and co-work space. This is the more, more private, uh, so to speak, um, for the members. So um, just again, looking at kind of the surrounding area, um, the city has been interested in improving this alley, just in terms of its appearance, adding lighting and things of, of that nature. Um, I, I spoke about some choke points um, next to, um, all coming off of Tarp, uh, Safford Avenue, uh, next to Tarpon Tavern. This is really narrow here, but it, this does, and it functions as one way going towards uh, Tarpon, uh, going, excuse me, going towards Safford Avenue. It opens up back here. Um, this looks like a choke point. At some point, uh, the piece of this was vacated, um, but it still functions because it's open. Um, so, you know, so you do have activity. You also have cars uh, that do park in the parking lot at, um, at Orange and Safford that will come out this way and traverse and leave the parking lot here. Um, and and uh, cars can also go through here and cross into the parking lot so they kind of cross the alley. So there is activity going on back there. Um, I think the biggest um, discussion point for this evening uh, will be regarding parking. Uh, this particular project, um, so just I'll just pause for a little bit. Um, the, the project did receive a variance for the allowable floor area. Um, if you look at the details of the smart code and the special and the character district for the downtown, um, there's a, a pretty good discrepancy between the two. Um, the character district specifically allows for a, um, a floor area, area ratio of 2.0 um, for the properties fronting on Tarpon Avenue. Um, but the, uh, the, land, uh, the smart code is more restrictive, so the, they did receive a variance um, to allow that additional floor area. Um, so th that, that has been uh, approved by the, by the Board of Adjustments previously. Um, regarding parking, um, so again, there is a specific um, section of the smart code that's within Table 4E um, of the smart code. It states that, park, that there's a parking exemption, essentially, for uh, tra the T5B Tarpon Avenue Main Street, which is what this district is. And it says that um, the, that transect zone shall be exempt from required parking where it can be demonstrated during the site plan review process, which is what we're in, that available public or private paid parking is within a five minute walk. Um, and that was put in specifically to recognize the uniqueness of of Tarpon Avenue, it, it really is. Um, it's built somewhat, you know, in areas, you know, lot line to lot line, and some others, it's it's not. But this is so. This is the only this area outlined in red. This is the only area where that exemption in the smart code exists, and of course, this property is within that. So to provide an analysis of what that really means, um, we looked at all of the city owned and leased parking lots within the within a five minute walk and this quarter mile a quarter mile is typically considered a five minute walk so the um this area the the, the pink shading area would be your your ped shed if you will um, we looked at city owned lots and leased lots and we um, tallied up that parking um, as available. We also identified some additional lots where we don't have leases, but there are verbal agreements. <coughs> um, you can take that for what it's worth. We did break that out so that um, in our calculations so that you can make that distinction. 
We also looked at, the, so this is kind of going a little finer grain, so you can see the specific lots in yellow are those that are either owned or leased by the city for parking. The numbers there are the actual number of parking spaces. We also looked at on-street parking. Now this was a little bit informal. I did it through off of aerial photographs, but counting the available parking spaces for on-street in this kind of general area. Um, if they weren't striped, you know, and again, counting for driveways, you're looking at you know, 22 linear feet you know, for, for, per parking space. So, so we took a very conservative estimate of that um, and then came up with approximately 230 spaces in the on-street parking spaces in these areas that are highlighted in orange. So how we apply that then, you have a total of actual, um, we, so let me back up. So we looked at within that district that was in the highlighted in the that was we looked we actually pulled using the property appraiser records um, the actual square footage of all of those properties, and so it comes up to just shy of 195,000 existing square feet. If you applied the the maximum parking required in this area, which would be three space, three spaces per thousand, um, you would come up with a a requirement for parking of 583 spaces. There is a, but there's also within the land, within the, the smart code, um, a shared parking factor. So when you apply the shared parking factor, it reduces that required parking down to 486 spaces. So I'm going to ignore the top line because that includes the verbal agreement lots. So, um, so focusing on the second line. So uh, the available downtown spaces that we, based on the city owned and, and leased lots and the on-street parking is 511 spaces. So when you do the math, you come up with that would support 200, roughly 204,000 square feet of <coughs> building. So you have a surplus of around 10,200 square feet. Um, this is, the other thing I wanna note is when we do our parking calculations in the smart code, it's actually based on net floor area, not gross. We don't have that number. So in reality, this is probably a little bit low. It would be something, you know, something higher than this, but we had gross floor area, so it's a conservative number uh, to base it on. So, uh, you know, so I'm going through that long explanation to, to say, based on what the information that we have, it appears that we could support an additional floor area of about 10,000 square feet. The applicant is adding about 6,500 square feet. So they're under that threshold. And you know, so we would, and we would need to do this, this is kind of a fluid type of, of situation. So if another property comes in two years from now, we need to look at, do this all over again. Maybe we've acquired more parking, maybe not. So maybe there's private parking. So this, you know, this is not static. It's something that's meant to be done project by project. So the, um, another um, issue of concern uh, was the uh, stormwater solution. Um, they're actually, just very slightly, they're actually decreasing the impervious surface on the site. There was a lot of existing um, pavers and concrete and compacted uh, material back here. So when our stormwater engineers of record looked at it, um, they basically, you know, and, and reviewed the plans, they agreed that, um, that this was was a compliant solution, but they did work with the city to, you know, look at the existing conditions of the alley and, and potential flooding, and so they've come up with an underground um, vault solution uh, with pervious pavers, um, and then it's this bubbler system to kind of catch overflow and, and and get it back into the stormwater system. So I'm not an expert on stormwater, but our engineers of record have reviewed this and um, have uh, have blessed this, so to speak. Um, as I already uh, indicated, the uh, Historic Heritage Preservation Board gave a, issued a certificate of approval in January of 2022 for the, uh, the addition and the exterior renovations of the existing building. The Board of Adjustments did grant a variance for floor area in May of 2021. Um, all other um, 
uh, provisions of this, this says land development code, it should say smart code, um, have been reviewed and it is compliant um, as well as with the special area plan, um, uh, concurrency management and um, with the, yes, uh, in, in compliance with the building codes is, um, will be determined, expected to be able to comply with building codes through the building permit process. So the staff recommendation is, to, is for approval of the site plan uh, with, we have several conditions. Positioning and sizing of the trash enclosure is approved by HPB. They approved a little bit smaller um, uh, trash enclosure in the rear and they had it pushed back under, underneath of the stairs, so that needs to be reflected um, on the plans. Um, the plan detail, the stormwater solution must be added to the building permits. Um, I just, the building permit's been sitting for quite a while waiting for site plan to get done, so we just want to make sure that we close that loop. Uh, conformance with all the minimum criteria of the land development code um, and other jurisdictional permits. Uh, coordination with public art committee to be initiated as soon as possible. Construction plan consistency with the site plan and payment of fees and then the, our usual expiration within one year. Planning and Zoning Board reviewed this initially in October. Um, at that point, um, without the benefit of full information, they actually recommended denial. The applicant voluntarily returned back to that board on November 21st, um, and with seven members in approval, the board did recommend approval uh, with one member dissenting. Um, the board also recommended approval, excuse me, recommended uh, two additional, um, I said one would be a condition maybe of approval, the other was more of a direction to the city in general. Uh, one was that the applicant pursue the lease <coughs> of off-site parking downtown to support the use and that the city continue to work to establish additional parking to serve the downtown area. So neither of those are reflected in the resolution, so I'll wait for the board's direction this evening as to how you want to incorporate those um, uh, later on. So that concludes my staff presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions if I can. Some things I may have to defer to the applicant for more detail, so. Okay, thank you, Ms. Vincent. Let's go to uh, city commission questions. Vice Mayor Lund. Um, Renee, you mentioned that the Planning and Zoning Board uh, turned down this proposal the first time through because they did not have all information. So the what? applicant was not available, did not attend that night. Oh, okay. so, so it was is that the information well, that they, they didn't there have? There was somebody there, but they didn't have the full team, and so there was just some questions that they didn't feel like were at being adequately answered. All right, thank you. You're welcome. I have no further questions. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Carr. Uh, no, I don't have any questions right now. Thanks. No questions, Mayor. Commissioner <laughs> Eisner. I have a question, but it's not for Renee, and it's more so to our attorney. Uh, as I'm looking at this, I realize I have a strong possibility I was in on the Board of Adjustment vote. Um, do I have to recuse myself from voting on this? No. Okay. I'd the only ask, thing I would say, did you receive any, if you were there, did you receive any information that's different than you received tonight? If so, then I would have you declare that information. Probably not. I mean, you know. Then, I, then you should be okay. Okay. I just wanted to clear things up on that. Um, my only question I have for you is, let's say for argument's sake it passes tonight, and a little whatever facility opens up or wants to open up within the vicinity. Does that affect these numbers? Um, for the next project, it, it could. So, you know, it, if, if somebody <coughs> wants to do an expansion, you know, we're gonna have to do this math again and see where, see where we are. So, I mean, it, it's, you know, we did a pretty rigorous analysis of this. Um, I'll be honest, it's, you know, we haven't used that, that level of analysis before. Um, I think things have been maybe more um, observational in that, yes, we have city-owned parking and on-street parking within the area, and so it's fine. So, you know, it's, it's a judgment call, uh, I think, moving forward for, for our next project. My other question is, is these, uh results for the 12 month period or I mean everybody knows we're seasonal and in seasonal it's very tight parking anywhere in Tarpon Avenue in the downtown so 
that's my next question for you. Is that considered? So we, we didn't look at the occupancy of parking lots. We simply looked at how many parking spots are available on that lot, whether they're immediately available the day I looked at it or not. So I think that's a much, I think that's a larger parking analysis that somebody, that probably needs to be conducted. You're right, we're coming into peak season. I mean, I, I casually drove around, you know, this afternoon and was looking at you know, the parking lots and right around downtown, they're full, but as soon as you get out a little bit, some of the other ones, I'm like, oh, okay, there's plenty of parking spaces there. So um, I think that kind of that occupancy of parking is a different question altogether, and we did not look at that in this analysis. The other thing that I was, when I read through this, um, I don't see, um, there are certain square footage locations that don't occupy any parking or they're at different time frames. Um, this particular <coughs> place could uh, have, have people being utilizing it in the off hours. Um, is that considered at all? I, again, I think in this instance, I would, you know, I didn't go into details with that, but um, certainly your, an office use has a different peak hour than, than a restaurant or a bar. Right. So um, now this particular office use is very unique. So I, I, I think I would ask you to you know, maybe address that with, with them, but we didn't look at it in this instance, but I think it is, again, I think it's something that looking at the mix of uses certainly, uh, certainly comes into play. And that's why we have that shared parking factor being applied. So it's indirectly looked at because we apply a shared parking that assumes that at different times of the day, things will be more active than other, than other things. So you, you have that shared parking ability. Well, then I just needed you to clarify what your numbers signify versus what they're gonna present. Because I mean, I don't know when their hours are. So sure. I mean, I'd be happy to hear what they have to say as well. So I think that's it. That's all okay. the questions that I have. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate the presentation. Commissioner Kuliash. Oh, Renee, I, I, I think it's important when we talk about these uh, historical buildings, and especially this, uh, this one, what we're talking about. Uh, if, if it was requested for the board to um, give recommendations on adding some of the similar archways that are on the front of the facade of the building to the exterior, what would be the process for that? Um, that's something that would, it would have to be reevaluated by the Historic Preservation Board. Um, <clears throat> I get my, my kind of my quick answer to that from a staff perspective and having, you know, worked with Historic Preservation, you know, you generally want your, their complementary but distinct. So um, the short answer is, you know, that would, that's something that we would have to go back to the Historic Preservation Board and get their approval on. I, I don't know if that's, you know, an issue or not, frankly, until you get it back in front of them, so. And that wouldn't have to come back to us afterwards? No, it would not. Okay, uh, I think uh, some of the commission I answered or asked a lot of questions about the parking, so I'm comfortable. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, um, Ms. Vincent, uh, you know, planners and engineers look at things different. Um, in your analysis, it's um, three parking spaces per thousand square feet, yes, sir. roughly. So um, there's about 6,000 square feet that's existing and the applicant is wishing to add another 6,000 square Correct, feet. Roughly. So um, given the use, which I would suspect is by right uh, at that location, and as far as not doing anything, they would be able to open based the, uh, the existing building based on what we've got right now, which uh, is about 6,000, which would be um, eight, 18 parking spaces. The additional would require, um, which is what the issue is with the parking, an additional 18 parking spaces. Is that correct? Is that so correct? Correct. Yeah, or about right that. Yes. So really, um, what we're talking about is 18 parking spaces. I mean, if, an, if, if, if an engineer was involved, he'd be looking <laughs> at designing a parking lot for yes, the sir. additional 18 parking spaces. Okay, and then the planning and zoning commission's uh, recommendation was for uh, to, to work toward finding some private parking to convert that to public parking or else dedicated parking for the cohatch business. Is that pretty uh, much They it? had two recommendations. One, I think, was directly aimed at 
cohatch and that please find some from pay for some private parking you know so that was one and then the second recommendation was more was directed at the city uh, that we need to continue to to find parking lots and expand available public parking in the downtown okay yep all right um as far as any additional parking, the 18,000, uh, I'm sorry, the 18 parking, that would, 18 parking places, that would be within that sphere of, in, that quarter mile Correct. circle that you have? Okay. Yes. All right. Um, that's all the questions I had on this one. Uh, the standards of review, if you could go back to that. Um, that one right there. Um, yes. It, the standards of review it includes back down there again as to the city's comprehensive plan, uh, the special area plan, and then also compatibility. Uh, Correct. Is one of those. I just wanted yes. to confirm that for the record. Yes. Okay. There's right a then. discussion on the compatibility in the staff report. I didn't go into it here. So. Okay. Um, compatibility of the use. It's it, compatibility, it can be, you know, size, massing, Im, impact, use. Yeah, I think all, it's, it's a fairly comprehensive definition of compatibility. Okay. Um, all right, that ends the uh, questions for the commission. Now let me oh, may, go, wait, wait, oh, you want some follow up? Yeah, well, yes. Um, I had a question, one more question. Um, on this extra 6,000 square feet, is it uh, 6,000 6, under air or is it including the outside balcony area that's in the back because it's very hard to see it's the 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 square footage in the the second floor of their addition right. is slightly larger than the first floor it, it overhangs where the balcony area is there's not a real good um let me see if i can have a yeah i tried to look here and i i can't really see it yeah on so it. this is if this is the this is the building addition, and this is this seating area. But there's also a um, there's a there's a building outline here. So this the second floor kind of like cantilevers over that, if you will. Um, they might be able, they may have a better pic picture in their presentation. But is that included in the figures? Yes, 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 it is. So that's what's concerning me because I'm just not understanding why. Um, you'd include open space or oh I'm sorry I mean the second floor is the second floor that cantilever over is included the we don't include but so far as building area and floor area we don't include the the, the outdoor area okay that's yeah. what I want yeah. okay thank you sorry thank you okay um, Ms. Vincent this may be a, a legal question as well um, could the Commission convert that one requirement to instead of a request to look into providing additional parking to making that a requirement or condition of the approval um uh, if you don't if you think that the analysis is still insufficient to say that there's available parking based on you know within that you know quarter mile walk shed area then i mean then yes i think that's a an appropriate finding i'll defer to the attorney but i think you need to make one finding to say this is good but we don't think it's sufficient and it hasn't been demonstrated and then you could i think you could attach that condition okay well i'm just gonna not ask the city attorney but if he has an objection to anything that you said if you can <laughs> if he could speak up now no objection it's okay. uh, again it's a competent substantial evidence that the board determines whether they've received that or not, to add those conditions or, or those requirements. Thank you, Mr. Salzman. I have an additional question. Vice Mayor Lund. Do we have an idea of what the total occupancy of this building is? I mean, I know we have a restaurant, we have I don't have that other... number in my hip pocket. I'm hoping maybe the applicant might have that number. Would, our, would that have been something that would have had to been passed on to our fire? The fire department definitely would they, they and they they've been in in the review process So they're part of the technical review committee. Okay, so somebody yes. tonight. I hope will give me a, a Maximum occupancy rate because I think that might sure. better reflect Where we are from a parking perspective Thank you Are there any other follow-up questions from the, okay? I'm going to end the Commission questions here I'm going to ask the applicant whether you have any questions for Ms. Vincent 
Do you, any questions? Not, not, okay, you'll get your turn to make a presentation in, in a later time. I've got to go through each of the affected parties now and ask whether they have any questions or in the form of cross-examination of Ms. Vincent. Um, Ms. Terpani. Um, Mr. Waldman, is it? Wolf. Wolf. For Sunshine, do you have any questions of Mrs. Vincent? Just real quick, yes, I'm sorry. Um, just uh, did, I get, did I get your name right? Or? Wolf, W-O-L-F. Okay, William, B.J. Okay. Um, first of all, I thought that was a great analysis. Really appreciate you putting that together. Um, from a technical aspect, it looked like I, I'm trying to still gather the the 511 or whatever it was reduced down to 486 and what that exactly means. So I don't totally understand that because it just feels like we don't have enough parking spaces. <laughs> right? You know I mean, Understood. so just, if you could explain that just a little bit more, just I just, sure. just want to make sure I understand how. Yeah. It takes it down to that required number. Sure. Thank you. So what what he's referring to is a shared parking calculation, and let me go back to that. Um, so the smart code is inherently a mixed use code, and so in the in the parking requirements that are laid out, it presupposes that when you have mixed use, that um, just like one of the commissioners indicated. It, there'll be you know, the the parking will be at different times of the day for mixed use. And sometimes in the morning it'll be higher. Sometimes in, in the evening it'll be you know, for different different uses. So you end up with the ability to share share parking um, because of those staggered times of use. So the factor that's used in the smart code is it's 1.2. And so in this instance, what um, what you actually do is is you um, you divide the the actual parking by we divide it by 1.2 and it brings down the requirement um, to to that lower number so it's a if you look at it one way it's a multiplier if you look at it another way it's a divi divisor so it's just it's a it's a fact a shared parking factor did that help no, I did. I just saw okay right yes okay. um, mr. Fackless mr. Fackless do you have any questions for Ms. Vincent questions if you do please come forward Okay, Ms. Fossey. Right now, um, if, if you have a question, just, yeah, you have to use the microphone. Because I am closed in doors all the time and I, I do have a, a growing salon. Where is this um, other parking? Like, is there a map? Is there somewhere where I can see so I can send my clients and my staff to park? That's a very good observation and I believe Ms. Lemons has that map and <laughs> she can probably provide it to you. You can provide it to people. Yeah, definitely need because yes. I mean my business right now is growing and we're putting in more stations and stuff, and I want to know where sure. we're supposed to park and as far as you know, is it going to be is there going to be more handicap parking when more parking comes into effect because that's also been an issue that I've noticed. Mr. Terrapani, do you have some? Come up forward. calculations of square footage of available square footage in the mm -hmm. downtown the city for many years since they inappropriately tore down the Forbes building Noblet building has been trying to um, get an investor to rebuild a building at a 2.0 a two-story building be about 16,000 square feet was that 16,000 square feet in your calculation it was not thank you I think I got all the affected parties. Is that is that right? Was there anybody else that was an affected party that I didn't ask? Okay. Um, Ms. Vincent, would you like to enter your presentation into evidence? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, it's time for the applicant to make your presentation. If you'd like to come forward. The way we're going to do this is um, one person at a time, and then um, the commission may have uh, questions. And um, the way it's going to work is, uh, if I can get this right, is make your presentation. 
um, if there's, uh, uh, you're, let's say you're the applicant and then let's say you brought somebody else that's your engineer or something like that, then they would make a, a presentation and then the commission would be able to ask that engineer. They would ask you questions, then they would ask the engineer questions, and then we would ask, go back, and go through the whole thing again as far as Ms. Vincent with any cross-examination and also um, with any of the affected parties at cross-examination. We'll try it that way. Okay. Go ahead, if you could okay. state your name and address, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is John Watkins. Uh, my address is 6574 Tantallen Square, Dublin, Ohio. Uh, today, I'm accompanied by uh, my colleague, uh, Brian Sanders, uh, from the Tampa Bay area, our general contractor, uh, Darren Thompson, uh, also from the Tampa Bay area, uh, architect, um, uh, Luke, uh, with Roe uh, Ro and Associates Architects uh, here in the Tampa Bay area, uh, and uh, John, John Moran, <clears throat> uh, with Equity Program Management, also based here in Tampa. Okay. Uh, I'm one of three co-principals at Cohatch. Um, to begin our presentation, I'd just uh, like to ask uh, Brian uh, Sanders, uh, my colleague, and who runs. Uh, Let me interrupt a second. Sure. Do you need the Do you need the screen for anything? Yeah, I will be. I do have slides that I'll be showing. Vincent, do we have? That, are you set up with your control and everything already? Okay, go ahead, please. Yes, yeah. yeah, so I'd like to ask uh, Brian Sanders, uh, who's our general manager for Florida, uh, to uh, say a few words to kick off the meeting. Okay. Uh, thanks, guys. I, I guess maybe I just wanted to, uh, I don't know, say something about the posture and maybe the backstory of how Cohatch got here. Uh, maybe that would be useful or helpful, just a couple quick minutes. Um, of course, we're... I'm super excited about this project, um, and and these guys are better suited to get into the details um, of it. But you know, there is there is this sort of backstory to how Cohatch has come into to into this market. Um, I'm very much a native. I grew up in St. Petersburg. Uh, lived my whole life in the Bay Area. Raised all my kids here. Um, in fact. I just found out recently that my family is a pioneer family, which is a thing, I guess, if you can show that your your uh, family was here before Florida became a state. So there's a there's some marriage certificate in Dade City, East Pasco, of my great 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 grandfather marrying a woman named Mary Gill, and <clears throat> that was 1840. So I, all to say, I have a deep commitment to this area. In addition to that, my whole career has been spent. Um, serving this community, building nonprofits, incubating hundreds of enterprise, particularly social enterprise. So I care very deeply. In addition, the last couple of years, my work with the National Christian Foundation in Tampa Bay, which is itself a kind of conglomerate of 300, 350 <coughs> high capacity, very generous families from this area who give away about $70 million a year through the foundation from this area. And it actually was our work with the foundation that those folks, many of those folks are looking for impact investments. Impact investments are sort of like business with a heart or people that actually don't just return profits but actually have a social kind of ROI and make communities better and lift people, help people flourish, care about the communities in which they work. And actually it was us and this group of investors, I am also an investor uh, in Coach, who went looking essentially for uh, something like this and it's our opinion I think I speak for them all the investors that this is probably one of if not the best example of that kind of company commitment to communities in the country right now so <clears throat> that's I think an important backstory because we want we we sort of tried to ask them to come here they were very comfortably expanding in the Midwest and the jump uh, to come to Florida was really on our invitation and these, these investors, and they've been an amazing team to work with. And the truth is, I just think they make us better, stronger. They serve our communities, our small businesses. They have this incredible philanthropic edge. They will lift the community. They're, they're a gift to our main streets. And, um, and of course, Tarpon Springs is a, is a treasure 
for this whole area and community and anything we can do to make it better, I think is important. That's my posture. In fact, I'm so, I was so moved by the project that I dropped what I was doing and now I'm, I'm working as their operator. So I'm, I'm, I am the person really that will be in relationship with you guys and with this community uh, on a daily basis. I guess I just want to say that I want to leave it to the team, obviously, to answer your specific questions and to give their proposal. Um, I guess I just wanted to maybe put in a good word for them and say, if there's anything we can do, honestly, to, to smooth the way to help them come here, I, I, I'd love us to try. And I think it's, I think it's reciprocal. I think as a, as a company, that commitment to the community extends to all aspects, every part of the community. So anything we can do, even helping solve this parking problem, I think the heart is there to do it. Yeah, thank you. Okay, hang on one second. Sure. I'm gonna try and do this in a reasonable way so we make it fair to everybody. And then um, I'm gonna go ask the commission whether you're one of the equity investors, is that correct? Uh, but I'm also the market leader for COAS, okay. so employee. Uh, yeah. Does any commissioner have a question for this gentleman? Yeah, uh, what do you guys see in our town? What made you wanna pick that spot in that historic building? I think there's this sort of dream of a walkable kind of community again, where people don't have to get in their car and drive 30 minutes to work. Um, they live, shop, work, walk. So when when we when Cohatch can find communities like Tarpon, which are are dense and beautiful and have heritage and and I think offer the promise of that, the sort of reawakening of that kind of town, point, town hall 2.0 is what we call it. And so creating these kind of like di these flex diverse spaces where people can have birthday parties and celebrations and anniversaries, but also work. Instead of getting in a car and going off to work or working at home, what if they just walked down the street or got in a car and drove five minutes, you know? So it's an interesting question about parking too, because if, if, we, if, if what we do works, we will also be serving people within that quarter mile radius and people who live actually within a mile or two who might take their bike to work or might want to come you know <coughs> actually walk to work um so i don't i don't know i don't know that that can be calculated in any way but it is an interesting thing so so the, the sort of main street the tarpon ave the whole the whole feel the whole vibe of it is perfect and the building itself i think expresses something in who we are to find buildings that are maybe like need a little love or need a little attention and, and need a capital injection to make them beautiful again, to bring them back, to honor the history. Uh, that's, that's part of who we are. So that, I mean, could there be a better spot than Tarpon Avenue? I mean, it's perfect in that sense. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't have any questions. Go ahead, Commissioner Eisner. Do you have a preliminary list, anybody that's requested um, to possibly rent from you as of yet? I know it's still early, but do you have a preliminary list, and if so, how many? Yeah, we have. We there's massive interest already in Tarpon. In fact, unfortunately, because of the delays, we're 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 sort of being cautious about uh, making promises and so on. But I actually, have about five private offices already reserved or deposits down. So there's yeah, it's pe people are excited. That's our that's our sense so far. Would they be people from this town or outside the town? 100%, no, just Tarpon Springs people. They're okay. hearing about it, there's, there's a, I, I assume there's a little buzz or what's going on over there, what's going in there. Um, there's a warmth to the community and a, a sort of sense of welcome, at least that we've felt so far. The local businesses feel excited. I mean, aside from the pressurizing of parking, which I think, I think we all have to try to, to solve or ameliorate in some way, but the idea of like bringing fresh business and serving small businesses on Tarpon Avenue, but bringing in people that are working at home and so on to come and shop and, you know, eat and live, you know, their life and spend their money, I guess, on Tarpon Avenue. Probably is good for everybody, maybe. Lifts, that lifts everybody a little bit. Um, and of course, there's a, again, there's a nonprofit edge to us, certainly to me and my career, and what we wanna do really is scholarship as many like people doing good in the community as well to give co-working away as much as possible and you know we're business we, we want to make money we will make money but um but we also have this this other piece this sort of social roi i talked about and i'm going to tell you i'm i'm 30 years in the nonprofit world i just don't know anybody that does it better than these guys in terms of like you know a marketable working business 
that is on a cutting edge of a social technology of how we work and serving people in a new way that they work, but then also loving nonprofits, supporting people with cool social enterprise ideas, helping you know the, the sort of faith-based community all at the same time is pretty great. Okay, anything else? Okay. Um, we're done with you for the moment, Mr. Sanders. <laughs> Mr. You. Watkins, um, I want to ask um, whether any commissioners had any questions for Mr. Watkins. He's a principal in this project. Do you have any questions for him, Vice Mayor Lund? Uh, not at this time, thanks. Commissioner Carr? Yeah, I was just curious, uh, more of a curiosity, is it your other co-hatches, are they restaurants and office space, or is it mostly office space, or is it a combination of both of them? We have <clears throat> currently 21 locations open in Ohio, Indiana. Uh, we open in two weeks. Our first site in Pennsylvania, which is in Pittsburgh, uh, and we have one open in Florida so far in Lakeland, and we have, uh, in addition to Tarpon Springs and Lakeland, two others um, uh, under construction uh, here in the Tampa Bay area. Um, about one third of those locations uh, have food and beverage operations uh, in them or will have food and beverage when they open. Uh, primarily, our, our spaces are uh, 10 to 18,000 square feet uh, and about one third private offices, uh, one third meeting uh, and event spaces, uh, and one third uh, common areas. Uh, and co-working. Uh, and that's in the areas that we don't have food and beverage. Uh, when we have food and beverage, we usually limit the space to about 25 to 30 uh, percent. And as, as was discussed earlier, uh, typically the office hours are 8 to 5, Monday through Friday, uh, peak hours. Uh, and then with the uh, food and beverage operations, that tends to be evenings and weekends. So there's, there's this very nice activation of the space uh, and spreading out that demand. Uh, for parking and other services uh, over that entire period. And, and we're generating, we're activating the community basically from 8, 8, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., seven days a week, uh, and, and bringing more commerce and more activity uh, to communities uh, like this. Sure. Thanks. Commissioner Kulias. Yes, sir. I wanted to follow up. What is going to be your, your monthly range and, and rent for these private rooms? And you said the common areas. You, you would have to be a member to be able to come into the common areas, and um, are you able to rent private rooms for an hour or two? I mean, just trying to understand the overall sure. business aspect and exchange. Sure, so um, 13,000 square feet, um, I think 3,500 uh, for the restaurant, Luke, and uh, 30 offices. So um, our offices, uh, we have one, two, three, and four person offices. Uh, we don't call, um, people tenants, they, we call them members. Uh, and so our members um, typically are ultra small, small and medium sized businesses, um, mostly in professional services, uh, lawyers, accountants, um, digital marketing firms, uh, private wealth investment, the, these uh, types of companies. Uh, the one person offices, again, it depends on where, do you have a window in your office or not, um, you know, is it, in a good location or not, but that range is going to be with all these factors between five and seven hundred uh, per month uh, for a single person office, and then you can add you know four to six hundred dollars for every person in a private office, um, and so uh, you know we typically sell about one third of our offices will be one person offices, and and, and goes on from there. Uh, for the co-working memberships, which means you can walk into one of our uh, locations and sit at a desk, but you don't have a private office. And those memberships start at $99, uh, and they go up to $269, and you get more meeting room hours uh, and more benefits, you know, with the, we call a social membership, a part-time and a, a full-time membership. Uh, and so those tend to be month to month. Uh, and, you know, we, we see all kinds of people, you know, um, you know, grandparents to, you know, teenagers um, using uh, the co-working space. Uh, people can come in, they can, you know, buy a day pass, uh, they can, you know, um, people can bring their guests in, 
Um, if you're not a member, if you want to use one of our meeting rooms or the event spaces, uh, we have an hourly rate uh, for members uh, and a slightly higher rate for non-members. So uh, our desire and our business model is, is to be a Town Hall 2.0, to be a community center. We want the community to use our space uh, uh, to you know, continue the great stuff that's already going on in, in communities, and we want to be additive to what's already going on. And that's why we, as Brian was mentioning, we give away um, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars every year in what we call scholarships to nonprofits to come in and use our spaces for free. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Commissioner Eisner, I didn't ask you, do you have anything? <clears throat> I, one of the questions I think you half answered in any which way, so you do allow transient business to by the hour. Okay, that was, okay. thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Watkins, I'm, you've got your architect here and who else did you have with you? Our general contractor and our program manager. Okay, let me ask the commission, do you have any questions for either the architect or the general contractor? I'd like to ask. Commissioner Kulias. Sure. Uh, if approved tonight, how long would construction on this project take from start to finish? Do you have an idea, guesstimate? Commissioner Card. I was going to say, do you, can you just reiterate what he said so it's in the microphone for the record? Yeah. 10 months, construction schedule. Okay. Um, I kind of jumped a little bit. Do you do either your architects or your contractor have a presentation that you want them to I make? have a presentation. Okay, I, please go ahead and uh, do that. Okay. Um, there seems to be some latency here at the I believe you all have this uh, in your packets. Uh, so, I, um, if you don't mind, thank you. And this is our project team. Uh, um, I, I won't go into all of this. Uh, I will uh, point out that Noel Cruz uh, is a local uh, restaurateur. He has uh, six different restaurant concepts uh, throughout the Bay Area, uh, including uh, one of his restaurants that uh, just last year received a Michelin star. Um, he will be uh, the operator of the restaurant called uh, Made Whole, which will be a Mediterranean concept restaurant. Uh, Noel is uh, mid 40s, uh, outstanding uh, operator, uh, very well recognized uh, chef, uh, owner, uh, manager, uh, very hands on. Uh, we're delighted to have uh, him uh, involved in the project. And next slide, please. Yeah, next slide. So as Brian mentioned, um, you know, our kind of our tagline is work, meet, live. Um, our mission is to strengthen communities, improve lives, and equip, equip people to be greater, be a, a greater uh, family member, a, a greater philanthropist, a greater business person, uh, a greater entrepreneur. Uh, and really, we, as we go into each community, each side is you know, how can we um, help uh, at the individual lo level, at the family level, and the community level, uh, really uh, uplift everybody by people using the resources that we bring uh, and the, what we call engineering collision. How, how do we bring the for-profit and the nonprofit world together? How do we bring rich and poor? How do we bring people from different ethnicities, different age groups? How do we bring them together uh, in this engineering of collision? Uh, to uplift everybody. And so we take that very seriously. We're, we're very purpose-driven, uh, and it, it's reflected in, in our design, uh, in our programming, and who we hire. Um, I think Brian's a great example, uh, you know, joining our team and being a partner with us in the business. Um, and so you know, a lot of people, you know, their, their mission statement and their values is something, is a poster on the wall, but we, we live it, breathe it uh, every single day. Uh, it's... Uh, it's, it's why we get out of bed, it's our why. Um, you know, as part of that, uh, things that we do, um, if you're a Cohatch member, you get free life events. Um, if, if you're celebrating uh, major anniversaries, your, your birthday, um, a, a wedding reception, um, we give you use of our event facilities for free. 
um, uh, just as a way to demonstrate what we're doing. Um, as, as Brian said, we, we scholarship, um, three types of scholarships that we have. Uh, give scholars, which is to nonprofits. Uh, boost scholarships is to entrepreneurs and startups. Uh, and civic scholarships are to uh, local chambers of commerce, police department, fire department, uh, other uh, civic associations that uh, can uh, need space and want to use our space as either a primary space or an alternative space. We want to bring people in, um, you know, again, for that Town Hall 2.0 uh, community center. Uh, and so, um, you know, since we started six years ago, we've given away uh, over 1.6 million in total scholarships to those, uh, to nonprofits, uh, startups, and entrepreneurs, uh, and to <coughs> municipal uh, entities that are permitted to accept those. And again, uh, something that we take very seriously. We, uh, of that 1.6 million, it's gone to uh, four, over 470 uh, individuals or groups. Um, partners that we have down here in Florida, uh, we're very much partnership based. Uh, we know we can't do it ourselves, and so these are uh, some examples uh, of groups that we're working with uh, in the greater Tampa Bay area, uh, including Made Whole, uh, who will be the food and beverage operator that I mentioned earlier. What uh, primarily we do, uh, and the question was asked why Tarpon Springs, um, what we love to do and what we're all about is finding abandoned um, or uh, buildings that just have been neglected uh, and uh, acquiring those buildings, stripping away you know, all of the things that have been done to them over the last several decades, uh, stripping it back to the original intent, original design, original materials, and really let uh, the, the original architect, architecture and the materials speak for themselves. And then we add some cool design, uh, modern amenities uh, uh, to that to make it a, a comfortable, relevant, uh, fun uh, work environment. Uh, and then um, the same thing we do is we do a, a ton of research into each building that we go in, and then we tell the story uh, of, the, of the building, the previous owners, um, and we, we do that in, in the, the names of the rooms that we have or, um, you know, the mur murals that we put uh, on, the, on the interior and exterior walls in and, and different ways. Uh, this is an example in, in Springfield, Ohio, uh, where it was the old market 100 years ago and went into decades of um, uh, uh, neglect, uh, deferred maintenance, uh, was abandoned uh, for, I don't know, 10, 15 years, a uh, city came to us, sold it to us for a dollar. Uh, uh, we put uh, two and a half million dollars into it, put uh, five food operators in there. And it's taken a, a downtown that was dead and has catalyzed um, this growth. And the entire city now um, is experiencing a renaissance. Uh, and the, the Cohatch piece was not alone in it, but it was catalytic um, to um, seeing new life come to this old rust town downtown. So these are just some examples. I, for the sake of time, I won't go uh, into a bunch of details. This was an old uh, hardware store when we got it. Um, uh, previous to that, it had been the um, town hall and theater in Worthington, Ohio. This is actually where we started. Go to the next slide, Renee. Um, this was an old bank building, then turned into a radio station, and then to a, an office building uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, uh, suburb of Cincinnati, Ohio. Very similar uh, type of situation as uh, what we have here in Tarpon Springs, uh, right you know, on the main street. Uh, and again, we just brought cool design, uh, modern amenities, uh, and th this, this one was sold out on the day that we opened, as about half of the ones that we have. Uh, this is in Lakeland. We just opened this uh, two weeks ago, um, and uh, right on the town square uh, and, in Lakeland. Had a great welcome uh, from the mayor, uh, from the Chamber of Commerce, Puerto Rican Chamber of Commerce, uh, and the nonprofits that were uh, also supporting down there. Um, and it's if you're ever in Lakeland and want to see what a Coa Hatch is, it's it's our first open location here in Florida. Uh, this uh, the the one in Lakeland was a was an office building uh, before we got it, and we just um, upgraded it. Um, St. Petersburg um, is an old hotel um, uh, on Central, and um, this one will be finished in April. And um, 
it just um, super neat old building, uh, historic building. Uh, again, uh, nobody could find a use for it, uh, and we've been able to uh, uh, both have a, a restaurant uh, and uh, office similar to what we're doing here in Tarpon Springs. Uh, West Tampa, right on Main Street in, in West Tampa, in an area that's a pretty rough area. Um, it's, um, this is one where we're really putting our money where our mouth is and really working hard with the community. We were just at a CRE meeting in West Tampa before coming here uh, and working with the community uh, and how we can uplift uh, the community with our investment. Uh, we inherited a four-generation African-American uh, barbecue restaurant. Uh, we're building them a whole new restaurant and kitchen, um, uh, and, you know, with very favorable terms, uh, keeping them uh, in business and in that location, uh, and they couldn't be more delighted uh, with, you know, what we're doing to support their business. Uh, the previous, well, the owner of this business uh, didn't want to sell, a um, uh, 75-year-old African-American uh, businessman. Uh, he's now our partner in this, uh, his equity. Uh, became his carry in, in the business, and so we are now p uh, partners with Bernard uh, in this property. Um, still, really rough area, uh, um, but you know we're committed to uplifting the whole area. So, just uh, real quick about Tarpon Springs. As you can see, we've got four. Um, this will be the fourth one uh, to start construction, assuming we get approval. Uh, we're ready to start next week on construction. Again, subject to approval. Um, uh, our intent uh, over time would be to build 12 to 15 uh, of these um, in the greater Tampa Bay area. Yeah, just some history about this building. You, you probably all know this more than me. I, again, I won't spend any, uh, too much time on this, uh, but we, we did a lot of history, uh, went through all the archives, uh, and really trying to understand both the town uh, and the history of the building, and then you'll see it reflected in, in some of the uh, renderings <coughs> that we have here. So um, again, uh, things that you'll see in this space is the patio, event spaces, um, and you can read it up there. Uh, these are all things that we want to make it comfortable for. Um, we like to say that Cohatch is an extension of your home. So if you've got a, a, a business meeting or a board meeting, uh, and you've got the kids that day, uh, your kids have a, something to do, and they're not just gonna sit in a corner and play on their phones. We, we put arcade games in there, um, we put uh, shuffleboard, we uh, do all kinds of things to you know, welcome people and, into our locations. We have you know, the free coffee, tea, beer, and wine um, you know, during office hours for people, and really want to make it uh, a warm and inviting location uh, that is an extension uh, of, of your home. Uh, the site plan, as uh, Renee uh, talked about earlier, I won't spend any time on this. Um, one of the things that we try to do that has been referenced is, is this flex space. And so we, we, the restaurant and Cohatch uh, are sharing the same space. And so Monday through Friday during office hours, our coworkers will be in the restaurant space. Um, and so, um, we get more intensity of use of that same space. And then evenings and weekends, uh, the restaurant uses it. And so it's part of the reason that our business model's uh, successful is because we get more uh, uh, use of the same square footage than a typical office or restaurant would get just because the space is activated. More of the space is activated more, dur more times during the week than typical single use uh, types of things. So there, there's a lot of creativity, there's a lot of thought that goes in, uh, how do you do this in a, a way that's convenient, that um, doesn't impact uh, either the businesses, that is comfortable, um, whether it's the restaurant patron or our members. Um, and so we, we spend months uh, going through our design process and figuring out what is the best way, which is what we did here. Uh, and you see um, the left <coughs> in yellow, which is the the patio, kitchen, uh, and uh, dedicated seating for the restaurant, and then shared spaces between the restaurant and Cohatch. And then uh, the second floor, again, um, mostly private offices and meeting rooms. Uh, it's more of a uh, pure office environment uh, with uh, co-working as well on the, those white blocks in the middle. 
Uh, I don't know how many of you were in this building um, after the previous uh, owner uh, abandoned it, but you know, it was in pretty rough shape. Uh, and, and we're gonna put um, close to three and a half million dollars uh, into this project on top of the um, close to 900,000 acquisition price that we had in this. I think you know, we're gonna uplift uh, certainly the, the back part of this building and you know, what we intend to do uh, on the front uh, of the facade um, cer cer certainly, the historical re review committee was was pleased with uh, what we proposed. So this is what we intend to do: um, uh, retain uh, all of the original architecture and the original flavor. Um, you know, add a, a few modern touches uh, to it, uh, and and really activate uh, that street um, for the for the entire week. Uh, this would be what you would see when you would walk in. Uh, again, inviting, um, kind of a coffee shop feel, um, welcoming someone into your kitchen to have a cup of coffee, to have a beer, uh, whatever it is. Um, th this is you know, what we um, are planning for the uh, entry area. This is just an example of meeting rooms. We have meeting rooms anywhere from four people to 12 people um, in, in our locations. Uh, and we'll have something similar here with the tarpon site, um, conferencing facilities, um, all the modern amenities that you would need uh, in an office. Uh, this is co-working space uh, for people that either don't want or can't afford uh, a private office. Again, just uh, nods to uh, whether it's the building itself or to the community. Uh, we, we try to not be overly direct, uh, but have you know certain artistic uh, nods uh, to what we're doing a lot. We we have uh, three designers, uh, graphic designers uh, that work on each project, uh, and and really studying the history of the community uh, of the building, uh, and then uh, coming up with art um, that we think would be um, you know uh, appealing uh, to uh, our members in each location. So this is um, a rendering of how we uh, plan to do the event space. So you know, uh, furniture that can be moved around, it's flexible. Um, so again, you could do board meetings here, birthday parties, uh, your book club, um, you know, uh, uh, whatever it is. Um, and so we, we try to create it where um, you can actually overflow into other areas. Um, if you needed more space. Um, we don't want to create one big, huge space. It's only used 5% of the time, so we create smaller spaces, but that um, can be linked together uh, to create something for bigger events uh, if necessary. Uh, again, this is a, what, uh, a different view and with a made whole highlighted in this rendering. Again, uh, Mediterranean concept um, from a proven operator, um, Michelin star uh, for his ramen restaurant. Uh, where, where's the ramen restaurant, Brian? Just is it? Uh, Florida. And, uh, yeah, Ichikoro. and Ichikoro. So um, uh, just really delighted to have Noel, uh, a Tampa native, worked in New York uh, for about 10 years before returning to the area. Um, again, rendering of the bar. And then this is the uh, back patio uh, that we talked about earlier uh, with, the, uh, with the second floor kind of covering over it and then with an awning um, to provide the sun cover. The timeline based on what we presented. Um, uh, this is probably out of date, yeah. Yeah, I don't think we need to go over that, yeah. So, that's just a quick overview. I, I could talk for hours, but I know you don't have hours. <laughs> so. No, <laughs> but thank you. You're welcome. Um, let me, uh, again, check with the commission. Do you have any questions for Mr. I do. Could you, um, could you address my previous occupancy question at all? What's yeah, so, the max uh, op occupancy of the building that you're going for? Yeah, so um, 30 private offices, the way we normally calculate it would be approximately two persons per private office because there's one, two, threes, and fours. Uh, and then uh, for a facility this size, our uh, co-working would be around 100 uh, to 120 
uh, co-working members. And what about the restaurant? Uh, what's the seating in the restaurant? You got 40 exterior and 70 interior. And Go ahead and state that. Yeah, we have uh, 40, 70 interior and 40 exterior. That's okay, so yeah. you're talking 130 for the actual co hatch portion of it and another 120 for the restaurant portion? Yeah, approximately. Approximately? Uh, yeah. And I, I think the, um, the thing to remember about co-working is it's sort of like a gym. Not everybody's there at the same time. Uh, and it, it's, people just have different work styles. People are there usually only for the co-workers only for one or two hours. Mm -hmm. So there's never, you know, in the 21 that we have open, there's never a case where 100% of yeah, all the co-workers are there at the I'm same time. I'm just looking at the fire rating for the building. Yeah. So you're not going to exceed 250 people. Yeah, we're, we're going to we'll, stick with questions. Questions? Yes. No, was that it? That was it for me. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Watkins? Yeah. I'd Mr. Like, Kulias. Sure. Uh, as I touched up before, and maybe one of the uh, general contractor could come up, uh, the integrity of the facades of some of these, in, you know, historic buildings. I see the back end of the building has a, a very modern, sleek look. Is there any way to incorporate some of that um, unique facade features on the front end, on that exterior of the building, on the back? Uh, it's possible. Um, it's you know very late in the process. Um, you know, if we did that, it would probably delay us yet again another six months. Six months. Okay. By the time we uh, redesigned it, did the architectural drawings, you know, went through the HRC review process. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> okay. Um, what we're going to, Commissioner Eisner. <laughs> Go ahead. Quick question. Sorry. Um, did you consider at all how you would handle, be, since um, the back of the building has only a 10-foot uh, access and the front is Tarpon Avenue, uh, how you would handle deliveries? It's through the back. So you would have trucks delivering through the, tr through the back? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Lou Keen, uh, I live at 701 North Ever Street in Plant City, Florida. Uh, I think uh, we talked with sanitation uh, and the city uh, extensively about deliveries for the back of the building. I think um, the existing buildings or existing takes deliveries or truck them in, they pull them in. I think what's the one on the north side of the building, uh, they pull that in and do a truck it in and trolley it in or pull off the front and tarpon. But um, I think I don't, Noel could speak to deliveries on that if you want to reach out later. But I think that um, they're they're intending to be either small truck delivered off the alley or dropped off the adjacent street and trucked in or and trolleyed in. I just don't know. <coughs> excuse me. What adjacent street we're referring to? Because I would just thought you have a cool site plan on, if you don't mind. Thank you. Hibiscus maybe the like the little word the alley which which the alley goes north and, or goes in between. Yeah, right? the alley's hibiscus to Safford. So hibiscus. I'm not even sure how you can get a big truck down hibiscus. I'm not sure the truck size is required for delivery. So this is this is Safford. This is where the bike trail is, mm. um, and then this is this Hibiscus. So you know, I, I'm not sure if you're saying parking on Hibiscus, parking on Safford, and trucking in, um, or offloading through, you know, through the, like the city parking lots. I'm not I'm not sure how you're. I'm sure they will be more than willing to open discussion about where you guys would be appropriate for deliveries. Yeah. I don't think we're not we're not yeah. set for, on deliveries yeah. for anything, to my knowledge. Um, what about these meeting rooms? How many, uh, I know I heard a, a, a large configuration of small meeting rooms, we could make it larger. What is the largest um, amount in 
that you can handle in a meeting room? Upstairs there are 12. There, there are four meeting rooms total in the building. The three upstairs can handle 12 individuals. The shared meeting room downstairs, I think, is somewhere in the 30s. I'll have to look at occupancy uh, for the life safety. So you're referring to the largest amount in one location would be 30? That would be downstairs with the shared in the restaurant, yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, what we're going to do now, Ms. Vincent, do you have any cross-examination for the applicant? No, sir. You do not. Okay, let's go through each of the app, uh, affected parties. Mr. Ms. Terrapani, do you have any questions for the applicants? Okay. Mr. Wolf. Actually, just a, a couple of quick questions, and mine is more about the deliveries, not necessarily daily. Trucks come in early, they deliver early. Restaurants all around us get that, have that happen. During construction, during the 10 months, I mean, like electricians, plumbers, and so I guess my question is to the general contractor, I think more specifically, typically those vans and those trucks or whatever will be there for all day. So I'm just trying to understand, are they going to be, I mean, the, I'm, I'm down the street a little bit, but, you know, where are they going to be parking, deliveries of materials throughout the day? I mean, the city starts really bustling around 10 a.m. And then, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm, if, if anybody on this board knows, I am 100% pro-business and anything that grows in this. So this is not, I just want to best understand the impact over the next 10 months because Tarpon Ave has such few uh, parking spaces. I think that's my biggest thing that I have uh, concerns with uh, in general, so. Would you like to answer that? If you can state your name and address for the record. Uh, my name is Darren Thompson, 30997 Crocodile Lane, San Antonio, Florida. Um, as far as where, how we're anticipating the staging and everything, I mean, most of the materials are gonna be all within the confines of the red square that's there. Obviously, with the uh, subcontractors and the amount of people that we're going to be having, uh, as you say, it starts around 10 o'clock is mostly when <clears throat> when uh, the city starts, I guess, coming more awake, you'd say. Um, but we would anticipate them using more of the street parking um, and leaving the areas in the back for uh, the city, like the city parking in the back. I wish I could point. But the, the parking behind and on the side, that would be more for the patrons and the people of the area. So that would be the intent as to what we're doing and what we're going to encourage our people to. Um, and then the, obviously the front on Tarpon Avenue, we really would uh, keep them from parking in the front and any of the storefronts in that area. <laughs> so that's, what, that's how we anticipated and looking at it. Okay, thank you. Mr. Wolf, do you have any other questions? Parking that's on Carpen Ave, and it, you know, almost like any plumber, if everybody, but anybody's ever seen a plumber's van, there's okay. that's their entire work. Well, what we're going to do is when the applicant gets through with their presentation, you'll be able to get up there and state your concerns, but right now it's just for questions. Gotcha. So, okay, again, my, my question so, what are the construction hours? How about that? I mean, what? seven, seven, seven to three thirty is our standard construction hours, okay, Monday Thank through you. Friday. Okay. Uh, Mr. Fackless, do you have any questions? Sir, I have any questions. Thank you. Ms. Fossey? Right now, no. Okay. Okay. So what we're going to do now is go to the um, affected parties. Um, Mr. Ms. Terrapani, would you like to make a presentation? Okay. Um, Mr. Hang on, Mr. Wolf, would you like to make a presentation? Would you like to state your comments, concerns, not necessarily in the form of? I mean, for, formally state them, yes, I'm sorry. Just, just concerns over just the, the, the fact that Tarpon Ave is like if, if by code, I mean, again, I'm pro business here. We're five minutes away. I mean, maybe we utilize that free space that's between the Acropolis, you know, the open areas, that's where they stage their, their trucks and go across the street, try to find a compromise. I definitely believe that the recommendations from the Zoning and uh, Planning Commission that the city should and needs to find more parking, yeah. I think ought to be one of the, the objectives that 
is on the priority list. I mean, this is a prime example of that. But uh, effectively, just try to mitigate the effect on the businesses because we're, believe me, we're a great community and we'll be there to support you, but we need to make sure that we're not impacted along the way during those hours. So that'd be okay. my, yes, second. sir. Mr. Salzman, we ask questions. Yes. Of, okay. Um, what we're gonna do is uh, the commission gets a chance to ask any questions of you for clarification sure. or anything else. That's so right. does anybody have a question for Mr. Wolf? Commissioner Carr, okay. Commissioner Kulias, Commissioner Eisen. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fackless. Good evening. Um, I'm Vasily Fackless, um, and we own 135 and 139 East Tarpon Avenue. Uh, I share a common wall with this building. Um, we welcome Cohatch and new businesses, as the previous gentleman said, I am pro-business, to our great and unique community where we live, work, and play. Um, I want economic vibrancy in a busy downtown. At the planning and zoning meeting, I spoke in favor of this business model, and I'm not against the model, um, but after really studying this project, there's some serious incompatibilities for existing businesses with the project as is. This building is being more than doubled and density is being increased greatly with office employees and clients that could potentially be parked all day, all without additional parking requirements. I get it, some people are there for an hour or two, whatever, but most people in an office, they're gonna pay that kind of money. I would think they're gonna be there and they could be there. Um, we presently have a parking problem downtown, um, especially for service-oriented businesses that need to have plenty of close available parking spaces. A five-minute walking distance, which is used as a gauge for parking availability, which is a quarter mile for healthy average walkers, does not work for service-oriented businesses. <coughs> in medical businesses that see the elderly, the injured, people having to meet an appointment time, and quick drop-offs and pickups. For example, going to the meat market, shoe repair, an appointment with me and my orthotic clinic, coffee shops, hairstylists, um, quick retail, in and out. There are only approximately 15 on-street parking spaces in front of this, these buildings right here. Also, even though the site plan on tonight's agenda may not require mailed notices per the code, in my opinion, I think that this policy needs to be changed and people directly affected should have been duly notified about, about this and, and, and upcoming issues. Um, as a historical note and information for the record, thank God for the foresight of men like Buddy Terrapani, Phil McCabe, my father George, and Uncle Michael Fackless, or we would not have the city parking lot on the corner of Pinellas and Tarpon Avenue. In the mid-60s, with their own funds, they purchased the property, built the parking lot, and sold it back to the city for a dollar. And we were told then that we didn't have, an, that there was enough parking. Um, also, our generation and, and, uh, and other generations have championed the parking issue over the past 30 years and encouraged the city to put more parking lots downtown that have been paid for through our CRA tax funds. Since this time, a lot of new businesses, including several restaurants, have moved in. This is great. We're all for this, but there are no additional part. There have been no additional parking requirements for these businesses, and we are back in the same place we were years ago, if not worse. Truly, we need a closed parking garage, more angled parking, and a parking plan that seriously takes into consideration what the property and business owners, and most importantly the end users, the customers actually need. I know these studies are serious studies, that's great, but our customers on a daily basis are t tell us we can't come there because we can't find a parking space. And I'll, I'll wrap this up in a second. I'm also concerned about water runoff. Uh, when it rains, there's a lot of water that comes off of these buildings into the alley, like fire hydrants. Also for the restaurant, that is, that's, I don't know if, if the dumpster is gonna be right back there or they're gonna use the dumpster by Tarpon Avenue because originally I was understanding that they're gonna be taking the, the trash to the dumpster. That's fine if it's done properly, but I've seen restaurants drag 
um, drag uh, garbage on the, um, in the alley there, and we've had an increased rodent situation. I don't want that to come back. Um, the back alley is a usable alley. Yes, it's tight, but especially for smaller truck deliveries, it's harder for larger trucks. But it, my concern there is that we need to make sure that this remains fully accessible. Um, because I hear these talk about making a pedestrian alley, that's fine, but my business requires trucks to be able to come in, and they're mostly smaller trucks, but to, to make these deliveries. Um, if some things are greatly modified, building size, density, additional parking, various logistics, maybe this could work, but as I feel right now that this existing, that existing businesses, especially service-oriented businesses, will be negatively affected, so. And like I said, I'm very pro-business, and I want, you know, I want us to succeed, but I don't want the existing businesses to be negatively affected, especially the service-oriented businesses that need quick available parking. Five minutes, that's a long walk, especially for older people. Uh, hang on, Mr. Fackness. Does, does any of the commissioners have any questions for Mr. Fackness? Go ahead, Commissioner Kudiyas. Mr. Fackless, with, with some of the affected parties, we understand you know, your, your businesses, the parking comes off of Tarpon Avenue. Uh, the biggest concern you have is, in fact, parking for your everyday services that you guys provide. Uh, and you, you stress that the, the, the city has uh, at times tried, but we've fallen off in finding additional parking and, you know, uh, turning certain roads into angle parking, which uh, seems to be a slow process. Uh, you think the additional parking is the main all solution to compromising between the situation and helping businesses such as yourself who have been there for a long time? That's probably the largest one, yes. Um, but I am concerned, you know, is, and it does go back to parking, is if, if you have all these people in this increased density in this building, you know, they're gonna be taking up parking that we don't already have. So that's probably my largest concern. Yes, yes, I want the building to be fixed and, and uh, you know, um, and it, yes, it's in disrepair. Um, I've had to deal with that. I've had to deal with homeless people living in there. I've had to deal with um, rodents because it wasn't properly taken care of. Um, we've had to deal with a lot of those things, but um, we just, you know, obviously want to want to be good neighbors. We want to live and work together. That is a major concern: is parking um, because we don't have it. And then, as Mr. Terrapani brought up, I don't know what the the, the uh, vacant lot, the old Forbes piece, if that is, if the city is still planning on selling that to develop it that's then what happens to parking so that that needs to be factored in okay and uh, when this building was and it's really half the size of what the proposed application is now um, when it was a nightclub slash bar it, under, the hours did in fact were different so it wasn't too much of a parking issue for your business correct thank you sir so I got a quick question. Go ahead, Commissioner uh, Did I understand it correctly that you and other business owners feel that it's appropriate and that it's a need that the city need to build a parking garage somewhere in the downtown area? In my opinion, yes. I think we need we need more angled parking because people don't parallel park well anymore. Um, and then when when the streetscape was done. Um, we fought that with with the the state and the city, and they said it would all be fine. But those bulb outs take up parking. People don't wait for you to to park in a in a um, in a parallel parking spot. So so yes, I think we need a we need a parking garage. We need a um, comprehensive parking plan. Um, we need you know, um, whether it's a phone app or something that tells people where I can find a parking space. Um, we need all those things, but, uh, but uh, absolutely, I feel we need to have a parking garage. 25 years ago, I brought this up and I was laughed out of City Hall, said we don't need it. Well, <laughs> guess what? We're back here again and things are getting more expensive 
and more businesses are coming here, which is what we want. But yes. And how long has your family had their business in downtown Tarpon? Since 1912. Thanks. Mayor. Yeah. I have a question. One Hang on. Let Commissioner Carr finish. I've got no further questions. Commissioner Eisner. I need to bring up a little bit of a sore subject. Uh, so, In the form um, of a question. Yeah, I'll form it into a question. Um, I agree with you with the parking. And we had another situation that I put out a questionnaire to all of the CRA people. And uh, so my question would just be, why, why didn't I get enough answers? I have answers, but <clears throat> I would like your answer to it. Because in there, I have, we're going to lose three, maybe four spaces um, on another project, which I don't want to get into right now. But um, I would like to see the CRA funds being utilized for a parking garage uh, rather than projects that pertain to a few people. Are you able to answer that email and agree that that is something that you'd like to do? Yeah, I apologize. I haven't answered your email. I've just been very behind sure. uh, with work. Um, we're very busy. We're growing. We're short on help. So you want me to answer your question now? or No, no. I, I just, I'm still ongoing. Um, I have, believe it or not, more yeses than noes. Um, I'm going to continue to pursue. I don't feel comfortable spending other people's money. I feel that the people that contributed the money should, like yourself, make the decision. I'm in agreement with you. We need more parking. But we can't get it if we're not going to, if we're going to take away parking for um, things that are not as important as the parking. So, yeah, I mean, whatever, you know, we need a lot more parking. Um, so, and, and I'm, I'm more, f I'm for whatever brings more people, whether it's more businesses or uh, enhancing our um, historic buildings and museums and, and whatever can bring more people down there. You know, I'm not afraid of competition. I'm not afraid, I'm, I'm, I, I want my neighbors to succeed. If they succeed and I work hard, then I succeed. Uh, but it just has to work. Um, the logistics of everything has, has to work. Well, I, you have my commitment. I will be walking Tarpon Avenue and continue to go after every single person that has not answered um, because those are the people that it's their money. So I, I know. <laughs> are, are you done? <laughs> Thank you. I have nothing okay. else to say. Mr. Fackless, the, the one thing I had a conversation with the city manager, and I fully recognize the issue with uh, parking near locations, elderly people, handicapped is fine, but it doesn't address elderly who may not be handicapped. Um, how do you feel about time parking? In other words, no longer than one hour for a certain number of parking spaces on Tarpon Avenue. That's a good question. Um, I know we had it and they didn't, people didn't like it and we got rid of it. Um, I don't know, maybe it needs to be addressed again. Um, why, why didn't people like it? I don't know. I, I know that um, you're talking about just time or you're talking about meters? No, no, no meters. Just an inf where they're actually enforced by our police department. Uh, I think people had said, and, and I, maybe John can address that question better than I, than I do because I, I just remember that was an issue. Um, I don't quite remember the answer uh, John can address that better but I do think I don't know if people felt they were being I'm gonna let John answer that question <laughs> I just remember that I don't remember why okay thank you um, that that's all I had uh, you answered I had other questions but you answered them in the discussion with the other people um, Ms. Tierpandy, did you want to make a presentation or go ahead? Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. I'm Cindy Tierpandy. You all probably know my husband and I own two buildings directly across the street from the proposed co-hatch, the Tierpandy's department store and the Ambion Salon where um, Thelma Lita has her business. 
I also represent the owners of 151 East Tarpon Avenue where the Two Frogs is. That's the ALT WT2. And I have their permission to speak on their behalf on these comments as well. As many of you probably know, the Terrapani family has been operating, um, and owned and operated the Terrapani department store for 107 years, I believe, 108 years. But we do like to see new businesses. We think that's important to the health of the city and to our economic growth. John and I especially like to see historic buildings being renovated, so we're very happy to see that part of it. However, new businesses must meet the city's code and thus not negatively impact other businesses or the downtown as a whole. They need to make a positive contribution to the downtown. Unfortunately, this is not the case with the proposed cohatch as it is proposed right now. The proposed use of the office space, the restaurant, the meeting and event space as they described tonight, I think is a good idea. I think it will be an interesting concept. I think it will be uh, embraced by the city, but at a smaller scale so that on-site parking can be provided and I believe there's a way to do that. There's a couple of reasons why on-site parking should be provided. Number one, it's a code requirement. There's at least three different sections of the code that allow partial parking reduction for historic buildings and if that historic building only adds on up to 25 percent more as we've heard tonight this building is adding on 51 percent of its existing building it's 6400 square feet today they're adding 6750 square feet so that's a 51 percent increase these provisions further state that if the addition to the historic building is 25 percent or more of the building then you have to provide parking that's in conflict with what the staff has told you, that the smart code allows you to totally waive the parking. I don't think that's true. The statutory cons construction when you have different code provisions that are in conflict is that the more specific and the more restrictive applies. You can ask your attorney to see if I'm correct. And I believe if you apply that, that you have to require parking for on-site for the new part of the building. I think allowing the historic buildings to have a waiver, they shouldn't have to add parking every time they change use. But in addition to a building of this size, the 51% should have to do the parking. But just from a practical point of view, and y'all have already realized this, how are they gonna get deliveries? They're not gonna be able to park on Hibiscus and wheel it in. They can't park on Tarpon Avenue and wheel it in. The beer truck can't just stop there and stop traffic. They can't park on Safford and wheel it in. They can't park in the city parking lot. I guess they theoretically could park in the city's parking lot on Orange, but that's a heck of a long way to be rolling in the beer and the food deliveries, uh, in my opinion. Not only that, they need to have some limited amount of parking on their site for their employees so that those employees can know they have a legitimate place to park, an easy place to park, especially if they're leaving late at night. The alley to the north of the, of the building that we've been talking about serves um, <clears throat> multiple properties that are front on Tarpon and other properties that front on Orange. Many of these that along that alley use that alley and many of them have on-site parking. For example, Two Frogs has parking available there because they have residential on the second floor. Additionally, Mr. Fackless has parking um, behind his building. The Banther property that fronts on Orange has parking and an access off of um, the alley. The old tea house, when it is um, completed, will have an access off the alley as well for deliveries. So this addition, in my opinion, needs to be reduced in size so they could get, you could have a one-way driveway in, four to five spaces on each side of that that could fit in the 50-foot width. They could get five spaces each side. They could probably get 10 or 12 spaces. That would also allow them room for the FedEx truck and the UPS truck to make deliveries and for that beer truck to come in Obviously, they come off hours so they could come in and wouldn't affect other folks. If the project is approved with no onset parking, the result will be an overburden on the existing lot for their employees, an overburden on the existing lot for truck deliveries, as we've just talked about, and an overburden on all the people who are coming to the cohatch. No one will be able to park on site. They'll all have to go dispersed to the existing lots. It's increasing, the, the seems like, based on even your staff's analysis, that we're really at a tipping point on an adequate parking. If nothing else happens in Tarpon Springs, we might be okay, although personally I see that there is a parking problem, especially as been mentioned for folks that are handicapped and need a shorter distance, and for those service businesses, people are coming just for one purpose, just to the salon, for example. So I do think um, short term, there's, there's two th issues I'd like to, you to look at. One is short term on this project, that they be required to reduce the size of the building. 
um, and get fit in some 10, 12, you know, spaces on site to solve that problem. And then long term, I do think we need a, an overall parking analysis. There are parking consultants out there who do this every day, figure out where is there more available surface parking, where is there more available angled parking that could be added, and then ultimately where is the right location for a parking garage. You always have multiple competing interests and priorities for spending your money in the CRA. In fact, you have tonight on your agenda two agenda <coughs> items you haven't discussed yet about two, buying two different parcels at the sponge docks. Is that the priority? Is the parking garage a priority? You have multiple competing interests and it's up to you to evaluate those and make a plan for what's the most important and then work through your plan, priority number one, number two, number three, et cetera. There's pluses and minuses to all of them. I'm sure you'll hear uh, commentary on everybody on how to spend that money, but I do think you really need to consider an immediate problem with this uh, particular project and let them help them solve, be part of the solution for parking instead of creating a problem. And then long term, which is not necessarily their issue, but an overall downtown issue, what is the long term parking solution um, for downtown? I just want to mention one other thing that um, <clears throat> to reference what uh, Mr. Fackless said. Um, I found it absolutely incredible that I found out, which I did not know until yesterday, that unlike every other quasi-judicial case that you hear, a site plan does not require mail notice, does not require a sign. All HPB cases require a notice and a sign, Board of Adjustment cases require a notice and a sign, a rezoning requires a notice and a sign, and the site plan, which can be the most affecting to a property owner, requires neither. So I would strongly encourage you to be transparent about that, to let, be sure and let the public know about these cases so that they are aware of it if it's in their sphere of influence within their noticed area. I would encourage you to add that. In fact, you can add it in the group of amendments you're doing right now. It'll be a one sentence amendment to your code of amendments to require site plans to also give notice. I think that would be an appropriate thing to do for a transparency for the public. Be happy to answer any questions and I thank you for your time listening tonight. Okay, well, are there any questions from Ms. Terrapani? You, Jacob, please. I'm sorry. Do you have any questions for Ms. Terpin? No. Go ahead. How large is the square footage of your location? John, how big are you? Well, we have multiples. The Terp the department store. It's Eight thousand square feet. Is that one or is that the total of them all? That's the Terpin's department store. Is eight thousand square feet. How often is that location open? Um, because of COVID and because of lack of a manager, we're open for special events and we're open by appointment only. I don't ask that for any other reason um, because some of what was explained to us was it's, it's like a flex plan. I'm not saying that they're going to utilize some of your um, parking spots, but they are. That's the way this works there. So um, I'm, just, I'm just asking that question. Mm -hmm. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Carr. Yeah, Mr. Penny, um, you brought up something along the lines of eight to ten parking places available on the piece of property. How did you come up with that? Uh, well, I was not? just, I'm trying to be reasonable and fair um, because I'm, I mean, if they had to provide, let's go back for a second. Um, the size of the building today, which I don't think they should have to provide parking for under the code, would require 19 parking spaces. So that's a, that's a wash. They don't have to do that. The addition at 6,750 square feet <coughs> requires 20 spaces. So I was just trying to get, to be reasonable, to be fair, to allow them some kind of an addition, reduce it, you know, half or so to, and get a space where they, like I said, a one-way drive-in, you can get um, four spaces on each side or five spaces on each side for a total of 10. It just seemed to be a reasonable size parking area without totally, you know, would still allow them, you know, a fairly good addition. Okay. Um, which part of the code are you referencing about the 25% the of the building sure. and adding there's, more? Yeah, there's three sections, actually. Um, well, first of all, in the special area plan, it says, this is section 4.2.6, excuse me, the, of the SMART code, says that the restoration or rehabilitation of an existing building that does not result in a substantial modification should not require the provision of parking or on-site stormwater. So, if it is a substantial modification, which clearly this is because of the size, it would require parking. Then in the 
Maine City Code. Um, this, this has been in there for as long as I can remember, at least 20 years, uh, Park Section 127.05E says that adaptive reuse of a structure listed on the master, his, Florida Master Site File of Historic Structures um, shall only be required to provide parking which can reasonably design to fit on the site and still preserve the site's historic character. Well, it, it can be preserve the historic site's character because they're doing an addition. They're not affecting the front of the building that's historic. It goes on to say additions in excess of 25% of the existing gross floor area, which qualify as historic, again, historic building, um, shall require the provision of parking in accordance with this code. So under 25% addition, you don't have to. Over 25% you do. Then there's a third provision for special districts. This is the same section, 12705. Any change of use or expansion to the following district shall be required to meet the requirements of this article where the additional parking required is in excess of 20% of the total pre-existing requirement. And then it says the central business district and the sponge dock. So you've got this long, long history and intent of the city to give help and an incentive for historic buildings, but whether they're in the downtown or in the sponge docks, but when you do an addition, okay, that's where, if it's a big enough addition, that's where you're gonna have to provide the parking. So that's, those are the pr three provisions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other yeah, commissioner? I, I, I wanna to touch up with Ms. Terrapani. Uh, you talked about doubling the density of that one building. If, uh, uh, and as a property owner downtown, uh, if at some point development's gonna happen, redevelopment, mm -hmm. you know, current buildings, uh, what would be the impact of, you know, several other buildings taking that same precedent that this application is applying for to nearly double the density in Tarpon Avenue? Well, I think that's my concern is that there are other buildings that could add on to the, they have available lot area. Um, for example, uh, the, the salon on uh, Tarpon Avenue and next to um, the Sunshine Supply. Sunshine Supply is one building. Mm -hmm. The salon next to it is another building. Um, Two Frogs building could be added onto on the north side of Tarpon Avenue. So there's several, more than just one building that could be added on. And if this is the precedent we're setting, that even if you do a big addition, you don't have to add parking on site or do some kind of parking provision, I think it, you're gonna, you just cre you're just adding on to the parking problem that we already have. If you had a parking in lieu fee, like many cities do, and that parking in lieu, so instead of putting parking on site, you pay in lieu, and that in lieu fee goes <coughs> towards a parking lots, parking spaces, leases, parking garage. Now you're starting to have a global solution that everybody is sharing and not just you know, one particular you know, developer. Thank you, ma'am. And any additions, you know, any new buildings will, you know, all come under that same fee and, you know, to help you solve the problem. <clears throat> Thank you, ma'am. Commissioner Ashley. Thank you, ma'am. How many uh, parking spots do you provide for your store? We don't. Our building goes lot line to lot line. We don't have any parking on site. Would it's you a have any? Building. Right. I understand. Would you have any knowledge of um, any of the buildings on Tarpon Avenue? that provide X amount of parking for their residents? Uh, well, for I the just mentioned um, Two Frogs um, has parking in the back. They have residential on the second floor and the residents park there. Sure. Um, the, Mr. Fackless has parking, uh, limited parking behind his building. Um, the Banther building, which is actually is on Orange, um, the tea room is on, friends on Orange. They're gonna have parking uh, behind and access through the alley. Uh, the other buildings I mentioned, the Sunshine Supply, has parking behind their building, um, and the salon next door to it also has parking behind their building. That's Those are the ones I can think of at the moment. Um, I don't know how to turn this into a question, but I'll just <laughs> say um, it's different streets. The uh, North Street is different. North side of Tarpon is definitely different than the South side. Uh, the South side has, you would agree, has a great deal of parking there and on the other side while the north side has just the alley. Of course, we have our parking at the, that we've added on with the church and we've added on with the Tarpon <coughs> Tavern, but there's, there's very little <coughs> parking other than that. Um, you'd have to go one more block over to Orange to have a, any sort of parking. So all of those um, buildings like 
um, uh, the pizza place, uh, the twisted, uh, all of these, they, they don't have parking. Well, the pizza place and the twisted orange, <laughs> I drove by there today. They did have parking in the back for their employees and they somehow, I don't know that they got a permit for it. I'm not trying to rat them out, but they have two sheds there in the back where they used to have parking, the twisted orange. Now, maybe they got a permit for it. I don't know. Um, but there are, there are buildings on both sides of Tarpon Avenue, some of them that are built lot line and lot line, and there's some that are, do have parking in the back. Um, we're talking now about what's nearest to them. I'm just trying to give you some examples, but there are all, all along the entire length of Tarpon Avenue, there are both situations. There's also on both sides of Tarpon Avenue, parking lots. And I, one thing I did also forget to mention is, y'all have a parking lot that the city paid good money for, went through an eminent domain process to purchase the parking lot <laughs> next to Mr. Fackles's building. And that parking lot's main goal is not just the seven spaces that are there, but it's a cut through to get to the big parking lot on Orange. So, because people don't know that that's there if they're coming here for the first time. So there's, there's parking lots on both sides of Tarpon Avenue. There's definitely on si street parking on both sides of Tarpon <laughs> Avenue. Um, but there are also businesses that have parking on site and, there's, and he, they have an opportunity to have parking on site. And they're my, not doing it. My question to you is more so just to um, portray that there is shared parking all around that um, even though this is a uh, an additional business that's coming into play um, they shouldn't be responsible to give up some of their area to make parking behind so that was my more so my questioning because most people that do build a, a business unless it's in an open area which Tarpon Avenue is tight as could be and we all know this do we need parking there wholeheartedly um, and, and that'll be addressed as well. But I, I don't think you can punish somebody um, because they want to build something that, that would add value um, because we do have, like I said, shared parking. So I know I didn't turn that into a question. And well, I can I respond to that? Because I didn't, I didn't say, I didn't agree to any of that that you just said. First of all, um, they have half of their lot vacant today doesn't have a building on it. So they have the ability to provide some level of parking. We're not punishing them by doing that. We're asking them to meet the code. And if they had to meet the code to put, I'm not even saying they had to put 20 spaces on their lot, although they would probably get no expansion if they did that. I'm saying there ought to be some level of compliance with the code for on-site parking for employees to minimize the impact on the existing parking. They're coming in new. We're happy to have them. I think it's going to be an interesting business. I think it's going to add to the street. But they've got to meet the code just like everybody else does. I have one last question. Did you come before the Planning and Zoning Board to explain this to them? Well, that's, I'm glad you asked that question because although the Planning Department claims they sent notice, I never received, we never received any notices. Clearly, tonight wasn't noticed. But the Planning and Zoning Board, we never got a notice. The Board of Adjustment case, we never got a notice. Um, the HPB board, we never got a notice. So I don't know why that is, but we never got a single notice on any of these, on the, any of these cases that this project came before. So <clears> if I had known about it, yes, I would have come. Well, I appreciate that, because you didn't get a notice for this one either, correct? Well, there isn't a notice, there isn't a notice given for site right. plans. That's what I was saying earlier. The staff, ex I thought they, it got noticed just like everything else, and we just didn't get the notice. But as the staff explained to me, and I checked it in the code, there, that's correct. No site plans get notice with a mail notice or a sign. I, mean, I think that's wrong. I think you guys ought to really look at that. But that's Thank you. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, hang on. Um, oh, I don't have any other questions. Let me go to um, what we're going to do is um, I'm going to ask Ms. Vincent, do you have any rebuttal for any of the uh, affected parties? I do want to just start address uh, the, the parking. Um, the section of the code that Ms. Terrapani was referring to is section 127.05, parking credits and flexible parking allocations. And that is in the land development code. Um, and that, those, those credits were put in place to, before we had, that, that, that's under the land development code. The SMART code supersedes that and there's no reference back to this section of the code at all. It does not apply. Um, with respect to, um, you know, her testimony that um, 
you know, that there's no, you know, there is a, there's an absolute parking exemption subject to being able to show, and that's what the analysis shows, that for that specific T5B downtown Tarpon, that Tarpon Avenue district. So um, this is, you know, if you okay. accept the analysis, yes, sir. I just want to make sure yeah. this is in the form of a cross-examination. Okay, I have, I'll, that, that was, I was doing rebuttal then, sorry. I will save that for my closing. No, no, that's okay. Oh, you want your closing arguments, is that what you I'll, I'll save that for closing, okay. because I don't, I don't have anything to ask them, though. No. Right. So that was more of a rebuttal, sorry. No, no, that's fine. I just want to keep it straight, if you will, um, as far as the uh, um, hearing goes. The applicant, do you have any questions for, hang on, Mr. Terrapani, did you have something? Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Fossey, we're not done with the, uh, please come forward, uh, we're not done with the uh, affected party shot. Thank Hi. you. Hi, Melina Makris, folks. Um, my only concern, like, I'm excited. My salon is directly across. I've had my business here in this community since I was 19. And this, this town has been great, and it's constantly growing. I am looking forward to what I could gain from your business going across the street, which is going to be great for me. It's more exposure. I've got, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. But that's wonderful that you're coming into town. Our issue that we have at the salon and that we have from our clients that are coming in every day is the parking. There's hardly anywhere for them to go. And then I didn't even know that this map existed. It's like a mystical map in my eyes that it, you know, I didn't know where the parking's at here in this community other than Mother Mears across the street uh, where um, Fatco's department store is on the street in the back of the building. Again, there's no access points other than going up and down steps when it comes to people that are disabled. So my only concern with my business that is con continuously growing on a daily basis is the parking. And we need the parking to be within a walking distance. I mean, I've been told from other people, oh, follow the trolley um, time frame and park at the dog park, and it doesn't make sense. Something within, I mean, I don't care how they get delivered, whether it be a you know, helicopter landing pad, I don't care how. My business is growing, and we need to accommodate not just mine, but all of Tarpon Avenue. You know, and I, and I, I can't wait. I can't wait to see what the business is going to bring. Cohat's going to be great. I want it to be great for all of us, not just one store. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Terrapani, did you? Oh, hang on a second, Mr. Does anybody have a question for Ms. Fossey? No. Any commission? Come on. Forward. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, my, my comments are more of a history lesson to give you some background on what has transpired with some of the buildings, including this building. Um, in, in 1984, Louis Pappas and I and Bill Howard uh, of Howard Park fame formed a little hometown company called Historical Properties at Tarpon Springs. And we decided to buy historically and architecturally significant buildings in the town because the, the town, and I think uh, Mr. LaCorris can verify this, Costa was out sailing the seas, we thank him for his service, but um, it was boarded up, broken windows, a um, couple of, two or three good businesses left, but the rest was boarded up. The Currents restaurant was a cut and shoot bar. There were five feet of wine bottles under the depot. Uh, uh, Twelve winos lined up on the depot like scarecrows. Is any of that accurate, Mark? Well, thank you. So we formed this company and uh, we started buying old buildings, including this one in 1984. It had some sheds in the back uh, of the building <coughs> and we tore those out to make parking for employees of the businesses that we were gonna lease to. Um, we bought the old reliable building, which by the way is the oldest building on the street, not the Fernal building. The old reliable was built in 1888 and this was built in 1894. Um, same thing, it had a carport in the back, kind of a lean-to shed. We tore it down so that the tenants, we made two apartments upstairs and had a retail store downstairs, and we put in about six or seven spaces on the vacant land. Um, same thing behind Currents and Sunshine Supply, bunch of sheds back there. 
We tore them all out, made um, parking for employees. So the sensitivity goes back a long ways in history as to parking. Um, the, I believe Ms. Vincent, by her own testimony, her analysis of the square footage versus the parking requirements, it fails. Because she said, if I believe, I'm quoting her right, that there was uh, 10,000 square feet left. These people were going to take six, so that left four. But then she testified that she hadn't accounted for the uh, 16,000 square feet that the city potentially is going to put on the Forbes property, Noblet property, however you want to uh, call it. The other thing, uh, Commissioner Pontiotis, Ms. Commissioner Cuya, you ask about other properties that had the ability to do the same thing as what's happening here. The Mears building has, that's, that's private property behind the Mears building. The um, Clonaris building, which is where uh, the zip and ship is, that property is theirs. The property behind um, the old Reliable, is, uh, which is now Two Frogs, is owned by those people. The property behind Currents, Louie and I still own. So there's all these places you could do the same thing, and what happens? I mean, you, f you fail, the, si the, the system fails with one property, the city property. So at a minimum, uh, I think Mayor Vaticotis said at the beginning of the meeting, could you turn the, um, uh, the Planning and Zoning Board's recommendations into a requirement? There should be something about the, the parking. I mean, basically, look, th this is a great concept. It's nice, it's beautiful, it's, it's you know, it's, it's exciting. But it's 10 pounds in the proverbial five pound bag. You know, it's, it's just, it's, it's a great idea, but it's the, the wrong location. Look, Louie Louis and I learned a long time ago don't, because we had a lot of properties to lease downtown. Don't sign a new lease if you're going to lose, your new lease is going to make you lose two or three people. So while this is very exciting, you shouldn't do a project that's going to cause harm to your existing businesses. And that's what this is going to do, unless there's some change to the proposal on the table. You're going to cause harm to the existing businesses. You know, I wish they would have come to me before, or I would have talked to them before because I'd have said, look, you guys need to go put your building on that Forbes property. You can get impact fee credits, you can get zero lot line, and you're not required any parking because that's the deal the city's made with two or three developers. And it would, it would have been great, you know, and, they, and it would have had more square footage. They could have had 16,000 square feet because it's an 8,000 square foot lot with a 2.0. And uh, I don't know if any... Anybody ever offered that to you guys or told you about it? But, uh, you know, it's, it's negligent on the city's part if nobody mentioned it to you as far as I'm concerned. Um, I just, you know, as it sits, I think you should turn it down. Even though it's a great concept and things, but something needs to be uh, modified or massaged to make it work. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Terrapane, hang on. Is there anybody that's got a question for Mr. Terrapane? Okay, thank you. I did want to ask one. Go ahead. Mayor, uh, and Ms. Terrapani elaborated a little bit on the percentage of the, the additional, adding an addition to the building. Uh, what do you guys think as, you know, familiar with the area, that addition sh could be to allow enough parking space behind the building to make it somewhat adequate for this application? I mean, you know, Commissioner, it's, to, to, to me, I, I was also president of the Florida Trust for Historic Preservation, so I, I got all these mixed feelings about it. I mean, my real heart goes, don't do anything to the building and keep the land in the back like it is and le leave it for parking because parking's so tight. But in, in the sense of compromise, I would think at least the, the width of the property, 20 feet deep so you could get um, a car, you know, cars parked straight in and have a potential place for uh, 
delivery trucks to pull in coming down the alley and things like that, U UPS truck, Amazon trucks, food <coughs> trucks, and things like that. Thank you, sir. Okay. Ms. Vincent, I'm going to ask you again, do you have any cross-examination for anybody? Okay. Mr. Watkins, do you have any questions for any of the um, affected parties? Questions? For who? Vincent. Am I able to do that? I don't. Yes. Yes. Okay. First of all, I, I just want to say, Mr. Mayor, commissioners, uh, I've attended many meetings like this over the last several years, and I appreciate the dignity uh, and the respect uh, and the uh, due process uh, that is conducted at this meeting. So thank you very much. Um, have we followed every step of the process correctly? Yes and have we complied with all of the requirements of the city every step of the way? You, you've gone through all the procedural steps. The last piece of that is the site plan. Um, and this board has to determine, the Planning and Zoning Board reviewed it and recommended approval. This board has to, recommend, you know, has to review and make a recommendation. But yes, you have followed all the appropriate steps to get here and the applicable sections of the smart code um, in your project. And is it your observation that based on the successful approval, the approvals that we've gotten at each step of the way, uh, you've seen an increase in our investment uh, to this based on the approvals that we're getting um, in each of these? I, mean, I can't speak to your investment. I mean, it's, you've clearly been involved in the process for quite some time, so. And I, am I permitted to make just a short statement ab about that? Short statement. Yeah, so we, we have um, followed the process. Uh, each step of the process, approvals have been given. Um, and based on, on staff, uh, we've increased that investment. We already have $250,000 and over a year and a half invested in this um, in good faith um, based on these uh, approvals that we've received. Um, and uh, any change in that would be a, a significant uh, addition in cost and time uh, that I, I, I don't see how we could do that. So I just want to state that for the record. Thank you. All right, so you have no other questions for the affected parties. Um, what we're going to do is go to public comments now. Are there any pub public comments? Good evening, board. Anita Protus, 901 Bayshore Drive. I didn't know all of this was coming up until 3.30 today. And I'm going to tell you, as you all know, I'm uptown every day. Never did I see on this building about a meeting with a historic preservation. Never did I see a sign on the building what was going to happen there. And I'm here because that's a historic building We've just gone through the community putting up historic plaques on buildings. I wish we still had the picture of the front of the building, what they plan to do. They're changing a historic building. I don't know where you did your research, but if you had done your research and if I had time, I would have brought all my Tarpon books to show you. Tarpon Avenue being made up as it is today, and you would have seen the Mears building being built. We shouldn't let them change it to the modern. We're losing our historic preservation uh, destination here in Tarpon. We're losing a lot. We just lost the first school here because it didn't have to go into historic preservation because they didn't put it into the historic district. It's all changed. We are losing other buildings in town, sections of town in historic preservation. I'd like to see a business like this here, good for Tarpon. But they're gonna change our building and it's gonna lose its historic destination. And this is what's happening all over town, Mayor. And you were always saying we need to keep our historic <laughs> destination and our historic culture here in Tarpon. Don't let them change the facade like that. And as for the alley, they'll never make the turn off of Hibiscus go down the alley, it's so narrow. Now, when it's crowded uptown, between the tavern and the Italian restaurant, cars are parked in the alley. 
just so far up sometimes so if they, someone came down the alley, they can go through the parking lot and get out on Orange Street. And as far as losing a couple of parking places, Commissioner Eisner's referring to the Jitney. We all know that. You know, and that's bringing people in town. That's two, maybe two and a half the most. We have the uh, Stamus property. You want to buy property in the docks? Buy one piece where the old Stamus Hotel used to be. Buy that property. Make it a parking lot. Further down uh, Safford Avenue, uh, there, <coughs> excuse me, there are lots. I'm very upset over this tonight. You're going to allow them to come in, change the facade on a historic building, and we're going to lose. All of you have ancestors 100 years in Tarpon Springs. I'm going to be 81 soon, and I'm seeing a change. Let's not look at the historic beauty of this town. Let them come in, but keep with the historic features of that building and let them use it as they need. And in the back, leave that alone. Let them park there. Please do not let us lose our historic preservation here in Tarpon Springs, and we will because it's all changing. We've got to keep something for your children, for your grandchildren, for the history of our families here over a hundred years. What are we doing here? It's like a cancer coming in and eating everything in Tarpon on historic preservation. Listen, boy, it's your choice, but there's a Greek saying, domacha sudeka, and you better look hard at these. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other public comments? Mr. Jump, are there any public comments, remote access? Would like to speak on this item. Please raise your hand and you'll, you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do have a raised hand at this time. I'll allow the first person in. Good evening, Peter Delacus, 514 Ashland Avenue. I would have to say, Ms. Terrapani gave you an excellent rendition of codes as to which you have the ability to deny this project. Mr. Terrapani gave the applicants a very solvable way to get their business. And boo hoo hoo, you spent some money doing it. You always have the risk coming up to the final board and get denied. But I want to talk about something that hasn't been talked about. And I want to point you out to Universal Engineering Sciences. Uh, 4.4 site preservation page six and if you go through this I think some of these things that are listed are going to greatly affect the neighboring buildings one strip the proposed construction limits of all existing improvements live rock vegetation grassroots etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera, within and five feet beyond the perimeter of the proposed building and in all paved areas how does that not affect the alley and then after that the building footprint plus five feet beyond should be compacted with a 15-ton vibrator roller on a high frequency and amplitude for 10 passes. Now, maybe the mayor can explain that. Then you compact the subgrade to 95, and then you have to test the subgrade, and then you have to put fill in, and then you have to compact it again to 95%, and then you have to test it again, and then the last one, number eight, compact all footings. So, so what is all this compacting going to do to some of these historic buildings neighboring it? Will it affect their foundation? Will it create rock uh, cracks in their buildings? So if you are going to allow this project, I would say you would require this company to put up a $1 million bond to protect any adjacent landowners of any damage to their building from this construction. So that's an issue that I haven't heard talked about. The parking is an issue. Mr. Fackless is correct. This has been going on for years. And I do have to say the city needs to uh, let the people know that they did lease the area behind the bank. So that has helped and agree with Mr. Fackless. It's far for his business, and that's an ongoing situation. But the thing that really worries me is this stuff about what will happen to this area when they begin their construction. I know I've gone past my time. Thank you for uh, your consideration. All right, Mr. Delacus, thank you. Are there any other <coughs> public comments, Mr. Jump? And we do not have any other raised hands at this time. Okay. Uh, 
the applicant, uh, Mr. Watkins, I know you made a statement earlier, but this is a rebuttal. You get a chance to kind of finish up what you've got to say about your uh, project. Uh, first of all, I, I want to thank uh, all of you uh, for your comments and for coming out. And I can feel uh, the commitment and the history and the legacy uh, uh, and the care uh, that everybody has uh, for the community. Uh, and again, I appreciate the, uh, the process and how these meetings are conducted. I, I, I would just say, um, you know, we do want to be a part of this community. We want to be part of the solution. Uh, this is not the first time that, you know, we have been in this situation. Uh, where you know other businesses feel like uh, they will be inconvenienced uh, with us coming in, um, and I, I could name off you know four or five different cities uh, where we've been through the same thing. Um, you know what we found, and I, I, I'm not trying to minimize uh, the issue here uh, at all, um, is that uh, most cities um, have more parking than they think. They have more land for parking than they think, and it's it's um, there are ways to better manage and optimize that. Uh, and so um, I, I just think that there are certain things that can be done um, to uh, better utilize uh, the parking that's already here. The other thing I want to say is we have one employee um, uh, in cohatch per day. So uh, there really is not, I mean, there, there is one person during the day and then the restaurant will have, you know, 10 or 12, uh, whatever they have depending on day of week, but it's, it's usually in the evenings. Um, and so there is this complementary uh, use uh, of, uh, of the parking um, by our employees. Um, you know, we will be bringing more people to town, people that work and, and, and play and live and celebrate. Um, and some of them will be using parking and will be experiencing some of the same things uh, that you are. Um, and so we, we understand it, we get it. Um, you know, I, I just want to point out that we came in that because we've been through this several times, um, you know, we did the research and we looked at and worked with staff at city. Uh, we followed the process. Um, we made good faith investments as we went along uh, in doing this. Uh, and it, it just, you know, it, it feels not right that at this point um, that you know, when parking has n never been raised as an issue um, because of the smart code, um, if, it, if that had been an issue at the very beginning, we may not have invested here and gone somewhere else uh, or, you know, chosen a different uh, plan. But um, the way it is, it, it's, we need all 13 for this, 13,000 square feet for this to be a viable project for us. Um, and, you know, making the changes that were suggested um it, it's just you know I, i'm just i just don't see how we could do that but anyway we get it we want to be part of the solution uh we think we have some ideas um but i you know we we leave the decision in your good hands thank you mr watkins ms vincent your closing summary please uh yes the the parking for this project is is determined by the SMART code, not the section of the land development code that Ms. Terrapani, Ms. Terrapani referenced uh, that just simply does not apply in this situation. Um, regarding notice uh, for HPB and Board of Adjustments, we checked the records. Terrapani's were on that notice list. They should have received a postcard. I don't know what happens to them when they go in the mail, but they were on both notice lists uh, for BOA and for HPB. And then regarding the facade uh, renovations themselves, as I stated, those did go to the Historic Preservation Board. Those renovations, um, you know, the front facades largely being preserved um, and, and updated, uh, but all of that work did go to the Historic Preservation Board and received a certificate of appropriateness. So with that, I'll close. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Vincent. All right, what we're going to do now is close the public hearing, and now it's going to go to the commission for discussion. <clears throat> okay. All right, let me, um, I'm just going to go down by the way we normally do it. Vice Mayor Lunt, do you have any comments? I've got some comments, but I'm going to wait till I hear everybody. <laughs> okay, I have a, I have a couple. I might have a couple more after I hear somebody else, but um, we keep talking about 
our land development code being superseded by the SMART code. Um, in fact, if you take a detailed look at our SMART code, it defers to the land development code in, in several respects. Um, I'm not going to go into the detail and read them, but for starters, section 124 uh, it says the existing comprehensive zoning and land development code shall continue to be applicable to issues not covered by this code. Parking is definitely not covered by this code. Um, other places in there under uh, intent says uh, section 132 that development should adequately accommodate automobiles, which this does not. Um, the preservation and renewal of historic buildings should be facilitated to affirm the continuity of the surrounding area, which this may or may not with a, with a doubling in size. So I haven't had time to go through this in gross detail, uh, but I think we need to consider the fact that this is going to have a major effect on our downtown. Whether it was intentional or not, and whether our smart code covered every facet, I mean, this smart code was done a significant amount of time ago when parking maybe was not such a big issue within this transect. So anyway, that's my comments. So far. So far. Vice Mayor Carr. Um, I mean, my biggest comment is what staff has provided from, a, uh, from their perspective based on what the code says, and I think that really means a lot in this situation. Uh, I do believe parking in downtown is a is crippling at times um, for businesses uh, want to go downtown for different items. It's really difficult to see and find parking spots um, at times, but other times I am able to find parking as well too. So um, I do respect all the parties here. Um, I appreciate all the comments that were brought tonight. And um, I don't have any further questions or I'm sorry, comments right now, Mayor. Okay, Commissioner Eisner. <coughs> I agree quite a bit with what Commissioner Carr just said. Um, I appreciate all the comments. Um, parking is a, something that's come before us for every project that comes before us. It's just uh, parking is not good. And I think that's a separate issue that we have to deal with. Um, I commend Renee for giving us all of the uh, facts and figures that come into play. Um, there's a trade-off. Could there be more? parking issues with them, uh, you know, going ahead with this, <coughs> true, but there's a benefit too. They're bringing a lot of money into the town that other businesses there will also prosper from. So there's, you know, it's a double-edged sword here. We all know we have to deal with the parking. It's not just here. We have to deal with parking at the uh, sponge docks as well. Um, I, I think it's a, always a problem parking, speeding, um, just everything during our uh, winter season and in the summer season, as Commissioner Carr said as well, you know, I've been there and I can park right in front of where I need to be and I've been there where I drive around the block and I park two blocks away and by the time I walk back over there, there's three spots looking me right in the face. So I've, I've had all of these types of things. Um, I mean, I, I feel for the people that are handicapped, you know, I, I do think we should look into this in a different way. Some of the comments that you made about having a short-term parking for people possibly with a handicapped uh, parking sticker, if we can't get uh, a handicapped parking sticker from, we, we could do our own, you know, Tarpon Springs <laughs> resident parking sticker you know, where people can have convenience to go in for a hair salon. I know that uh, for Mr. Fackless and the beauty salon, uh, Fridays is a hot day. I know we have issues with first Fridays. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that goes on here. A, this is not just um, an easy cake to make. Um, so uh, I, I'm not in, I, I like to see it progress. I have no issues. They're not changing the facade, as was said. The facade is gonna be the same. Um, and if it wasn't, it would be on another board to reject it. This is all to be done in the back. The interior would look nice. Um, there's a lot of places that have moved ahead 
and, and uh, redone their inside to be more updated. Um, we have so many different things. We're not in the 1960s. We're not in the 1940s. You know, um, things do change. Uh, I think everybody that's up here has uh, run on smart development. This is a smart development uh, to be done. It's not, um, you know, and I'll bring up a tough subject. We, we're dealing with a, a different apartment complex that's huge. So for the people that are sitting there saying they don't want to see a change, this is a small little area. Those are the same people that have come before us to, to completely change the Tarpon Springs forever. So I, I don't agree that this is going to be such a major change. We do need to know um, that, that parking needs to be dealt with some way or another. I've had this discussion with the city manager. Um, there are plans, and I, I don't think we should give up any parking spots to other uh, items that are going on. I think that the business needs as many parking spots as possible, and that's my take on it. Okay. Commissioner Kulias. I, I must admit, this is probably one of the harder decisions uh, that we'd have to make up here on this board. There, there's a lot to consider from uh, density purposes to additional parking that we're gonna have to address on this board. Where you know, it's gonna put us into get more work done. Um, uh, I am excited to hear about uh, a center for business exchange and ideas and uh, <coughs> opportunity for, you know, just entrepreneurs and a spot um, that Chef does is a well-known chef in the area, and um, seeing them try to take that investment in here is something. Um, but I am concerned about those additional businesses in, in the downtown Tarpon Springs. The ones that've been there for a while, and they they need that front, you know, that Tarpon Ave parking to keep their businesses going. So, um, you know, try to weigh and balance it. It's definitely a tough decision for me. Uh, but whatever comes out of it, we're, we're going to have to work really hard to help downtown businesses and, you know, just the, the overall walkability and business environment of Tarpon Springs. So thank yeah. you. All right. You want to have, you have Yeah, another? I did want to. I did want uh, you to consider, uh, as I did listen to everybody's comments, um, and I'm sorry, I don't know the woman's name with the beauty salon, but she wasn't against this project. She just, she was more so thought she could prosper from it. And, you know, a few people up here, I know Mr. Fackless has always wanted more people so he could prosper from it. Sunshine can prosper from it. Um, I didn't hear people coming in here saying they couldn't prosper from it. They were just concerned for parking. So um, the only concern that I really had heard that they really didn't want it was from Mr. and Mrs. Terrapani. And in my question, I mean, I, I just asked that, you know, how often are they even open? So it, it wasn't that I got a feeling that, you know, going ahead with this and giving them approval would be a, uh, you know, detrimental to the city. So that was what I wanted to say. Is, is I did want to also ask what the, just the, the facade on the front of the building, I, I do think you guys did a, a good job in trying to maintain some of those structure, uh, the structures, the arches and stuff. I'm not too impressed with the back of the building, but I understand there's a moderate feel between, you know, uh, restoring and renovating buildings. If it was completely up to me, I, I wouldn't mind waiting six months to go back to the uh, preservation board to make it look sound. But uh, we're here at this decision now, and I guess we got to make it. So, thank you. Go ahead, Commissioner Carl. Thanks. Uh, there's a couple recommendations that the Planning and Zoning Board made. I'm not sure if the board wants to discuss in, in the discussion let as me, well. Let too. me make my comments. Okay, I'm sorry we, about that. All right. If that's okay, yeah. You're looking at me. No, I'm just waiting. <laughs> you're, wait, you're waiting. Um, first of all, I, I know most of the people that spoke here personally. I don't think anybody is against uh, business downtown. Um, I think, uh, as a matter of fact, many of the people were investing in the downtown when it was dead. 
um, including the one email that we got today about shooting a cannonball across a, a parking lot without hitting a, a, a car. And now all of a sudden, it's a completely different matter where we've got a par parking problem, which quite frankly, is, that's not a bad problem to have as long as you can find a solution for it. So I don't really think anybody is here um, against a business such as Cohatch. I mean, so don't take it personal, Mr. Watkins. Um, I, I think the, the, the issue is the parking and how do you make it work. Um, as far as the notices and things like that, um, I think Ms. Vincent mentioned, I, uh, I know the Board of uh, Adjustment was one, and then I think the Hate, uh, Historic Preservation Board issues another um, uh, notice, and I would suspect you probably had your, your, your plans out there showing everything as you were doing tonight, maybe not to the detail that you had tonight. Um, I, I, there, when we deferred this, I think this was, was it before the holidays? Yes. Yeah, we, we, before the holidays, I promise you, I talked to a number of people. There wasn't a whole lot of discussion at that time about parking. And then that was deferred. Now tonight we're hearing a lot of uh, discussion about parking. And I don't think it's an issue uh, of so much that um, people weren't interested. I think that um, there was additional time for people to talk and to kind of get back into that mode of talking. The holidays kind of got in the way, but now everybody's talking about parking again. Part of the original uh, um, discussion back then was to include uh, at least at this point, maybe the next meeting or the next meeting after, to, uh, to commission a parking study uh, for the downtown to kind of address these sort of things. And I appreciate what Ms. Vinson does with her analysis, um, but it's not, it's not a sophisticated analysis and really doesn't lay things out for us. So I, I think that's something that we still have to follow through. Um, I think the cohatch, um, it's not the first time we've seen your shared office. There was another uh, uh, concept that was in competition with what we call the Forbes property, which is the empty lot between the two buildings. And um, that, didn't that didn't win, uh, but at least that was another project that was put on the table and um, similar to what you had. The, um, the, the, the one issue, what I heard tonight is, is basically parking, and, and I don't think it's aimed at cohatch, and, and I don't want to wind up hurting prospective businesses, applicants, um, because, and let me just put it back on us, because the city government, through a number of years, hasn't done a good job of addressing this problem. I think we're doing it now with, with um, the city manager going out there and finding private parking and leasing that uh, in, a, in a variety of different ways to provide public parking. In other words, it's, it's private just for that particular business, but then when we lease it, it becomes public property, public prop parking for not only the individual business, but for anybody that wants to come to the downtown. So that seems to be working okay. We're working on another um, opportunity right now. Um, within that quarter mile uh, surface, so I'm hoping that will be uh, coming forward to this commission at some point in the future. I, I think the parking garage is gonna be a reality. I, I think that people just need to continue being patient. The location, the targeted location has been somewhat selected. It's an ideal location. The property owner is interested in working with us, just not now. <laughs> so it's gonna happen at some point in the future. But in the meantime, um, we need to continue working with what we need to do. The one thing that, uh, and I wanna try and make this thing work tonight. I think it's a good concept. I think that it's a good opportunity. It's certainly a way of introducing it to the city. And I'm a big believer, if there's a need, the business will succeed. If there isn't a need, there will be another business moving into your, your facility. And, and I think there's a couple of ways of doing it. One um, is to that one planning and zoning recommendation of uh, finding additional parking. I'd like to make that actually a, a requirement uh, to, to uh, offset um, for the addition, which I think would be about 18 
parking spaces. And um, there's a number of ways of doing that. And, and one, you know, just two, one way would be to uh, perhaps approach, there's a couple of banks that have private parking approach them maybe through some kind of a barter or something like that and allow them to have you use 18 of their parking spaces and certify that to the city government. That's one idea. Of course, the city attorney, who I'm sure is sitting there listening, is going to either agree or not agree to that approach. Uh, the other part of that, of course, is the city manager. Uh, we lease property, and, um, and it's been averaging about a thousand dollars a month for 35 36 parking spaces about, about approximately. so um, the net um, if you look at it from that perspective you could partner with the city and participate in that leasing program to the tune of about five hundred dollars a month if if that's the going price if it's less that's fine I don't I'm not getting into that I'm just trying to find identify a couple of different requirements for me, um, what I'd like to see, and, and I know Commissioner Carr wants to address a couple of these other things, is um, um, not necessarily provide a way of doing this, but just simply saying that you will provide the additional parking that offsets the square footage that's being added uh, over what the existing building is, and just leave it at that, and then um, work with the, um, the city staff in order to find a way of doing that. That would be the one way. Now, if the commission doesn't like that idea and they just want to approve the project, I'm open for that as well. <coughs> I don't want to, I'm just throwing something out there. If there's some apprehension, which I, I kind of get a sense that there's a little bit of apprehension on a couple of the commissioners about how to go about this. So um, that's all I've got to say. I think it's a good project. I don't want to hurt whether it's you or anybody else because we haven't done such a good job with parking. And um, like I said, if, if, if you're needed here, you, you can't speak now, <laughs> but if you're needed here, um, you'll succeed. And if you're not, then, and I'm, I'm, I believe you will succeed. I, I think the town is ready for some new things like this so they can explore that. And, and since you've been successful in many other areas, especially the one downtown, which caught my attention, I, I think you'll succeed here as well. Um, I'm going to ask the city attorney, do you hear any objection to what I'm saying or? No, Mayor, I think that condition, it can be added. I just didn't know if you want to look at the other conditions. We um, will. That, I'm going to let okay. Commissioner Carr, you, I don't want to get into your, I just wanted to make my <coughs> comments and observations based on what I heard and throw that out there as a, as a, uh, an option or something that the com commission can consider. If the commission doesn't want to consider that in the motion, then we'll deal with that. But that's something that I'd like to, uh, I, I wanted to explore a little bit in the comments. So, um, Commissioner Carr. Sure, yeah. Um, so the Planning and Zoning Board made two recommendations uh, for additional conditions. Um, so, Mayor, I, th I think you do have a couple good ideas at the end of the day. Uh, there's, I'm not sure the how they would be figured out, do they, go along with the building, are they perpetual? Is it for 10 years certain or something along those lines? Um, those are some things that I think the staff would have to, to it would hammer be, out. It would be the additional square footage, the increase, is that what you're asking? Yeah, so the, I mean, you've got the increase, but then like how many years does that last for, right? Are you requiring it forever? Um, if a new business comes in then and takes over, do they take over then that agreement with the city or a local parking lot? Um, those are just some questions that we'd have to hammer we can, out, right? We can make that as a condition of approval, certainly at any point in the future when if we succeed and there's a surplus of parking, cohatch is still there, they can certainly come back and ask to be for, to relieve, to be released from that requirement at any point in the future. Yeah. So I think you made a, I think they made good points. That was what I'm trying to get at. So I, I think that would be an, a, a good idea to add a, as a condition uh, if the board feels the the need to approve this tonight um, based on the evidence provided uh, at the end of the day. Uh, and then the other part is that, that the city continue to work to establish additional parking to serve the downtown area. Um, I don't really know how we can make that a condition for this because it's, it's a city position at that point. So I don't think we need to add that as a condition, but I do think we need to add some type of condition to this um, 
uh, application tonight for additional parking. Thank you. That's Sorry. it. Yeah. Okay. Does any commissioner have any follow up questions? Uh, I know you, you had Commissioner Eisner, Commissioner Kulias. No comments. All right. Um, the very next step is to um, uh, have a motion and a second. Is there anybody that wishes to, you want to try yeah. and make the motion? Uh, motion to approve with the condition um, that Kohatch has to agree to um, just, work just to provide the additional, provide not additional agree, parking, but just to provide. The, but I would like it to be until the city gets the parking um, deal in order because it shouldn't be an endless um, thing so we could remove it at some point. That's the way I would like it to be read. Okay, we need it in the form of a it, motion that that's, question, uh, yes. Uh -huh. Commissioner, are you, are you, do you want to condition it upon that the applicant is responsible for the uh, additional parking based on the, the new size of the building subject to that issue being resolved either by the city or some other entity? Correct. Okay. Because, I mean, something else could happen where there's available parking or they decide to purchase some area which could satisfy the issue and or the city could satisfy it. Listen, Kohatch could settle this somehow and, and buy up a parking area for, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things. As long as it's satisfied that we have that uh, condition with the 18 parking spots. How many parking spots? Was there, was there any other uh, condition, the planning and zoning board? I think it's just what staff has. And to include all staff. Just to, this, we this want to make that motion, as Commissioner Eisner mentioned, but to also include the staff, staff recommendations. I would go with that, yes. Is that correct? Yes. Um, Ms. Vinson, is that clear to you? I I'm going to ask so. Ms. Vin I'm going to ask Ms. <laughs> Jacobs. Ms. Jacobs, could you read back your understanding of the motion? Well, I had something until Attorney Salzman changed it. Um, <laughs> I, I, I have clarified it. Clarified. Um, so what I had is that the uh, with the for this to be approved with the additional condition. Um, for the applicant to provide additional parking until the city gets parking issue under in order. That was what originally Commissioner Eisner said, and then I did not get the clear all of the clarification that 18 parking spaces plus what the staff staff conditions. Uh, condition. would be. Do you want to read the staff conditions? They're, sure. They're already in the resolution. It's already, already included they're, they're, um, in the yeah, resolution. One through six. Um, in the, you want me to read them? In the resolution. Then, okay. Right. I'm All good right. with it. Let me let me yes, confirm what you're saying. Is I understand what you're saying is you are making a motion to approve the application with a condition that the applicant provide the additional parking which reflects the additional square footage that they're building until such time that that parking is made available either by the city, that additional parking is made available by the city or by some other means. Correct. Okay. And to accept all of the staff's comments. Yeah, uh, all the staff's conditions, yes. Conditions, ex yes. excuse me, that's correct. Correct. Is that okay? We're good? Is there a second to that motion? Second. Are there any further comments? Roll call, please. Commissioner Kulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lund? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Um, Mr. Watkins, I suggest you get with Ms. Vincent, maybe with the city manager, work out the details of all of this. They're pretty clever as far as how to approach these sort of things. So and satisfy the spirit of what we approved this evening. Thank you, Mr. Watkins. And welcome to Tarpon Springs. Thank you. Yeah. Mayor, we oh, break. $5 million in that. Yeah, what we're going to do is take a 10-minute break. Um, we'll reconvene at uh, 10.33.
No, 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 no. Okay. That's, yeah, that's true.
Are we ready to reconvene? We're ready. Okay. We're reconvening the meeting at 1036. Better just in case. That was item 13. We're going to go back to, if I can find it. Number nine. Item nine under ordinances and resolutions um mr Sousman, if you can read the resolution by title this is item nine resolution 202309 a resolution of the board of commissioners of the city of tarpon springs florida formally establishing a special council and providing for an effective date hereof okay thank you um you've got the um, resolution in the back up there's a couple of things on this item um uh, I did a very brief cover memo on this. Um, the original version of this was um, a little broader in scope, uh, less pointed. Uh, let me use that word. And um, it had been reviewed. It, actually, we discussed it. We narrowed the uh, uh, scope to the Anclote Harbors. And then uh, Mr. Schwartz looked at the uh, resolution as well. and, and um, uh, is going to handle the policy matters in a different way. Um, it's they're included in there in an implicit way, but not specific as um, as it's written. Um, in addition, the actual scope of work, the original approach was going to be those two as separate items, but then uh, we decided to go ahead and make that. <coughs> an attachment to the resolution. So when you approve the resolution this evening, you would be approving the uh, scope of work as well. Um, uh, originally, that was going to be just a discussion item as far as the draft goes, and then bring it back to, uh, to the commission on February 14th, I guess, for approval. But um, uh, the idea has kind of changed now. So what I'm going to do is uh, <clears throat> ask for whether there's any public comments on this item and then we'll go to the commission and then uh, a motion and approval um are there any public comments here this evening on this item this is item nine resolution 2023 authority for special counsel mr coolianis you have Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. John Koulianis, 1020 Peninsula Avenue, Tarpon Springs. Um, so um, I, I kind of take exception to uh, Commissioner Carr's uh, comments regarding uh, PNC members and Board of Commissioners uh, communicating. Um, I think that this our direction to the to the special counsel needs to be succinct and uh, direct. And um, I'd also like some clarification from the mayor regarding the uh, the uh, what was the issue you wanted the evacuation? Not what do they call it? The uh, street vacation. Street yeah. vacation. I'd like some clarification on that. But I think the uh, commissioner Carr's um, and I had nice things to say about Commissioner Carr last week. Uh, but that was last week. <laughs> so um, I think that your, your, your condition is a, a distraction and um, I think frankly a red herring. A red herring, uh, let me, uh, I'm sorry for. Okay, so the, um, the issue that he had brought up was a board of commissioner speaking to a planning and zoning member. Um, so the Sunshine Law says uh, on the uh, section on individual board members meeting with a member of another public board. The Sunshine Law does not apply to a meeting between individuals who are members of different boards unless one or more of the individuals has been de delegated the authority to on behalf of his or her board. Furthermore, the individual city council member may therefore meet privately with an individual member of the municipal planning and zoning board to discuss a recommendation made by, the, that, made by that board. 
So again, that in all due respect is uh, a red herring and is completely irrelevant. Thank you. Okay, uh, are there any other public comments? Um, Mr. Jump, are there any public comments from remote access? Anyone online with a public comment, please raise your hand to speak. I do see raised hands, and I'll let the next person in. Good evening. Peter Delacus, 514 Ashland Avenue. I'd just like to confirm we are speaking about the special counsel resolution and the scope of services. Can uh, I get any acknowledgement that I'm correct on this one? You're correct. Okay. First, I'd like to go to the actual resolution. Uh, on number one, it says certain topics stemming from questionable quasi-judicial action. And the point I'm bringing this out is there were certain legislative actions that were done in the process, and I don't see that addressed. So I want to point that out. That also comes up on number five, where it says quasi-judicial actions in question is the ankle and harbor. It should be legislative and quasi-judicial. And uh, I think there was one more, but I also want to go down to the uh, last page in the actual scope of services and where it talks about public records disclosure. And uh, being that I've spoken with Mr. Schwartz and I know uh, I'm on the list and there are others on there, those who are on the list, I would like to point you out to the last paragraph where it says, therefore, all information that is not legislatively exempt for some other reason and relates to the investigation will likely become available for public disclosure upon request following the conclusion of the investigation. All individuals participating in the investigation should be made aware of this limited duration exemption. So I just wanna point that out, but otherwise I think uh, the scope of services covers things, but I do feel like the addition of legislative uh, needs to be put into the resolution. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Delacus. Mr. Jump, are there any other public comments? And there are no other raised hands at this time. Okay. Just a couple of points that um, Mr. Koulianis brought up and Mr. Delacus on the street vacation fee. Um, I think that Mr. Schwartz wants to focus on the Anklode Harbor. That's what the RP called for. That's what he wants to focus on. If there's something in that, investigation that he finds that would that would kind of point to something else like the street vacation fee um, he feels that that is in the I think other or other related ordinances I think is the wording in the resolution that he's got and then also um, he he what whatever there was the issue of both legislative and quasi judicial um, he specifically made a change for his uh, for his own uh, purposes as far as the type of investigation that he, he he's not it doesn't eliminate anything but he just wanted to provide a little more of a general uh, way of describing it to provide him some flexibility. I guess that's the best way I can describe it. It's not precluding any either legislative or quasi-judicial. The legislative would be the um, actions that occurred, let's say in 2019, when the Land Development Code and the Comprehensive Plan Amendments were changed, that would be legislative. The quasi-judicial would be the, the ones that we actually went through for the application for the Enclosed Harbor. So, and he's going to be looking at all of that. Uh, okay, so let me uh, hear from other com uh, commissioners, Vice Mayor Lund. I think we're we're covered under item three of the uh, the scope to cover additional <coughs> items that, that that are caught up. So that that seems to be adequate. If the if the council wants to focus on a specific area, then that's right. exactly what we need. So. The only comments I have. Commissioner Carr. Yeah, I just have got a comment about um, Commissioner Leck Kuyanis' red herring comment. Um, so there's a couple things that I just want to 
I think it's important that the board understands and it's, there's comments in this resolution as well. It talks about clearing the air, restoring integrity of city government, reestablishing confidence with the residents. Um, some of the actions may have created a cloud of suspicion and mistrust over the city government. Uh, this is no way a red herring situation I'm trying to bring up. Um, in my eyes, if, if a sitting board member is providing information to a board who's then making a recommendation back to the board in a quasi-judicial hearing, I think that needs to be looked at. Um, the fact that information is being provided to the board, that's a different situation. You're not just discussing the topic on the way it's voted, but providing information to the board to make a decision, those are things that need to be discussed. And so that's why I was bringing that up, and that's what that's about. Um, again, if there's no issues, obviously it's going to clear the air, restore the the integrity of city government, reestablish confidence in the residents. I've had people concerned about it, so I just want to bring a little, a little more information um, behind the comment that I had during the last meeting. So behind that, I mean, the resolution seems like it, it fits with everything that um, the board is looking to do. Um, it seems like Carlton Fields is also aligned with what their um, interest is as well, too. Okay. Let me, um, let me just add to that just a tiny bit. Mr. Schwartz asked somewhere along the line, who's the client? And we provided him that the city of Tarpon Springs is the client, the municipal corporation, not the commission. We're just an entity associated with that. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind if Mr. Schwartz finds that there's been something wrong or um, not done properly that the, the, the commission done, did, he's going to provide that in his report. I mean, there's been a change of the commission, but on the other hand, there may have not, you know, there could not have been a change, and therefore, if he comes back and says, well, you know, in, in preliminary discussions, this commission didn't do something right. Oh, no, 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 you can't say that. That's not the point. Everything is fair game in this investigation. I, I want to make that absolutely clear to everybody, uh, whether it's me, um, any of the former commissioners uh, or anybody that's up here now, we're going to go into the spring of um, 2022. Uh, and and um, we'll just have to, uh, I just will make it clear that there's no carving out of <laughs> accountability here. They're going to look at everything. And that's why I think he asked the question, who is a client? It's the city, the municipal corporation, not the city commission. So um, let's see. Commissioner, Vice Mayor Carr, I, I mean, Vice Mayor Lund, I ask you a question. Commissioner Carr, um, Commissioner Eisen. Next. Yeah. So I have no issues with the uh, resolution. Um, I did have one question. I got it answered, so I'm fine with that. Um, I don't know, did you want me to m make a comment on this? Uh, you know, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with asking um, in between uh, you know, from a board of commissioners to a commission, you know, to a committee member. Nobody's asking the committee member um, how they voted or should they vote or, you know, there's, there's no collusion like that. But you're allowed to ask a, you know, a, an opinion. No different than it's not recommended that we sit at a meeting, but we're allowed to sit at a meeting. And we have, I think everybody has sat at a meeting. Um, the fact comes into play when it's quasi-judicial, you have to make the decisions according to the evidence provided, not from what another committee member's opinion was or any of your other experiences that you've had in life. You have it from the evidence that's provided. So, you know, we all have different evidence. We all have different uh, ways of getting information. And uh, I, I don't see anything wrong with asking unless you're asking hey, how should I vote since you went and did it uh, and, and listened to it, that, that, that would be a little bit uh, bad. But that's where I'm going to stay with. Yeah. I, um, I'll, I'll let the investigate. I'll leave the investigation up to Mr. Schwartz <laughs> to make a determination of what was said and what was not said. I'm sure they're going to be pretty good at fleshing that out. Um, <laughs> but I understand what you're saying. And Commissioner Kuliasi. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I like the scope of work. I, I think it, it pretty much an umbrella under everything that we're just looking to have considered and look into. Um, I did want to ask is from the scope of work, is there 
a potential to be able to give us advice on a potential revote or anything like that, or is it more just the scope of work of what's was looked at, or will there be any advice potentially in the future if something could be done? You mean policies? Yes. Uh, he, they're gonna. That's part of the implicit thing. Uh, the policies will be coming out of this, but. I think Mr. Schwartz feels the actual policies are, are doing, they're going to come up with some recommendations on things that you might consider to want to change. And then it's going to be up to us as far as the, having that discussion and the type of policy that we would want uh, with the help of the city attorney. And, and that I think they don't want to get into the business of writing policy for the city. They'd rather have the city write the policy they'll provide us something that they're, an observation that they saw that they, we, we should probably think about preventing this from happening in the future or, or cautious, you know, be cautious, this shouldn't, you shouldn't be doing this, and we would have a policy. Is that, does that help? Yeah, but I'm also looking to see if, after everything's looked into, if there could be grounds for us to reconsider a vote. Is that something they'd be able to you know, right. through the advice of them, you know, with our city attorney, that, that's that's what I'm trying to get I, at. I, I, that's the biggest yeah, situation. I, I think that that, um, it, as Mr. Schwartz said, if he sees something okay. that is of any level of significance, he's gonna he's gonna tell us. Right. Yeah. And. Um, I, I don't know what that could be, I guess. And he doesn't either, by the way. And, and so I guess what they're going to do is get into this thing. And they're each, of, each of you are going to be interviewed individually. That's right. And I would share that yeah, thank you for with the them. And I'm sure he would have a response for you. So Thank you, Mayor. It all, it all looks good. Thank you. All right. Uh, are there any other questions? We have a motion and a second to approve the resolution and the scope uh, of work. Motion to approve... Motion 2023-09. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Are there any other comments? Roll call, please. Commissioner Fulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? No. Vice Mayor Lund? Yes. Mayor Vatikaris? Yes. Okay, item seven. I'm sorry, not seven. Uh, <laughs> I wish it was seven. Yeah. Um, Ten. The inner coat uh, item 10, resolution 2023-07. Mr. <coughs> Salzman, if you could read that by title, please. Resolution 2023-07, resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, recommending the city manager to sign the interlocal agreement with Pinellas County, Florida for collection and remittance of the plan review and inspection fees. Okay, thank you. Uh, City Manager LaCourse. Yes, uh, Chief Young was here earlier to do this item, but I let him go attend to a personal matter because I think this is very simple and easy. Hopefully I'm not mistaken. Uh, what, what this simply is is um, during the year at times, there's probably average about four or five incidents where our fire department is asked to review plans from the county because the building or is in the unincorporated Pinellas County, but it's in our fire district. All this resolution does <coughs> is gives the ability for the county to pay us. Now we're not talking about a big sum of money, it's maybe a thousand, but still, our services by our fees, this, this enables them to reimburse us under agreement. They've been doing it, but they want an agreement with the cities. It doesn't happen much, but as you know, our fire districts go into areas that are unincorporated. So if that happens, they got to do a fire review. The county gives us with this agreement full reimbursement um, for doing that. So I'm bringing it forward to approve, send to the county, and get the money we're, you know, due for assisting. Okay. Are there any public comments on this item? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? We have no raised hands at this time. Okay, may I have a motion and a second? Please? Motion to approve. Second. Uh, roll call. I just wanted to mention that uh, with Chief Young, and we did speak to Attorney Salzman about it, that the, uh, what was left out of the bottom of the resolution was the effective date of the resolution should be upon adoption. So if that could be also, it's not They're in asking back for of that a, date? It, right. It, it, it's going to be added, it just isn't currently on. 
As noted. No. You okay? Yes. You also didn't ask if there's any board discussion. Hey, Mayor, can I make a, a quick motion real quick to extend the meeting to 11.45? No, we will. Um, did I ask about commission comments? You didn't. Okay, let's extend the meeting and then we'll ask for commission comments. Okay. Mayor, I make a motion to extend the meeting to 11.45. I'll second. 11.45? Yeah. Good. Second. Okay. Roll call, please. Commissioner Kouyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiak? Yes. Okay. Um, commission comments? <coughs> Commissioner Eisner? You don't have any comment? <laughs> All right. Can we have a vote? Just, we have a motion I'm and a second. I'm just covering for you. <laughs> Same <laughs> answer, of course, you're looking at me a little strange. No, you're no, okay? it's Is it roll call, please. Commissioner Kouyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikias? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Item 11. Um, ordinance 2023-02, if we can get the ordinance read by title, please. Ordinance 2023-02, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending section 216.00 of Article 12 of Appendix A, the Comprehensive Zoning and Land Development Code to reinstate the requirement for calculation of the application fee based on land valuation, providing for severability, providing for conflict, and providing for an effective date of this ordinance. That is ordinance 2023-02, read by <coughs> title only on second reading. Um, Ms. Vincent, do you have any, this is a second reading, is there anything new? Uh, the, the, the finance director did provide a memo uh, regard, it, it's in the backup regarding um, that we already have a separate fund for the oh, fees that yes. have been collected and he provided how much money has been kind of allocated into that fund. Uh, the only other thing I would suggest, I meant to update the ordinance, um, the use of the funds where it says proceeds of which shall be utilized solely for the purpose of acquisition of future rights of way by the city. I, I think we should add future rights of way or easements. They're the two different things, just to be clear. Um, so I would recommend adding that. Okay. But otherwise, no, no changes. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Vincent. Um, are there any public comments on this item? Mr. Jump, are there any public comments? And there are no raised hands at this time. Okay. Commission comments? Vice Mayor Long. Um, yeah, I'm still somewhat confused as why we're writing a draft um, ordinance which has language in it that it's already obsolete. I mean, as far as the Pinellas County property appraiser, not setting values, et cetera, and yet we've got an ordinance in here which specifically I, I, says all such values shall be determined by the Pinellas County property appraiser. So this, to I, me, is kind of counterintuitive. I think, I, I think the idea was just to I put mean, it, I know it restores the initial- it, the For right now, and point. then if we, want to amend it, then we would go back and look at it and amend it to address some of the things that you're saying. Okay, it just seems to me we could have done it I understand that. Shot, I, I, I mean, the, I, I mean, I can get into the discussion of why it was amended in the first place, but I don't think we need to do that this we don't evening. Need to do and, that. And, uh, but I, I think that um, this is something that Ms. Vincent can add to her list of things that <laughs> Since she needs things to do, she can add this one to that one too. We, we, we did roll this back to the original language. To your point, I, they we simply we simply refer to what their assessed values are as and, and apply it. You know, that's we they don't. I realize I, I understand what you're saying. This was just the quick fix. Yeah, correct? it was. A, it yeah. definitely a quick fix. Yeah, now that one applies. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Three seconds. All right. Let's do what? Can I say, so what would the other option be then in this case the required appraisal? appraisal. I mean, what would the difference be just putting that language in there instead of Pinellas County I, property appraiser? I, the only the issue, I, I, it's like everything else. I think um, in principle it, it may sound okay, but in practice there may be some issues. You could do one or the other, um, uh, but I mean, for example, if if there's something that's worth Two hundred dollars, the fifty percent thing, and the appraisal is going to cost eight or nine or a thousand dollars or something like that. Then, you know, it's like 
why are we making the person do that? Yeah, no, I, I'm just, I was just asking as an alternative. I mean, I think so. there's other ways of doing that as well, and, and um, I'm fine I, with the with the way it's written. I just maybe the you're right, Mayor. That's one of the main. As, as I know very well, trying to get a lot of appraisals lately for the right, city, the they're hard to get. Yeah. It's hard to find somebody that has time to do them, and the price is, has gone way up with them. So that's why we want to just restore it and then see how everything goes out and maybe make some changes later. But um, that, that was kind of the reason why we wanted to restore it first then deal with later if we wanted to do a different process. Okay. There are uh, any other comments? Uh, Commissioner Eisner, anything on this? Commissioner Kulias, no? Okay, can I get a, a motion? Yeah, I've got a motion to approve Ordinance 2023-02 with the addition of adding or easements at the end of the last sentence. Okay. And section second. F. Second. Roll call, please. Puyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Um, <coughs> item 12, resolution 2023 08, budget resolution. Mr. Salzman, if you could read that by title, please. Resolution 2023 08, a resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending the budget for fiscal year 2022 23. <coughs> Okay, um, City Manager McCorris, I'm gonna turn this one over yes, to you. Yes, Mr. Herring is getting a, our, it's up, so get the presentation, Mr. Herring. Yeah, well, this will be the first budget resolution for fiscal year 2023. It's budget resolution 2023-08 to bring forward budgeted items from fiscal year 2022 that were still in process as of September 30th, 2022, and bringing those budgets into fiscal year 2023. You know, these items were approved in back in fiscal year 2022. Um, on the cover letter, I've listed a lot of the major projects that are being brought forward, and I just thought um, we, on the screen here, we'd list some of the major projects, and I can just quickly go through them here. Um, we've got the uh, city clerk new building for 2.9 million, the sponge docks flood abatement, 2.5 million, Craig Park phase one, section A and B, design and construction, 1.6 million. Roadway reconfiguration, Walmart Huey, 1.4 million. Cybersecurity at the water and sewer, 1.4 million. Raw water wells, one point, rounding up to 1.4 million. Pent gross, 1.3 million. Solar energy at the water sewer plant, 1.3 million. Bayshore septic to sewer, almost 1.3 million. Public safety building roof, almost 1.2 million. Lime Huey lift station, uh, almost 1.2 million. Hospital capital, the awning there at the hospital, 1 million. Fire station design, 1 million. I forgot to mention off the side, as it says, there's the funding sources. Uh, the next slide, I know there's a lot of them here. There's the water line alternate 19 uh, bridge, 950,000. Beckett Bridge Utilities, 908,000 and quote, turn basin, 848,000, water distribution sewage collection building, 825,000. Uh, the proposed land purchase for South Florida, the Henry Ross property, 728,000. Yard waste project in the scale house, 714,000. And quote, dredging, 646,000. Extend Pinellas Trail, also called the Elfer Spur, 641,000. Cops and Kids Building Design, 600,000. Orange Street Construction, 500,000. Uh, sidewalk from Sports Complex to Mellon, 500,000. The North Pinellas Corridor, corridor 500,000. Uh, the balance remaining on Seabreeze Drive Sewer, 412,000. Uh, Brick Street Reconstruction for Lemon Street, 404,000. I just have one more slide here. Uh, the sports complex, 400,000. Police vehicles from fiscal year 2022 being carried over, 350,000. Mango Street Phase 2, 290,000. Craig Park Phase 2, Section C, D, Design, 250,000. Mausoleum Roof, 245,000. Jasmine Sidewalks, 232,000. The fuel tanks, uh, 205,000. Uh, the tree survey for the interns and their expenses, 188,000. Roosevelt Seawall, 178,000. Annual street paving, 150,000. Convert gas, chlorine to bleach, 149,000. Manhole and sewer line rehab, 127,000. 
Vulnerability Assessment, 122,000. Orange Street Design, 120,000. Uh, Dedecanese Pump Stage Design, 118,000. Uh, Mirrors Boulevard Phase One, 113,000. And those items total almost 32 million bring, being brought forward from fiscal year 2022. Those are the main, uh, major items on the resolution. If you have any questions, I can try to answer them for you. Uh, commission comments. Uh, let me go public comments. Any public comments? Uh, Mr. Jump, any remote access comments? And we have no raised hands at this time. Okay, commissioners, any questions? Vice Mayor Light? None. Commissioner Carr. I've got a quick question. Um, Ron, so what about the unallocated ARPA funds? Does that need to be rolled over too? Or since it's not allocated, doesn't it just sits? The like ones a, that you have approved, we're bringing forward. We've got um, 8.2 million, which was listed in there of ARPA funds. You still have about almost 5 million to decide on to allocate for projects you're going to select in okay, the future. That's not, rolled, that's not rolled in the next budget because it's not allocated, just sitting in a fund. Though, I right? do have three million that I did budget in the original budget thinking you might allocate these, but you know, if, if once you do the final ones, I can put them on the next budget resolution in June. Oh, I mean, it'd just be like we have eight plus million dollars in reserves. We're not rolling that forward, right? It's just sitting in an account somewhere. Right. It's sitting okay. in the reserves in that fund. We have a separate fund for the ARPA. Got it. All right. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Einstein. Seabreeze, the uh, monies, that's monies that we still owe to the developer? That's a balance left on the project. From the original budget, which was, I, I can't remember, <coughs> 1.2, 1 1.3 million, this is the final remaining money that's due. Okay, because this is then not what they're trying to propose even more, correct? No, that doesn't include that. Okay. Commissioner Kulias. No comment. Um, Mr. Herring, the only question I had was on the overhang. We approved that, but we haven't transferred the funds. Is that because the hospital doesn't want to take the funds at this point, or do you know what the story is on We've that? We've been working on an agreement. I, I got it. Well, they, I've been working on an agreement. We got one from them where they did an agreement with um, Advent Health, did one with, um, with Hillsborough County. I reworked it for us. It's still back to them, and their, their attorneys were looking at it, basically. Okay. That's good. A contract, an agreement with that. Yeah. It, and that's going to be used to do something similar to what we did with the chamber money, to certify that that's actually a bona fide use for those funds. Y yes, and it is a bona fide use. But just uh, we mentioned in there that it, what was mentioned by the board was doing the awning for the hospital there, and that's what's been mentioned in that agreement. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, no other questions. May I get a motion and a second, please? Motion approved. Second. I'll second. Oh. Roll call, please. Commissioner Kluyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisen? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lent? Yes. Mayor Batikiotis? Uh, yes. Okay, that ends the. <coughs> Let me make sure I've got this all straight. That ends the resolutions and ordinances. So we're going to go back to the special consent agenda and pick it up with item seven, uh, commission direction of Roosevelt Boulevard property. Um, <coughs> City Manager, of course, I'm going to let you yes. explain yes. everything. Um, obviously, we all know where these properties are. They were the ones involved in the hotel um, that we, we dealt with very seriously. Um, the, the two on the on the east side of Roosevelt, the one on, on the west, which we were, you know, attempting in that process if it went through to obtain that for parking. So, so what came out of the blue, um, we hadn't started any discussions, but we got the email that I have enclosed um, from the owners of the property, the Menas, offering us first offer at the property at a firm price firm for now, I guess there may be some open for negotiation, but we'll see, of 1.8 million. And because they want to take action, if we don't want, they wanted an immediate decision um, on whether we wanted to pursue going forward for it. They understand, um, they understand that it has to go to referendum. They understand the processes we have to go through, the due to the gaining of, a, of, a, of an appraisal, which would be probably um, the choice of the board, you know, where, what to send me to do with this offer 
um, from the Menas. Um, the first obvious thing we do if we're interested in a course would be me to attain an appraisal to see what we're talking about. The other obvious, obvious thing this board will have to do in the future is determine, um, you know, kind of determine to justify what the uses may be. But that's something down the road. We already know the one piece um, probably would remain something for parking, but the other two. Um, they want an answer fast if we're going to move forward or they're going to proceed to, to do other things with the property. Um, they gave you know, us first dibs on it um, to begin the process. So I'm bringing this to you as, as I bring anything down there looking for property for parking. I'm bringing it to you to see what direction you want to give me uh, and whether to proceed um, the investigation on the offer um, and uh, finalize a a contract uh, that will go through the processes almost like we did that we we're going to obtain the place for the boat ramp um, a process leading to a referendum which would probably have to be a special referendum um, to gain the property so I'm here to get your direction on how to proceed with this okay let's go to public comment I know you've been very patient do you have anything that you would like to say this evening about this item You have to stretch your legs a little bit. <laughs> well, Mrs. Kutsareas gave me first dibs here. I live next to, my name is John Corliss, and I live at 609 Hope Street, Tarpon Springs, 34689, next to Mrs. Kutsareas. So we are two of the three most impacted properties were residential properties. I back up to this parcel on uh, between Hope Street and Roosevelt that the hotel was gonna go in. And I look at it every day and I go, what is gonna be the highest and best use for this property without adversely affecting my property value? So is there something that would be a win-win? And then I read the letter that was the subject of this meeting and I go and well you know who's going to object to a park and that's what the developer suggested in his letter um, my initial thought was yeah open space right green space um, I don't know how you make that work um, financially for any entity a city or uh, maybe uh, they have a budget for open and green space but it makes sense to me that um, from what I, short time I've been in Tarpon Springs, a few years, that there always is a, a push and a pull between the sponge docks and downtown in terms of the festivals and the Friday night or the Friday fest and the, the different festivals they have closing off Dokanisi. And um, it makes sense to me that this parcel would be a great festival the parceling back of me festival grounds. Um, I'm not aware of any other festival grounds. Um, there's the Sunset uh, Beach uh, concert series, but a true festival grounds. And I travel a lot in the summer, and what attracts me in my travels, I have an RV, is gosh, there's a blues festival in Telluride, or there's a jazz festival in Sedalia, or so-and-so in these in cities, and this is a big deal in Colorado. Every town's got their festivals, and I know that's true with Tarpon, but I'm not aware of any real true music festivals. So I just wanted to throw that out there, that it would be really cool if that parcel behind me were grounds for festivals it could be the seafood festival or the hippie festival with reggae bands music is not something i object to and loud music you know as long as it's not every night it would be advantageous to me personally the way i liked with the way i live and i think it might be advantageous to um the time that i'm not there and i rent it out as an airbnb of short-term vacation rental and might bring people into my home. 
So um, I'm in favor of what the proposal is from the developer or the current owner. Um, and I'm going to talk about the other little parcel on the next agenda, agenda, agenda item it, and how that might uh, complement a, uh, a music f uh, festival area. Um, and I can talk to that now or when that item comes up. Um, which is you have the, 20 seconds well um, the the park oh you mean oh it's gonna come up uh, okay. course park yeah we're gonna have a separate item on okay that. Yeah. I'll, I'll stand this up is again. just for the uh, 1.8 acres I understand so that. that's I, I'm in favor of what is proposed by the the landowner all right thank you mr. Corliss yes Ms. Kutzerais do you have My name is Rita Kutzreis, and I live at 611 Hope Street, which it, I'm right back from the property. And this is pretty much from what Mr. Corliss says. But also, my idea is every time there is a, um, a, anything down at the sponge docks, they have to close Dodecanese Boulevard and part of Hope Street. Maybe they can use, utilize that land too to have all the, um, the vendors and the, uh, whatever we're doing down at the sponge docks in that area, in that property, and for, uh, not vacate Dodecanis Boulevard, which it causes a problem because so, uh, Dodecanis loses the parking spaces, and there's two, three other spaces that are parking spaces that are closed. Nobody can go into them because of the uh, uh, blocking of the street. Yeah. So that would be an idea to use that property as a, some kind of a fairgrounds or something that can be utilized. Okay. And also you can leave uh, part of the Hope Street open and Hill Street because I know now when there's uh, uh, something down there and an ambulance has to come in, there's no way to go anywhere. <coughs> so they have to, whatever happens, bring somebody all the way over to uh, Hope Street. So maybe that way they can leave the streets open and utilize that space. And that's about it. Thank you, Ms. Kutzerai. And thank you. Thank you for staying so late. <laughs> no, thank you. Mr. Jump, are there any public comments? And we do have a raised hand. Next, next, next person in the queue, please unmute to speak. Peter Delacus, 514 Ashland Avenue. There are things that come around only so often, and this might be an opportunity that if you don't at least explore it, will be regretted for years to come. Uh, as the gentleman said earlier about some kind of uh, festival event, even in the letter that you have, it says, an ideal parkland with communal venue infrastructure, potentially including an open pavilion for events and performance, beautifully landscaped walkways, benches, and open green space. There's no reason that something couldn't be duplicated like the pavilion out at the beach. It wouldn't be that hard to realign. You use the property on the west side of Roosevelt for additional parking, and then you use the other two uh, <coughs> properties for this open space and pavilion. This way, when festivals and events come down to the docks, uh, you can have the music and other things stationed there, and you can use that parking lot if you need for vendors and such. So if nothing else, I would say at least give the city manager permission to get an appraisal and that uh, the city is interested in further negotiating with the owners of this property. And uh, let's see where it goes, because I think a lot of people, once they learn about this, 
will be very excited uh, to have this option versus uh, a multi-storied hotel. Thank you for your time and for staying so late. God bless. Thank you, Mr. Delacus. Okay, Mr. Jump, anybody else? And there are no raised hands at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, let's go to the commission. Uh, do you have any other comments, Senior Manager? Do you, do you have anything else you want to say? No, not okay. right now. Uh, Vice Mayor Long. Okay, so well, I'm in agreement that we need to investigate this a little more thoroughly. I did some rough math today. Um, so based on fair market value right now, we're close to the 1.8 price or within striking distance anyway. Um, I also did some analysis, their investment in the property so far. We're gonna be giving them like maybe a, at 1.8, maybe a, a 3% compound interest over the 15 years they've held the property, which is probably not too much to expect in a, in a county that's 99% built out. So I think we should at least investigate it, but it looks like an okay deal. Okay, Commissioner Carr. Yeah, um, just just to be clear, this isn't a discussion if it's going to be a hotel or green space. Um, it, I think it's clear that the board didn't want to see a hotel here uh, based on the height. So that's just a, a, a note to the public. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, I would like to see this area developed. Um, I Would I like to see it four stories? No, I don't want to see it four stories. Uh, it would be a nice extension and complement to the sponge docks. Um, but at the end of the day, I also realize that what's one of the most scarce things in Pinellas County is gonna be vacant land. And on my side, I've got no issues with preserving vacant land anywhere we have the opportunity to do it. And I think it's a good idea to at least send it to the residents as an option for them to make that decision because it's over the, Mark, what is it, $300,000 now? 350. 350. Unless they wanna sell it for 349. I mean, I would be happy to approve that. Um, but it, obviously this has to go to the citizens. And so I would, I would be supportive to put it at the citizens um, to, to move it to a um, referendum for vote. This particular item? Yeah. Okay. Um, Commissioner Arson. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, I'm of the opinion that um, we could go out and get a, uh, an appraisal on it. Um, this way, at least we know which way we want to go. But to um, purchase it or to even put it in for a referendum, Unless you have a game plan of what you're going to utilize it for, uh, I do appreciate that um, vacant land, but I, I don't want to be a land owner with no idea of what we want to do with it for anything. So, you know, and, and I mean, that's going to be the question if we do put it in for a referendum. That's the number one question. Okay, you're buying it. Well, what are you going to do with it? Um, I'm still getting the fielding questions of what we're doing with the Hoffman project, you know, and, and the other, the uh, knockdown of the motel. We've done nothing all over all these years, and I don't need this to add to that repertoire. So without having a plan, I, I would like to go ahead and find out what it's worth and see if we can even come close to it, but I need to know what we're going to do with it. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to, for, the, for the city manager to pursue it, uh, you know, get the appraisals and uh, let's let the voters decide. So you want to make a motion to that effect? <laughs> yeah, uh, but I, I did want to add that, you know, uh, what Mr. Corliss said and Ms. Gutzeraus is music to my ears. I, I've continually talked about with the city manager, we need an event area, an event space. The, the docks has so much more potential for festivals a real festival you know so but uh, you know i'd also potentially like to see some type of whether it be you know something you can construct or, or permanent some type of band shell that would attract good musicians you know so those are my thoughts on it and uh yeah i'll definitely make a motion i think he's welcoming that right now All right yeah i'll say uh motion to give uh Motion for the commission to give the city manager direction to purchase the Roosevelt Boulevard property. With an appraisal? With, with an appraisal. appraisal. Okay, so we're going to pursue an appraisal. There's a second from somebody, right? I'll second. Yeah. Okay. Was it, um, uh, Mayor, was it a to purchase? I heard him say purchase. It's a pursue. purchase or pursue. appraisal. We'll figure out what we're going to do with it later. 
<laughs> uh, I, no, I think it, what it, Commissioner it was a clarification Kriak was right. To uh, pursue. A pursue a, an appraisal. Okay. To authorize the city manager to move ahead with I the just appraisal. wanted to clarify. I'm the clarifier. Yeah. Before we purchase anyway. It is late. Um, uh, the, the, uh, we have a motion and a second. As far as any further commission comments, I'm just going to make a comment, but go ahead. Yeah, just a quick comment. I mean, obviously, there's multiple things in place here, like where funding would come from, um, the plans of what could go here, and all those things need to be hammered out by city staff. So those are things that we would like to also have, I think, some background on. Yeah. And the game plan would probably be to bring you all that back and talk about the decision of what we're going to say to you when I get the appraisal and we come back with the results of the appraisal. That would be, I'd say, the meeting um, to do that with. Yeah, like a, couple, a, bull court. Couple of, a couple of things. One, um, once the city buys land, other, unlike the CRA, where if we buy land, we can sell it without authorization from the residents. When we buy land, we can't sell it. It's got to go back to referendum to be sold. That's number one, so keep that in mind, which is no big deal, but, you know, you can certainly do that. Number two, um, we haven't talked about this because of everything else that's going on, but we really need to shift and kind of put our thoughts as far as this needs, uh, instead of um, needs-based economic development, which is attracting new businesses to build new locations and things like that to asset-based, in other words, placemaking, uh, creating places for people to come and visit. That's the way our economy has to go with being built out. There's no place to bring in new businesses with new buildings and things like that. We can still do adaptive reuse, that's all part of it, but it, I'm not saying that that would be the reason for buying this, but that would, this type of thing that was discussed this evening would feed into that kind of uh -huh. economic development approach that we're talking about. We just haven't gotten into that yet because of everything going on. So I'm supportive of moving ahead and let's get an appraisal and, and see where we go. We could be far off. We could be, as Vice Mayor Lunt saying, is pretty close. So then we can deal with it. Um, roll call. Uh, was there any other comments? Roll call. Commissioner Kouyas. Yes. Commissioner Eisner. Yes. Commissioner Carr. Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt. Yes. Mayor Batikiotis. Yes. Okay, Kokoris Park property, um, commission direction on Kokoris Park. Oh. Um, Mr. Corliss, your story, you want to talk about that? Uh, City Manager of Kokoris, yes. go ahead. Um, again, for a long time, probably eight or nine years or whenever I first took over being City Manager, I've pursued for the city to get Kokoris Park back, not only because of, you know, my family being in the history of Kokoris Park, but, you know, I wish the 30 year agreement we had for that park didn't end. Um, I remember when it ended, we didn't, they were not willing to ha sell it to the city and keep it at that time. But ever since that time, we've been trying, making overtures to try to get that property. And it's been a long process um, I think when I started, it was at $2 million for the property. Um, we went a long time with our explanation and our reasoning that you have a property that has zero density that is now in the high water hazard area um, that you're not able to get density with. It's not worth, it's not a $2 million, $1.8 million now property. In fact, it was up in the middle of all this process. It, it was up to sale for about $600,000 for all the parcels put together. Um, it was on the market um, for $600,000, um, and then it got pulled, um, we're trying to remember and stuff. But it's been a while, but it's got to the point now where it's regressed. We thought we were at a, a point where we got an appraisal, of course. We know the owner got an appraiser because we tried to use that appraiser, and he couldn't do it because they got one. Obviously, we shared our appraisal of 160,000 and offered 125 percent of the appraised value, 200,000, uh, well under the, the 350, um, as a fair purchase price. We did not get the his appraisal, um, but I imagine with the circumstances, there's little doubt. Um, we dealt with an attorney for a period of time recently. Um, we explained it to her. She asked us to send us the documentation of, because the accusation was that we changed 
um, the property. Um, we changed it to be in a situation with zero density, so we caused it. And, and Ms. Vincent was able to provide the fact that it's been zoned for that for many, many 30 or more years it's been zoned that way. The change was the, the, the coastal high hazard area, which we have control over. So, so, you know, we are not the party that caused you to lose that land. Um, that's not the case. So we're back to our offer of it's valued at that because all you can do is really make a park or something of it. So that's the offer. And, you know, <laughs> obviously I expected the counter to the 200 in the range. Um, from the six hundred thousand dollars, but where I put a put the squash that that's it when we were pursuing, and I tried, uh, Tras tried, then Mr. Salzman got involved, and he's tried, and now all of a sudden they're back to 1.5 million. We've regressed back to 1.5 million. So there's only two things in my mind you can you can stop my nine-year pursuit because it's frivolous to deal with these people and we're not going to get it or we can do what we've kind of talked and whisked about our only other option is to pursue the taking of the property which involves the process we have to put together what we're using it for why um, and do that and stuff but if, if we want to get this property for the city that a lot of us feel it's important and stuff it's probably down to to him in the main is the only way we could do it because obviously I'm not going to be able to bring an agreement to you. It's got that point, and uh, and that's what I'm leaving to the to the commission. And I think that's the only two options I can see, and unless someone can miraculously come around and change his mind besides us, um, that's where we're at the final point of making the decision. I think, and I'm bringing it to the right. board to see what the thoughts are. Yeah, the um, there, we had, had we had a um, just to add to that we had a an agenda item. Um, earlier, late fall, mm -hmm. early winter, that if we didn't hear anything from the applicants by, I think we said December 31st, yes. we would bring it back for eminent domain and the commission agreed to that. Um, so anyway, that, that's all I want to add to that. Um, Mr. Corliss, Ms. Kutsarias, if, if you have anything to say. Um, Um, yes, that parcel is uh, uh, complements um, a uh, festival of grounds. Um, it could, uh, in my mind, be, uh, you know, weekend camping spots. I go to these festivals everywhere and, you know, there's camping and they're not cheap. Uh, there's a number of spots that are dedicated to self-contained RVs. Um, that area could be a campground. Residents would have to chime in on that, of course. I'm one of them. I would be in favor of that, but I'm not across the street from it. Um, but it would, it would complement, you already got parking, you've got area for uh, vendors, you've got a two or 3,000 people venue for uh, major or you know, regional uh, uh, music festival, and then you've got places for people to stay. The camping, um, are some RV spots, which are all you know um, sold online in advance, and they usually go real quick. So that kind of is what I'm thinking about. If this thing went to the festival route, is that property would be ideal for you know 50 tents or you know, a dozen RV spots and 30 tents. I don't know what it would support, but um, there's a use there that could work rather than just you know, playground equipment. Maybe that's part of it, but something to think about. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. You okay, Ms. Gutierrez? Okay. Uh, Mr. Jump, are there any public comments? No raised hands at this time. He doesn't have anything. He has one. No, no hands. Okay, thank you, Mr. Jump. Um, the other, I, I think, what we're looking for is a direction, but I think it would be a, uh, and Mr. Salzman would have to weigh in on this. Um, we'd have to have a land use attorney to pursue eminent we'd domain. We'd have to pursue it under eminent domain. As uh, the city manager said, we would have to establish a need mm -hmm. uh, for the property and move forward from that direction. The, and as, as 
the city manager said, it's just we're, we're so far apart. Although interestingly, their attorney said that their client is interested in developing the property, but as the city manager said, I, I don't know what use they can develop it for. So I don't know if that's kind of a, a bluff or not. Um, well, I, I don't think if, I'm sorry, Mayor, I think if we said, hey, we're, we're gonna pursue eminent domain, that may open up some door of discussion. But, but that wouldn't change whatever the board <coughs> well, decides I, what they wanna do. I, uh, right, what, what I have in mind um, in, in kind of pursuing this was not use it as a point of bartering, but just move ahead with it. Right. If they wanna jump in there, I mean, there's some advantages to them doing a volunteer eminent domain. That gives them, instead of that property trade, there, there's a different provision. Yeah. If it's involving a government, provides them additional time Yes. to take that money and reinvest in some property somewhere else without having to pay taxes. So I've, we've gone, I've kind of gone through that a little bit. Um, but, and it, the need has been, a it, it is there um, in the comp plan in terms of a mini park deficiency. Um, we still have probably eight or nine acres. I know we've added some with some of these developments, but probably an eight or nine acre deficiency in a mini parks around town, this is, would be one of them. There isn't a mini park in that neighborhood. So that would be the need. And then the other thing that we would have to have is to show the judge the, the layout. Yes. The, the configuration of that property. That's required part of the eminent domain as well. And so uh, what I was asking though was do we hire a separate land use attorney or is if that something that you would be involved in? I would be involved in it, and if we need additional help, we can do it through the city attorney provision with the city manager. So you want to defer hiring a? Um... I would right. I, so either we can do it through through my office, or I can bring in somebody as okay. we talked about. I, honestly, 25 years ago, we we used the city attorney to do an eminent domain. It got a little more complicated later and then we brought in a separate land use attorney. Right, we may want to so, bring somebody in to work hand okay. in hand. Are you all right with that? Yes. So what do you need as far as direction? You, do you need us to authorize you to- To move forward. To move forward with- Myself and the city attorney to move forward with uh, the taking of the property. Okay, all right. Uh, we haven't gone to commission comments yet, right? Correct. Okay. Uh, let me check with Vice Mayor Lund first. Do you have anything? Um, I've never been exposed to eminent domain. Um, so I'm a little nervous about it because it sounds a little heavy handed to me. Um, however, it's been a park. It was a park for a long time. It's got zero density on it. All it can be is either a park or parking. One or the other. Those are the only things that don't have zero density. I don't think personally the family would want to turn it into a park. Um, I don't think that area of town is ripe for a parking lot either. I think pursuing this might prompt them out of their catharsis <laughs> to uh, to negotiate with us. So that's kind of just my thoughts. Okay, Commissioner Carr. Thanks, Mayor. Um, City Manager, I, I, did, I don't understand and I haven't seen this come across any other property where there's zero density on a piece of property for development outside of like a piece of land in the water or something like that. Is there any history that can be provided to the board? Yeah, Renee's, got, Renee's got the write-up they sent to their attorney and stuff. So I, I'll can forward it to the board tomorrow. If you could, that would be great. I would really appreciate that information so I understand it. Okay. Um, I do not like eminent domain, uh, but I get this situation um, at the end of the day. It's a, another green space that the city can utilize uh, for for parkland. Um, so, uh, man, yeah, you, yes, I'm good with moving forward with um, what we're doing tonight. Commissioner Eisler. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. I did do my research on eminent domain. Nobody likes it. It's not a pleasant item to do. Um, but as long as we can use it for public use um, and we pay the compensation and no purpose, you know, no person is deprived of his or his property, 
without due process law, we have no issues. Um, I do think, as Vice Mayor said, sometimes when you move ahead with something that you don't even like, you can get, you could flush somebody out to say, hey, uh, either I lose it or I negotiate. So um, th there could be that situation. Um, I did drive by it today. It's, it's a lot of trees on the property. It could be a very good um, park. Um, it's very shady. It's in a nice little location. Um, I, I'd move ahead. Those are those are specimen trees. They're not just trees. Yeah. No, those, those are, are nice specimen trees. trees. Yes. You're talking to somebody that comes from bricks and cement. I know you don't so, like you know. trees, but I'm just letting <laughs> you know the trees. Okay, it's a nice tree. <laughs> They're nice trees. That's better. It's a beautiful tree. 1141. Shall we extend this another to 12? 15 minutes. Motion to extend to 12. Okay. I'll second. second. Okay. Roll call, please. Commissioner Kuyas. Yes. Commissioner Eisner. Yes. Commissioner Carr. Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt. Yes. Mayor Van Fierders. Yes. Okay. Finish your so nice. I trees. am willing to go ahead and either go through the eminent domain or have him step up to the plate with a reasonable offer. Okay. Commissioner Kuyas. Uh, I'm willing to move forward. I, I, I agree with the other commissioners and vice mayor about the you know the process, but uh, this is a a need for the future growth of Tarpon Springs, the historic area in the Sponge Knox, uh, the green space that we need to for the comp plan. And uh, um, I think once this gets going, that the, the, there'll be some better negotiations here in the future, so where we can uh, move forward. But this is a. a delicate piece of property that um, has a lot of history and uh, for that neighborhood itself and um, I, I think a lot of the visitors coming in the sponge docks if you know everything gets played out here right in the future will be used by a lot of people so okay thank you I eminent domain is a tool uh -huh. I'm not shy about using eminent domain on a case-by-case -case basis this is one of those cases I have absolutely no qualms about now I'm not looking at luring them to the negotiating table if they want to volunteer something fine but my sense is my feeling is we're moving ahead in the eminent domain process it's not like we steal their property the judge is going to determine a fair price for this thing based on appraisals it's not like, uh -huh. so in the end of the day, if their property was for sale, which it has been, it will be sold, it, they will receive a price that is fair under the court system. That's how it works. And the appraisal is gonna be, I always get this reversed, best and highest or highest and best use. One of those two is what's gonna wind up happening to this. And it's all gonna get flushed out as far as density, those arguments are gonna be made. So I'm comfortable with this. And I've gone through it before. That's how we built Live Oak Street. That's how we built the library. And the library, some people voluntarily um, did eminent domain. Some people voluntarily uh, sold us their property. Others, we took their property and they started yelling because they would have gotten a better price if we would, you know, by us offering them that property. So I, 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 it's a tool. I'm not, it's, okay. it's business. So, and the property's for sale. It's been for sale. So anyway, um, we've done the we've done the uh, comments, commission comments. We've got motion. a you, we have a motion and a second. Mm -hmm. We need one. We need one. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Motion please. to give the city manager approval to move ahead uh, with the uh, eminent domain. Did you add the city at, uh, or? whoever city attorney or mr salzman he's he would, our litigation yeah. attorney he would be the one that would handle it so it would be then to uh give the city attorney authority to move ahead with the eminent domain okay, is there a second a second okay uh without if there's no further discussion roll call please commissioner Kuyas. yes commissioner eisner yes commissioner carr yes vice mayor lunt yes mayor vadigiotis yes okay does that end the agenda? Yes. yes. It does. Okay. All right, it's 1045, 1145. <laughs> I wish it was 1045. All right, let's go to uh, board and staff comments. Um, 
Chief Young. No comments, sir. Um, Mr. Salzman. No comments, ma'am. City Manager LaCours. Just a reminder, next Tuesday we have a work session um, where we're going to talk about projects. Not only are we going to talk about projects and uh, priorities and that sort of thing, but also some methodologies. I know we've talked to some of you about what you want to see in the project list, how you want to do so. Um, the processes and stuff is, is another thing we'll, we'll be open to have a discussion at a work session on um, again. So we will be looking at what's, what we have coming up. Um, the priorities, the things that are in place, some are moving slow and there's reasons and we'll talk about those. Um, so everything about projects, process, we can all sit down and have a good talk of where we're going in the future, what the priority is, what you want to see as a commission done, um, anything you want to change in the way we've been doing and dealing with these things. It's an open discussion to get all those out and start the process for 2023 of how we proceed um, during the year on these additional things we have out and open um, to add to the projects that we just saw uh, on, the, on the resolution. So it'll be a good chance for us to sit down and really hash these things out and, and show the people and stuff what our direction is gonna be for the year. Ms. Jacobs. I have no comments, thank okay. you. Um, Vice Mayor Lund, do you have anything? Um, good meeting tonight. I'm looking forward to next week's project meeting a lot. Thank you for hanging in there with us. <laughs> <laughs> we know it's late, so that's all I have to say. All right, Commissioner Carr. Yeah, a couple things. Uh, since we're talking about properties tonight, uh, we brought up, I brought up a couple properties, um, city manager, when we were speaking about appraisals uh, for boat ramps and other, uh, what was it, the Stamus property for the dredging. I brought up the, the old Snowden's property and then the, the wetlands behind that. I think there's, it's approved for, I believe, 180 apartments. Uh, I could be wrong. It may be a little bit higher. And I think there was discussions with the developer to actually buy that piece of land and develop it. Um, I did talk to the owner of the property some months back, and I recommended that you connect with them. I'm not sure if you've connected with them or not. We're waiting. They've been in the process. In fact, the last thing they did, they tried to get, I think, some more density from the county, and I believe got to. So they're still working those the process. Uh, he's supposed to maybe talk to me when they get a better feeling of what's going on, and it's still in, in a flux right now. Okay. So, so have, you, have you reached out to him, though? I guess is the better question. Yeah, back before it started, we'll reach out again to him to see where he is after this recent ruling that just happened with the county um, to touch base with him again. Yeah, and uh, again, the, the preservation of land, I think, is important for the residents. Uh, it's pretty clear that they don't want to see it. I think the residents will be really unhappy if they see that move forward. And if there's an opportunity to, to potentially partner with the state with this fiscal year budget coming up and ask for funds for maybe a piece of property for preservation, um, or something along those lines. But I do think it's important to, to target a couple uh, projects as well, too. And you're talking about the area that's not in this project they're trying to do, right? I was talking about both pieces. So you have the wetland pieces that abuts to the, the golf course, and then you have the 182 or 184 unit. I don't remember what it was. I think he's yeah. talking about the... Well, see, that I can't... Right now, it's under a contract. We can't interfere with that process you going know, through. Uh, uh, the nursery owner, what's it's, his name? John Mills. John Mills. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. For Mills, yeah. John Mills property. So I don't know if it's under contract or not, or if that's still work. I don't know. I was well, they just like went to, to the people who want to do the development there just went to the county to try to get some more. Okay. So it's still going. I don't want to, as Mr. Salzman tell you, we don't want to step into, I can't step in with them until they have resolved and they want to come back to me and see either if they're going to build something to for us to, because the idea was if they were going to go forward, how could we get for a very low price the, the city control, the rest of the property to control it and what's done on it and stuff. Yeah, so, I just don't want to lose sight on that if yeah. there's an opportunity because it, I think it, building that many apartments on that piece of road is going to be problematic um, for traffic, which is a piece of road that's already problematic. Um, and if there's an opportunity well, to, pres to preserve the wetlands back there and avoid future development. Yeah. If you uh, remember, we went down uh, we went down to the county and I against, totally that, understand that. against that project. Yes. Um, in fact, I told the county, um, you know, I'm going to recommend we don't annex and you take the problems it's going to develop. But obviously it's going to be our problem because it's right there, whether it's county or It's in the problem. middle of our city still. So. Yeah. But they, they just acted on that, right? The county just 
they, he, they, they, they turned he, it down less than what they had. I can't remember if they did, but they did not give them what they wanted for the density. They didn't give them all. They might have gave them a portion, but and this just, just happened. Okay. Um, right. So we're waiting to, to see where, if, if the people walk away from the project, then, then he knows I'm ready to be the first one to spring on it uh, or give the city an opportunity the first one to spring on it. Okay. Yeah, and then uh, just to reiterate, I think it's important that we the city starts targeting um, fiscal year 2024. The, the requirements are probably going to be coming up soon to work with our state representative to get some type of state funding in this year. So not sure what projects you and the staff have in mind, but uh, some of these larger projects may be a good idea if it's to buy you or if it's some other different things. Uh, have, have you met him? I have not. Nobody has. Yeah. <laughs> Commissioner Eggers was going to talk to him about making some rounds to the cities to introduce himself. Well, I've seen him at the hospital, actually, uh, during the introduction, but I haven't met him one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, but, but Commissioner Eggers and I spoke about that a little bit, so I understand. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> he should <laughs> come around. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay. Anything else? That's it. Commissioner Eisen. I just want to say I think it was uh, it was a good meeting. I appreciate everybody's input, and I also wanted to apologize because I put the wrong reply all. So I know you all got a hit of some comment. I didn't mean it, so I apologize. And that's it. I don't think you got it, Mayor. You're apologizing to me? No. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Carr? All of us. All of all. us. Yeah. Oh, okay. Anybody that was in the reply, all. I hit the wrong button. But nobody acted on it, so y'all no. did a good job not acting or responding. Thank you. So there's no issue. Right. Okay. Commissioner Kulias. Uh, it, it was a, produ a productive meeting. We, we talked about some properties that, you know, hold a lot of potential to town, some applications that could help, you know, just robust economy in town and, and it's just it's good things are really starting to get moving now so okay. um i have a couple of things one tomorrow we've got a sister city's annual meeting at 4 p.m i don't know if y'all are Yay. ready to go for that okay so uh there'll be um the number of people have increased i think there's 40 or 50 people that are going to be there which i think is a pretty good turnout uh so that's good uh the other thing um we we kind of danced around the issue uh, a little bit with the uh, cohatch project, but I don't want us to forget about the parking study uh -huh. that I really, really think we need to do. And so I'm, I'm actually <coughs> mentioning this to you so we can do that at Tickler and maybe bring it back, um, you know, with some kind of authorization to proceed with that. Um, the last thing, um, you know, a person, uh, passed away this past Friday, actually Saturday, that um, um, I, I won't say he was a close friend, but I will say he was a kindred spirit. He was a type of person that you don't see for a while and then you, you run into him. It's like you just saw him yesterday. And um, he's a person that everybody liked and um, he, had a, he had a way of, of speaking his mind that people weren't offended at the end of it and he loved people and there were a few people he didn't like but he you know in the end of the day you understood where you stood with him and that was Lazlo Tsatsanas. Um, his family was his parents actually his dad was from Egana. his dad was actually uh, a very close friend of my dad I would say best of friends um, his was Yanaki Tsatsanas. this is Lazlo Tsatsanas. Laz lived in the Hope Patton House right there before the uh, townhouses went in down there on Athens Street. So um, he's been around a long time. Um, I, I know we describe it in the fact that he's passed away, but in my mind, he's not gone. Uh, at least at my age, I know I'm going to see him pretty soon <laughs> again at some point in the future, relatively soon. Uh, my wife says hopefully not too soon. but. Um, but he was a really, really a great guy, and um, he's going to be sorely missed in town. Um, I think if anybody has um, looked at Facebook, you'll see people from all corners of the community uh, commenting about him. So um, I'm going to miss seeing him for a while, but I know he's still there. Um, anyway, that was Lazlo Tsatsanas. His funeral is on um, Friday, Friday yeah. and I think it's at... 10 o'clock, I believe. 
10 or 1030. The, the wake, details are on. Wake's uh, at 10, I think, and the funeral's 11. Right, and the, the details are on uh, Dobie's funeral home. So um, that's all I have. It was a good meeting. Um, I think Mr. Watkins uh, from Cohatch was impressed with the way we went through that without you know, a lot of hand wringing and stuff like that. So I'm very, again, I'm very proud of you all and speaking your mind and, and being able to come to uh, closure on a project like that that I think is important to the city, but face some challenges to get it done too. So thank you for that. Meeting adjourned at 11.56. <laughs>